This morning's meeting is to allow the Minister and his officials and the Interim Director General of the HSE and her staff to update the Committee members on current key healthcare issues. On behalf of the Committee, I would like to welcome the Minister, uh, Minister Simon Harris, who is accompanied by Ministers of State uh, Catherine Byrne and Jim Daly, and the Secretary General of the Department, Mr Jim Breslin. I would also like to uh, welcome the new interim director of the HSE, Anne O'Connor, Mr. Liam Woods and Mr. Dean O'Sullivan, and finally Dr. Peter McKenna of the HSE to the meeting. I wish to draw to your attention the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee may be published on the committee's website after this meeting. <coughs> Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Can I now ask uh, you, Minister, please, to make your opening statement? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and thank you for having me and my team back um, here this morning um, at the Health Committee. And I very much look forward to having an opportunity to answer your questions on what I'm sure are a wide range uh, of issues. I've obviously circulated an opening statement, but with the agreement of the Committee, I would like to comment on a few issues related to the National Children's Hospital um, at the outset, and then we can decide whether you wish me to read the rest of my opening statement or indeed to take it as, as circulated uh, and read. But there's four matters I'd like to update the committee on this morning in relation to the National Children's Hospital. And the first is confirmation that yesterday evening I took the decision to appoint Mr Fred Barry as the new chairperson of the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board. Uh, Mr Barry has a wealth of experience in delivering major capital projects, Chairman, uh, particularly in his role as CEO of the National Roads Authority. And I know it's recognised across the House that the National Roads Authority is one of our agencies that has done a very good job in bringing in many, many capital projects. Uh, and indeed, I think Mr Barry's record shows him to be a man uh, who went into that agency and really ensured that projects came in on time uh, and on budget. So I'm very grateful to Mr Barry uh, for agreeing to take up the role. I think his, his long track record with the National Roads Authority coupled with his professional experience and qualifications uh, leaves him very well placed, Chairman, uh, to lead uh, that entity and all its legal responsibilities at, at what is a crucial time uh, for this landmark project for children's health care in our country. The second issue this morning, Chairman, that I want to mention, because we had a long discussion about this at the last committee meeting and indeed at other engagements you've had with officials, uh, was the issue of the PwC uh, investigation in relation to the spiralling costs uh, and the terms of reference. I, of course, heard from members of this committee, from members of the Public Accounts Committee, uh, and indeed from others, uh, that there was a view that those terms of reference needed to be made more robust and uh, needed to be made more comprehensive. I want you to know I've listened very carefully uh, to your suggestions in relation to that, and I've tried to meet them in the revised version, which was also published yesterday evening. Uh, this review will now deal with the accountability of relevant key parties, functions and roles. Obviously, any sanctions to be applied to any such individuals or any such people in any roles would be a matter for government, be that by the way of the contracts that we have with such organisations or indeed by issues regarding board appointments and the likes. It will also examine the role of the Department of Health and the HSE, and I think that's important in terms of making sure that we're comprehensive regarding roles uh, and responsibilities. And crucially, and this is an issue that Deputy Donnelly, I acknowledge, raised with me here um, last Tuesday, I think, and also has raised um, again, which is the importance of PwC also also looking at cost mitigation uh, and value for money. And on Deputy Donnelly and other people's suggestions, uh, I've also now included that uh, in the terms of reference uh, for PwC. The third point, Chairman, I wish to make this morning uh, is the reference in the media this morning uh, in relation to potential cost pressures being highlighted at an earlier stage. Now, of course, this shouldn't be news to anyone 
uh, at this committee, because by my count, uh, the issue of 61 million euro of potential cost pressures has been discussed at this committee uh, and at the PAC on at least 11 occasions from a quick tot I did this morning uh, of the transcripts. Uh, far from the figure being concealed, it's actually explicitly referenced in a briefing note that I provided to this committee in advance of my attendance uh, at this committee, I think that was last week uh, as well. Um, so, and this, this is a very different situation, and I need, I need colleagues, I suppose, to be clear of that, because the idea that there were cost pressures emerging uh, in 2017, but that the Development Board had been told in no uncertain terms that it was important to take measures to mitigate that, that we were not seeking additional exchequer funding at that stage, uh, and that there were a number of things, including some of the suggestions I've heard from members of this committee, including de-scoping, uh, that had to be considered, is a very different situation to the one we found ourselves in um, at the end of August of last year, where it became apparent to me that there was going to be a need um, to appraise government of its options and indeed ultimately to seek a substantial uh, additional amount of exchequer funding um, as well. I also want to deal with, finally, Chairman, in relation to the Children's Hospital, the fourth matter I want to deal with is the issue of what was going on uh, between August to December, uh, because I'm somewhat frustrated at the characterisation uh, that I've heard of this, because I've heard a characterisation that the Minister knew in August and nothing happened till November. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, and the paper trail that you have and the testimony that you have from my officials, from the members of the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board, from the HSC and indeed from my own mouth at this committee last week, uh, show that not to be the case. So a couple of points in relation to that. When we talk about August, uh, can we be truthful? We're talking about the 27th of August, effectively the end of August, the start of September, where I became aware of the potential significant cost increase. The Secretary General made it clear to this committee that he was on leave, uh, I think, till the start of September. So we're talking about roughly the start of September, it being clear that there was a significant emerging capital issue. We then had a situation whereby, and this is really important, there was a significant amount of negotiation ongoing uh, with commercial entities to try and drive down the cost exactly what you'd expect the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board to do. The legal entity that had the contracts, and the only legal entity, by the way, the only one, that could negotiate. You know, I couldn't, the department couldn't. The legal powers in relation to the contract and the negotiations rested with and rest today with the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board. So that commercial process uh, of negotiation was going on. I need to be clear, this idea that I and I alone knew about the GMP process uh, does not stand up to any scrutiny. There was a government decision made um, when Fine Gael and Labour were in government, and I believe it was the right decision, I believe it was the right decision, that the procurement process should be two-phase. That the first phase, phase A, would be in relation to the excavation works, and then phase B would be in relation, effectively, to the substantive works. It was always, always going to be essential that before you could award phase B, there had to be the finalisation of the GMP process. So the idea that that knowledge that the GMP process was ongoing was confined to me and my department uh, is not true. Now, of course, that's not to suggest people knew of overrun figures, because they couldn't have. They didn't crystallise till the 9th of November. But the fact that that process was ongoing uh, in the month of September uh, was, not, was not a matter concealed, nor was it a secret issue as well. In the month of October, as this work was continuing to go on, uh, my officials were engaging and seeking to engage with officials in the Department of Public Expenditure and Form, as you would expect them to do, to be engaging and saying, look, we have an emerging issue here, how are we going to deal with it, here's the information we have. And on, in, on November, in November rather, on the 9th of November, the figure, the final figure that we all now know, Chairman, uh, became apparent, and that figure was told to myself and the Taoiseach, I believe, on the 9th of November, I think also to the Minister for Deeper's officials, um, as well, I think the Minister knew the Minister for Pair in early November. He obviously spoke in relation to that yesterday. We then, in the month of December, November and December, had intensive engagement as to what do we do here? We have a very large overrun. What are the options? And as I discussed at length and don't propose to do again today, in the interest of time, there were effectively three options. Pause, retender or proceed. I don't believe any minister sitting in my seat would have made a different decision other than to proceed with this project uh, as well. So actually what was going on from August to December, rather than this effort to characterise it as a hands-off approach or nothing happening, actually was a very intensive body of work to present a full and detailed number of options to the government at its meeting on the 18th of December to enable the government to make its decision, which the government made to proceed with this project. I believe it's the right decision, it's the right decision for children, and I believe 
whoever the Minister for Health is in 2023 will be a very proud person opening that hospital, which will transform the delivery of children's health care uh, in our country. Could be one of you, perhaps, as well. The Minister for Pair yesterday made comments in relation to the, in relation to two, two other matters. He said that it was the appropriate thing for myself to come to him when I knew the quantity, that you go to a minister when you know the scale of the problem and the potential solutions. And he believes I acted appropriately in that regard, and I have no doubt that I did. He also made the point that it would have been helpful to know earlier. He's entirely correct. I said the same thing. We all would have liked to know about the scale of the problem earlier. The, pro the programme board, the secretary general, the HSE and myself have all flagged the fact that an early warning system uh, would have helped significantly in terms of people knowing uh, about this earlier uh, as well. So I just wanted to put that on the record of the committee this morning, Chairman, in terms of what actually happened between the months of August uh, and December, because that was a period of very intense engagement to arrive at a set of robust options for us to pick uh, which best way to proceed, uh, or indeed not to proceed, with this vital project. My opening statement is quite long, uh, and it goes into a number of issues. There's obviously a lot of issues going on in my department and the HSE uh, in relation to industrial relations matters, in relation to our efforts uh, to reach a new and better deal with our GPs, in relation to progress that we've made on things like termination of pregnancy, the introduction of abortion services, the passage of the public health alcohol bill, falling waiting lists in relation to inpatient day case, significant increased funding in relation to waiting lists, uh, particularly outpatients for 2019, our Slauncher Care implementation plan, the establishment of the advisory group and the progress being made there, the fact that I've appointed a new HSE board on an interim basis, on an administrative basis, whilst we wait the legislation to pass through these Oireachtas, uh, these houses of the Oireachtas as well, and some of the work we're doing in relation to patient safety and the patient experience survey. I've set that all out, and indeed some of the progress and work ongoing in Minister Byrne, and Minister Daly, and Minister McGrath's areas. But I'd suggest, Chairman, if, if you're happy to do so, I'm more than happy to take questions on that rather than to take quite a period of time reading that into the record. Thank you, Thank you Minister. And now, can I call on Miss Anne O'Connor to make your opening statement on behalf of the HSE? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting us here today. Uh, I'm joined by my colleagues Liam Woods, Deputy Director General and Chief Operations Officer, Dean Sullivan, Deputy Director General and Chief Strategy and Planning Officer, and Dr. Peter McKenna, Clinical Director from the National Women and Infants Health Programme. So I'd like to update you on the following issues. The Winter Plan. Uh, the HC commenced winter planning for 2018-2019 in May of 2018. The planning process focused on three main areas. Emphasis on providing community-based care options to prevent ED attendance and expedite discharge from acute hospitals to either a patient's home or a community-based care alternative. Close integrated working between acute hospitals and community services through local winter action teams with national oversight and increasing specific measures in nine sites over a peak four-week focus period from the 17th of December to the 30th of January. 30 million euros was provided in terms of winter funding, 10 million once off in quarter four of 2018 and 20 million in 2019. The emphasis on community-based services saw two-thirds of the available funding directed towards primary and social care services. 10.6 million to home, service package, home support packages, 4 million to the provision of aids and appliances, 1.5 million to transitional care and over 4 million allocated to community beds and initiatives. Due to increasing system pressures towards the end of the focus period, the National Oversight Group agreed to extend the enhanced measures by an additional two weeks to support unscheduled care at the nine sites. Unscheduled care performance improved significantly in quarter 4 2018 when compared to quarter 4 2017 where the 8am trolley count was 4.2% lower than the same period last year. This was despite ED presentations increasing at a rate higher than expected of 3.3% for the same period. This trend has continued and indeed increased into January 2019. Analysis of performance for the period 1st of January to the 27th of January 2019 recorded ED attendances at 98,797, an increase of 9.2% on the same period in 2018. ED admissions in this period were 27,319, an increase of 6.3% on the same period in 2018. Despite such increases, the 8am trolley count for the same period in 2019 was 8,732, representing a 14.8% decrease in trolleys on the same period in 2018. It should be noted that the flu season in 2018-2019, while not yet over, 
appears to have been shorter and less intense than that in 2017-2018. However, the high ED attendances this year have included significant levels of respiratory cases that are non-flu related. So in terms of service improvements and uh, achievements in 2018, during 2018 there were significant achievements and improvements across the range of health and social care services and I'd like to highlight some of these to the committee. Our acute hospital services continue to, dem to demonstrate improvements in the inpatient day case waiting list, which reduced to almost 70,000 at the end of 2018 from 86,100 in 2017, or a reduction of 18%. This ambitious target was achieved as a result of the continuous focused efforts in collaboration with the NTPF and the Department of Health. Last year saw, saw considerable improvements in a number of other targets as follows. So the number of patients waiting over nine months, which has almost halved since July 2017, from 28,100 to 14,900. Number waiting over nine months for a cataract procedure, which has fallen by 87% since July 2017. And the number waiting nine months for a tonsillectomy, which has fallen by 84% in the same period. And angiograms have fallen by 88%. Over the course of last year, 418 spinal surgeries were completed, including 201 spinal fusions and the number of children waiting greater than four months reduced to 35 at the end of 2018. Cancer KPI performance continued to improve in such services as symptomatic breast cancer, lung and prostate in 2018, with all sites showing sustained improvement over the year. In 2018, primary care services expanded with the opening of 13 new primary care centres. Within the primary care services, 70, 743,000 people were seen by community nursing services, 1.5 million people were treated by health and social care professionals, and in excess of 1 million contacts were made with GP out of our services in the year. A significant milestone was achieved when all of our 1,149 100, disability centres were registered by HICWA as of the 31st of October 2018 under the National Standards for Residential Services for Children and Adults with Disabilities. This has been a substantial achievement for the sector. Over 53,000 people benefited from home support in 2018 and 15.7 million hours of support were provided. The percentage of persons over the age of 65 in long-term care has fallen to 3.4% against a target of 4%. This is assisted by the ongoing investment in home support. In our mental health services, 10,734 children and adolescents were seen by child and adolescent mental health services. 203 children and adolescents were admitted to CAMS acute inpatient units and 27,124 adults were seen by mental health services. However, notwithstanding the above progress and achievements, we still have significant pressure on acute and community services, with high numbers of people on outpatient waiting lists, a significant increase in the numbers of people attending emergency departments, and increasing unmet demand for home care support. Our service plan for 2019 will focus on bringing about further improvements and increased capacity across the health services, particularly in those areas where we are experiencing ongoing service pressures. 2018 saw the publication of the Sláinte Care Implement Implementation Strategy. A detailed action plan is in development led by the Executive Director of the Sláinte Care Programme Office that will set out a series of work streams and designated actions with associated measures to be developed in 2019. The HSE is committed to working with the Sláinte Care Programme Office and all stakeholders to play our part in successfully bridging the gap between the vision for health service transformation in Ireland and delivery of that change at the front line. In relation to the termination of pregnancy services, following last year's referendum and subsequent legislative change, abortion services are now being provided by the HSE through GPs or family planning services and in maternity units and hospitals across the country. People can now access an abortion in Ireland under specific circumstances. 259 GPs have signed the contract and each day more GPs are signing up as the service evolves. Of the 259 GPs, 128 consented to having their details shared by my options. There is a good geographic spread of GPs taking part, enough to meet the needs of people who may need to access the service. The Well Woman and IFPA clinics are now well established in the provision of services in the Greater Dublin area. All maternity hospitals are providing the following services. Managing complications arising from termination, providing appropriate care and supervision for women following a diagnosis of fatal fetal abnormality and referral to the appropriate tertiary unit providing appropriate care and supervision in cases where maternal health or life is at risk and referral to an appropriate tertiary hospital as appropriate. Nine maternity hospitals are providing the full range of termination of pregnancy services. The number of sites providing these services will increase during the remainder of 2019. My options, the HSE's unplanned pregnancy service, is the first point of contact, providing free and confidential information and non-directive counselling to people experiencing an unplanned pregnancy. 
The My Options helpline has seen a steady number of calls each day since it went live on the 1st of January 2019. Since the myoptions.ie website information went live on the 21st of December after the legislation was enacted, there have been over 80,000 visits and almost 300,000 page views to the website. So now an update on the nurses' strike action. Uh, within the HSE, we've put in place a governance structure to oversee preparedness for the series of nurses' strikes and for the coordination and implementation of system-wide contingency plans. During the recent strike days, the ongoing interaction between local management and strike committees proved to be effective. As the strike continues, there is increased risk for patients and clients, along with increasing disruption. We estimate that in excess of 40,000 patients and service users are in impacted upon each strike day. The HSE continues to seek full derogation for cancer surgery and services while the action continues. There is ongoing engagement with our community health organisations, hospital groups and all frontline services to seek to manage this difficult situation. We are acutely aware of the significant impact of patient appointment cancellations and the cumulative impact on access to services, and we are advising the public to stay tuned to media reports and adverts, as well as to contacts from local services to those affected. In addition to this week's strike days, the INMO have notified further strike days next week, from the 12th to the 14th inclusive and the 19th and 21st of February. The overriding objective remains that the dispute is resolved given the number of patients and clients affected. The HSE remains open to be part of any talks to achieve that objective. This concludes my opening statement and together with my colleagues we will endeavour to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms O'Connor. Uh, Minister, um, as you know, we have had three specific meetings in relation to the National Children's Hospital yes. and undoubtedly uh, this meeting, which is specifically in relation to that, will also discuss the issue. Sure. And the, the the uh, PSE had a meeting last week in relation to the yes. Children's Hospital as well. We have requested, and notwithstanding that you are the Line Minister and Secretary General Jim Breslin is, is the Accounting Officer for the Department of Health, we have asked to meet with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform because obviously they have a huge input into what happened in relation to approving the additional 450 million in relation to the Government Contracts Committee being under the auspices of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. Yes. And also we now know that a member of DPAR was also a member of the National uh, Pediatric Hospital Development Board. So we're very anxious to, to meet with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform still to discuss this issue, just to, to put that on the record. Sure. Notwithstanding that you are the Line Minister and yeah. Mr Breslin is the, is, is the Accounting Officer. Um, I'd absolutely, absolutely inform colleagues. Yeah. Just in relation to some specific uh, questions, some short questions before yes. we go to our other members. Has the contract for phase two with BAM been signed? Has that been signed already? Um, yes, yes, it has, Chairman. And in, in relation to the PWC uh, report, yes. um, does the PWC have the expertise to look forensically at the original tender documents and the, and the bills of quantities that were presented because if they don't have that expertise the report that they will uh, provide at the end of March will, will not have sub substantial substance. So we need to really examine forensically the original bill of quantities and the original uh, procurement documents to find out exactly what was being asked of. And could I also ask Minister, was there a target cost for the hospital because it would appear the two-stage process seemed to, be, uh, to, to allow the costs to escalate without actually, actually having any target cost. In most building projects, you would have a price for the project, and that would be the price, and you would accommodate the project to that price. But it would appear in this instance that there was no, there was no cap, there was no price. It was allowed to develop between the contractor, the design team, the quantity, su quantity surveyors, all the other components of the project to come up with a cost as the project was developing. And that, I think, is where the, the problem lies. So you might just address those questions. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman. And um, thank you very much for having me. I'm more than happy as the Line Minister, as my Accounting Office and the Secretary General, uh, to be here. But I note the comments you make. Um, and I'm sure they'll be noted uh, by others also. In relation to your, your three specific questions, um, yes, the contract has been signed uh, with VAM for Phase B, because this was 
um, a decision taken by government to proceed on the 18th of December, and then obviously that decision to proceed would have been conveyed uh, by me to the Gen Director General uh, of the HSC. Also in that letter I would have obviously uh, conveyed my view um, in relation to the disappointment that government felt regarding the lack of early warning systems um, and therefore the need to have this external review, which brings me to the second question. Um, yes, PwC do have expertise both in procurement and in construction. And it is important to say that when we were even amending the terms of reference, as we did in recent days, to take on board your concerns, Chairman, uh, these terms of reference would have, PwC would have satisfied themselves that they could deliver on those terms of reference. So yes, I am, I am satisfied that that is the case. The target, the target for the hospital in terms of the cost of the hospital, I'd be very clear on this, was €983 million. Euro. Uh, that was the decision, or that was the sanction, if you like, given by the government uh, when it made its decision in April 2017. So that was always uh, meant to be the, the cost of the hospital from that point where we pressed go, if you like. You quite rightly say that there was a two-stage procurement uh, process used, and you don't quite say this, but I presume you're thinking, as we all are, was that the right model to use? Um, I would make the point at the moment um, there seems to be the view that it was. The Mazars report that was commissioned uh, by the Project Development Board before we proceeded with Phase B did actually suggest that whilst there were weaknesses and lack of early warning and the likes from my memory, um, that, there, that the GMP process, as they call it, uh, did actually highlight issues at an earlier stage than the traditional procurement model would have. And often with the traditional procurement model, you'd hear about the overrun at the end of the project, whereas here this two-stage process had actually highlighted the problem earlier on so that we can now have the conversations about how we mitigate and, and how we manage. And I suppose what happened... Uh, and I've been asking a lot of questions, as you can imagine, about this. When government approved 983 million, I think effectively, you know, we can talk about GMP processes and all this, but for, for people watching it at home, the way I think of it is we effectively approved phase A, the excavation works, which, by the way, came in on budget. We also approved phase B, which wa we also, by the way, acknowledged that there was a phase B, that there'd have to be further work done on, but that based on the outline design, the project would come in at 983, where we all got badly let down was when we went beyond the outline design and design teams and the likes did further work, it's clear that the costs were an awful lot higher. Where the responsibility for that lies, Chairman, is something that even with privilege I shouldn't prejudice, um, though I have strong views on it and I hope, I hope and expect PwC to get to the bottom of it. And we'll act on that. Thank you, Minister. Now, um, uh, Deputy Stephen Donnelly, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Ministers, you're all very welcome. Uh, Ms O'Connor, Best of luck in the new job. It's not an easy one, but uh, we wish you, uh, we certainly wish you uh, the very best with it. Yeah. Um, Minister, I, I want to focus on the uh, Children's Hospital and on the timeline and who knew what when. Uh, what we know is that in April 2017, the Cabinet approved 983 million. And we know, as you've stated this morning, that in August of 2017, uh, cost concerns were raised about an additional approximately 60 million euro, and that has been referenced before. My understanding is that the next time you knew about cost escalations was on the 27th of August, so nearly 28th of August. So, so 27th of August. Pardon, so, so yeah, yeah, 27th of August 20, uh, 2018, so a year after this initial issue of the 60 million was raised. Um, this morning's Irish Times uh, contains details of uh, minutes from project management meetings uh, that they have uh, got their hands on. Um, and what it shows is very interesting. So what it shows is that at a project management team level, at a board level, issues of costs were being raised continuously, month after month. Uh, that in March, the issue of the guaranteed ma uh, uh, maximum price, the recommendation that the concerns were escalated. Um, it says that in uh, previous meetings there were eight senior HSC officials pres present, there were three senior Department of Health officials present. It says that in April 2018, uh, the minutes show that further cost issues were discussed, that in May, and I think this is very relevant, that in May, in response to these increasing cost concerns, a Department of Health Assistant Secretary advised the board to go before government and critically, they advised the board to go before government before the budgetary process, because obviously these kind of cost overruns are very relevant to a budgetary process. Can I just confirm that you were not made aware of any of this, that essentially you signed off a 983 in April 2017, in August 2017 you were made aware of the 60 million, and that essentially you were told nothing else until August 2018, 
when you were told actually the cost the cost escalation is now in the range of several hundred million euro? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, I want to answer the question. So the, the who knew what, when, and where? I think we'll both acknowledge PwC have a role to play in that. In relation to the existence of the 61 million, I appreciate you acknowledging the fact that these figures have been discussed um, <coughs> and shared with this committee during the during the hearings. Uh, and indeed, I hope you. I hope you very much understand and accept my explanation that this was in a very different situation to the situation we found ourselves in in August 2018, where it was clear there was going to need to be uh, ultimately work done and, and then decisions made by government. Sl slight tweak, uh, whilst I think the meeting you referred to took place in August 2017, I was informed in September 2017, but not, not to be pedantic, but just for me to be accurate about it. Uh, and I was told on that occasion uh, by my Secretary General, who I'm sure may wish to, to add on this, uh, and indeed this is also referenced in the briefing note given to the Committee last week um, that the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board had been told to put in place a programme of work to mitigate those costs. And it, was also, it was also a little bit more specific than that, you know, it wasn't just like try and manage them. Uh, there were things like philanthropy referenced, uh, risk minimisation, offset through value engineering uh, savings, off th offset through other design or scope changes uh, where appropriate, considered the deployment of the contingency. So I was being told uh, at that time, September 2017, yes, there's a cost pressure here. We're going to manage it. We've told them to manage it. We're not proposing going to government in relation to this. And between and September 2017 and, and, and next, August 2018, you, you weren't made aware of these ongoing issues? That's correct. Okay. The next time I was made aware is exactly as per the, as per the public record, which was on the 27th of August, uh, I became aware um, of a potential significant overrun, and you know the timeline after that that ultimately Thank crystallised you. a figure on the 9th of November. May I, can, I, can, I, can, I yeah. can I ask you on, um, on, on a parliamentary question? So you were told on the 27th of August uh -huh. that the costs were, were escalating to the tune of several hundred million euro at that stage. You didn't know it was 450 million, but the statements we've had at committee over the last uh, few weeks confirmed that it was, uh, it, was in the, it, it was in the range of several hundred million euro. Um, there was a PQ you responded to on the 18th of September. Now, the question asked, the original budget cost of the Children's Hospital, if it is in budget when compared to the original budget. And you responded that, quote, the total budgeted cost is 983 million, that's the 2017 cost, and quote, capital expenditure to date is in line with expected expenditure. Given what we all now now know that in fact you knew at that point that it was not in line with expected expenditure. Contracts may not have been signed, but certainly you'd been made aware that it was several hundred million above. Would you accept at this point that that question in response to the Dole was in fact misleading? Uh, no, I wouldn't, but I do, uh, with the benefit of hindsight in the interest of absolute honesty when reflecting on this in recent days, I do wish I had have added a further sentence in uh, to acknowledge that there was an ongoing GMP process uh, that would crystallise the final cost for phase B. Now again, I don't think the existence of a GMP process was a secret. Uh, members of the Oireachtas would have been well aware of it because it was originally uh, decided as a strategy in 2014, endorsed by the Government Contracts Committee in 2015, subject to a number of Cabinet decisions um, and Cabinet memos, including uh, memos on the Children's Hospital before uh, my appointment to Cabinet uh, as Minister for Health. So there was obviously that process ongoing, but I do stand by, uh, Deputy, uh, I do stand by the importance of answering the question accurately, which I did. The project was on profile. Uh, I did repeat the figure in relation to the original budget as well. I do wish, with the benefit of hindsight, that I had have added in a line pointing out that there was an ongoing process in relation to the GNP. Um, but I, did, I, do, I do also need to make the point, and I think the evidence before this committee very clearly shows it, there were very, very intensive commercial negotiations ongoing. Uh, they were ongoing for a period of about three months during and after uh, that parliamentary question were being asked. I didn't know accurate figures uh, until the 9th of November. I, I would reject, without being too pedantic, the assertion that I knew of figures of several hundred million euro. Uh, I don't believe that was the case. Um, and I have learnt as Minister for Health, uh, I've learnt the hard way at times, the importance of actually establishing accurate and factual information uh, before throwing it out into the public domain on the record of the doll is important. Thank but, you. But, but, but being truthful, there was a process ongoing, yeah. and I do wish I had a reference that fact in the beginning. Thank, thank you, Minister. Uh, can we move on to the budget negotiations? Because this, this is something that um, it, it, it baffles me, right? So throughout September, 
you were looking in detail at a cost overrun of several hundred million euro and how that might be addressed. You had big choices to make. Um, the in, yeah. yeah. No, in capital expenditure, on, on, on the hospital, okay. right, on the hospital. So, so you, you didn't know the final number, but you knew, you, you knew that the cost had spiralled hugely. Um, the entire fiscal space was just 800 million euro. And you and your officials would have been engaged in detailed negotiations with um, the Minister for Finance and with his officials around the health budget for 2019, including the capital, capital budget. This committee was looking in detail at the current expenditure overrun for last year, which was around six, seven hundred million euro, and we were spending time trying to identify ways of making sure there wasn't an overrun in 2019. Um, Fianna Fáil was in detailed negotiations with government on the health budget, you know, and we were looking for um, some big ticket items to the tune of many millions. We were also looking for very small ticket items around 10, you know, 50,000 here, 100,000 there for what it might be. So there were very, very detailed negotiations going on. The doll signed off on a budget. The HSE service plan was delivered. There was a capital plan put together for healthcare for the following year. And the whole time, you knew that there was an additional overrun to the tune of several hundred million euro, which transpired to settle at 450 million euro. Can I confirm, I, I, know, I know Fianna Fáil wasn't informed of, of it. Um, I, I believe it was a very pertinent piece of information in terms of a fiscal space of just 800 million euro. Can you just confirm that at no point during the entire budgetary process did you inform the Taoiseach or the Minister for Finance that there was this enormous uh, overrun and this enormous amount of additional funding on top of the entire budget uh, that was going to have to be found. I need to say a couple of things in relation to that and I'll answer that very specific question. I think it's important when we talk about the health budget and the budget negotiations that were ongoing, in fairness I don't need to explain this to you because you were involved in them from your party's perspective, that the huge, huge effort ongoing at the time was to deal with the current expenditure issues and also to deal with the fact that we were facing and indeed ultimately agreed a supplementary budget on current expenditure for the health service for 645 million euro. So the absolute overriding priority for me in budget 2019, and in fairness I except for you and for the Oireachtas, was to stabilise current expenditure and to make sure we addressed what was going to be an immediate shortfall in funding to provide services. That was my priority in relation to that. You've talked about the fiscal space and the size of the fiscal space and this sum being larger or, or a very large proportion of the available fiscal space. That, that does ignore one fact, though, that during budget negotiations, I neither knew uh, nor could have known the outcome of the process ongoing, nor the cash flow. I couldn't have known, possibly, uh, Deputy Donnelly, the impact of this in 2019, in 2020, in 2021. This is a project that's going out to 2023 when the hospital opens, 2022 when construction finishes. It was not possible to know until the 9th of November the impact in 2019, 2020, or indeed any subsequent year in, in relation to this. But what, I, but what I do need to say is two things, and I need, uh, I need people to know this, and I think, I think FOI documents and the likes have shown this. I was actively seeking additional capital for the health service throughout uh, budget negotiations. There's correspondence from me that journalists who FOI had have gotten and put in the newspaper about me writing about the need for more capital for the health service. So whilst I couldn't crystallise, and nor could the Minister for Pay or anyone else because no one knew the figures or the outcomes of the commercial negotiations or the impact on that in terms of cash flow in each of the years, uh, I was actively looking for more capital uh, for the health service and indeed did receive some uh, in the negotiations. Uh, just on that, Minister, if I could. Mm -hmm. So you were actively looking for more capital. Correct. I accept that. And so when you were negotiating with or engaging with your cabinet colleague, Minister Donoghue, and saying, I need more capital for the health budget for next year, yeah. did you tell him why? Did you tell him that part of the reason I'm looking for more capital is because there's a pretty good chance that I'm going to have a massive overspend on the children's hospital and I'm going to need more money for that. Did you tell Minister No, Donoghue, we weren't. Or, we were, or indeed, if I just, just sorry, sorry. The, it, with that as well, sure. did you tell any of your cabinet colleagues, did you tell anyone at the cabinet table when you were looking for this additional capital, that actually, did you, did you tell anyone that you were looking at, at a massive over on the children's hospital and that was one of the reasons you needed more capital? Yes, there's two parts to that question. Firstly, as I said in my opening statement, there was an awareness across government, including in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, that the GMP process was ongoing. So the fact that there was a process ongoing 
to finalise the costs for phase B for the National Children's Hospital was not a secret that I was retaining or that my department was retaining. All of government, and I would suggest a lot of the Oireachtas, would have known that before the contract for phase B for the Children's Hospital could be awarded, there was a GMP process ongoing. That was known by government colleagues. What wasn't known, and this is entirely in line with what the Minister of Public Expenditure and Reform said yesterday, was what that quantity was going to be. But the fact that that process was ongoing was known by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, known by my department, and I would suggest widely known. Um, so th so that, that's that point. So I didn't negotiate specifically on additional funding for the Children's Hospital, but it was, it was always going to be apparent that at some point the government was going to have to award a contract for Phase B, and that that contract couldn't be awarded pending the completion of the GMP process, and that the GMP process was ongoing. So that was known more broadly uh, than me. And just this, thank you for that. And just to the specific yes. um, question, and I'll finish on this, Chair. Thank you for the time. Um, did you tell any? So you, you've stated that, the, that there was broad awareness across the departments, including in Deeper, that there was a process underway. At a political level, did you tell the Taoiseach, did you tell the Minister for Finance or any of your cabinet colleagues that this was a, this was a big issue you were dealing with and could have huge implications um, for, for the budget? No, I didn't discuss that. And then ju just Sorry, on that, given that Minister Donoghue said yesterday that it would have been helpful, and given that the Taoiseach said uh, he was in disbelief when, when you told him, do you think, with the benefit of hindsight, maybe it would have been pertinent information for everybody in terms of the uh, budget process? Well, the Taoiseach wasn't alone in being in disbelief. I think we're all in disbelief. And myself and the Taoiseach found out the figure on the same day, the 9th of November. Uh, in fact, we found out this, the figure uh, at a meeting in the Department of Health where he and I were present uh, on the 9th of November. So the disbelief, I can assure you, uh, was shared more widely. No, I believe as a, as a minister, uh, it's your job to obtain factual accurate information to get that information and then um, to brief government colleagues uh, as appropriate. As I'm saying very clearly, the GMP process was ongoing, that was known, the outcome of it was not known, there were commercial negotiations, the outcome of which could have made a difference uh, in terms of a very large scale. We did not know, we could not have known the impact of this on capital expenditure in 2019, 2020 or any other year pending the outcome of that and I was very busy negotiating and what I did know we were going to need uh, for 2019 in terms of both current uh, and capital expenditure. The Minister for Pair did say that even had I told him, with the benefit of his hindsight, even if I had had a direct conversation, he would have said to do exactly what we did, go off and quantify the, pro the, the issue and then come back to me. So I think I'm very satisfied that Minister Donoghue's view, with the benefit of hindsight now looking at this in February, uh, rather than back in October of last year, that he's satisfied that I acted entirely appropriately. Uh, and so is the Taoiseach. And then when we did quantify the figures, it was very intensive work to decide what to do. And there were very stark decisions. Pause, retender, or proceed. And we made the decision to proceed, but it wasn't an easy one. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Chair. Thank you, Deputy Donnelly. Deputy O'Reilly. Thanks, Chair. Um, and and I, I fully appreciate, Minister, that you, you say your colleagues uh, accept now that you, you did the right thing and you know, if you had a time machine that everything would be exactly as it is now. Um, I'd reflect on those remarks if I was you because I actually don't think that the, that, that view is shared by other people. I think that people who look in at this are dissatisfied. I think that the hands-off approach that has been referred to by me and others, uh, I think that's very evident here. Um, and I don't think that this is something that uh, you can simply dismiss and say, well, actually, everybody thinks I'm, uh, I've, I've done a fantastic job on this because I, I think a scale, the scale of this overrun is such that uh, it will cause other projects to be brought into question and those people who are waiting on their small projects, albeit many of them small but absolutely vital projects, those people probably wouldn't share what you say is the view of the Taoiseach and the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. Um, I have a question in relation to the tender process, Minister. And so Tom Costello told us when he was here uh, in January, which actually strangely seems like a very long time ago, but it was only a few weeks, uh, that the lowest bid came in at €637 million. Euros. So that would have been €131 million Euros below the next highest bid. So I'm wondering if you can outline for me what were the amounts on the other. We obviously know the amounts on two of the bids because we can add 637 and 131. Um, what were the amounts for the other bids that came in? 
Um, and at the stage when the 637 was chosen, as I said, €131 million Euro below what was the, uh, the next highest bid, what was the value of the contract at that stage? Um, and perhaps you can give us... Can you give us those figures? I haven't seen them in the public domain as yet. Okay. I'm going to ask my Secretary my General to give you some of those figures in a moment, but can I just address two of the assertions, that, sorry, maybe three of the assertions you made, because of course they're, they're, they're comments that you kind of put into my mouth that I didn't say. Uh, so nobody suggested any, no, no word like fantastic or anything like that was used, because uh, you can be sure that I share the concerns of this committee and the people of Ireland in terms of the scale of the over. Uh, and I'm not satisfied in relation to it, and that's why I'm determined to act in relation to personnel changes, governance changes and the likes, uh, and I'm going to be led by the PwC's recommendations in that regard, and I reflected on your comments and others in making those terms of reference more robust, so I just want to say that. Uh, you talked about a hands-off approach. I don't think you were here for all of my opening statements, which is fine, but I documented very clearly the very hands-on approach we actually took in relation to teasing through these issues, seeking expert reports, and ultimately, though, arriving at a point, a very difficult point for any minister to decide to be in, pause, retender, or proceed. For me, there was only one decision to proceed. You talk about other projects, and it's right and proper that you do, uh, because people are wondering what will happen to my project, be it small scale or not, in my community, the difference to my health service, or indeed other projects. It is important to say that 25% of our population are kids. 20% of the Department of Health's capital budget will go on this project. 80% will not go on this project. We're talking about 50 million having to be found out of a capital budget of almost 700 million this year. We're talking about 100 million across government out of a capital budget of about 7 billion. Of course, you'd rather not be in this place, but there does need to be a degree of context in relation to this. And you don't have to take my word for the impact, but do take the Minister for Finances yesterday uh, at the committee when he talked about no project needing to be cancelled and how this could be managed. And indeed, I believe he's proposing to bring a memo to government on that uh, next week uh, as well. In relation to the awarding of tenders, procurement process and the likes, obviously PwC is looking at all of the steps and I do think, and you're not doing this, but I do think we should follow the expert views in relation to people who have procurement and construction expertise who are going to look at that. But I'd ask the Secretary General, as the accounting officer, to give any information we have in relation to the figures you're requesting. So, so as the Minister said, there is a reason these aren't in the public domain. They would normally be commercially sensitive, but in the circumstances we find ourselves, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm happy to put them into the public domain. It would normally be confidential to the people who are awarding the contract, which is the development mm -hmm. board. But given the seriousness of the matter... But at I, least two of them aren't anyway, so yes, you know, uh, we'll so, be looking for two more. So if I give them to you now, uh, as you've said, um, you, you have the BAM figure. Mm -hmm. um, the next highest was 131 million above that. The next highest was 148.5 million above the BAM figure. Okay. So 148.5 above the, 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 the BAM seven. figure. So that means it's 17 million above the, ne the second uh, lowest. Okay. And the next highest was 177.9 million above the BAM figure. Yeah. And the final, there were five shortlisted to tender, but the final uh, shortlisted did not submit a tender. Okay, so the, the difference in price then was, when, so the next, the highest one was 177 million euros higher than the 637. Exactly. Okay, that's fine. Um, but you do realise that obviously questions are asked by, by people and I, I, I'm not going to compare it to building a house but doing anything, someone comes in substantially lower, uh, red flags you would have thought uh, were raised uh, just as to how they were going to do that and, and these are the questions that are getting answered now because clearly they couldn't do it because sure. uh, that's, uh, so, that's why we're using phrases like massive cost. So, so neither the Minister or I were involved in the award of the contract but, but for somebody who gets a bid under public procurement law, which is the lowest bid and has met the quality threshold, if you don't award that contract, you can be pretty sure you're going to end up with your project in the forecourt for the foreseeable future as you're challenged by the lowest bidder. So okay. And, and, it has and to you're, be, and you're confident that that would have been less expensive than what we're dealing I'm with I'm just now. saying, if, if you are but doing look, it according the, the, to the, the law... The threat, of, the threat of the High Court, really, um, I mean, you, you say that you might have, you may not have done, um, that, that's something, but it certainly is unlikely to have cost €131 million. Euros but of course court. it wasn't a decision, and I think it's an important <coughs> point, because you're obviously asking us these questions, which is appropriate, in terms of where the legal responsibility for awarding the contract uh, and procurement process are not with the Secretary-General or myself, and we be answering very different questions if I was picking what company was to was to receive a very significant contract. 
Yeah, but you oversaw the process by which the company was selected. I oversaw the process, but I didn't select the company. No, that's fine. But you did oversee the process. So, I mean, you know, you, you, no, you very, may not have said, right, it's this company at this amount, but you very, did oversee the process. It's a, very, it's, a very different, it's a very different proposition. I mean, the idea that ministers would in any way be involved in procurement or the awarding of contracts. Um, would be a very worrying throw. No, and, and I'm not suggesting that you were involved in awarding the, the specific contract. I'm just suggesting you were award, award involved in the process that led to that being awarded. I was, and I don't think I was involved was in the setting that. up of the structure, uh, the appointment of the expertise and the approval of government for the funding. Yeah, and, and we, we've probably got a while to run on that structure and we'll be interested to see what it is that PwC say. Cause, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm used to dealing with big organisations, possibly even dysfunctionally big organisations, but the structure for this, uh, it, it, it is a little bit um, maze-like. With regard to the, uh, the individual who was on, and I, I, I'm always very conscious of not naming people, but yeah. the, the person's name is in the public domain anyway. The uh, person from the Office of Government Procurement who was on the board, um, can I, and I've, I've heard this said by some people, and I just want to clear it up. Yeah. There's absolutely no way that person was there in a personal capacity. I mean, no, nobody is, is suggesting that, are they? Well, they were appointed by the Minister of the Day, it was Minister Riley then, along with <coughs> other members of the board, based on their own professional expertise, rather than being nominated by a government department to sit on that board. I think that's the distinction. No, 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 made. but they, they, they were there it was part of their work that they would have been involved in that. So what I'm saying is, the, the, I think the, the job title is Director of, of the Office of Government Procurement, and in all likelihood, whomsoever was the person who was the Director of the Office of Government Procurement would have been on that board. It was not personal to that individual. I don't believe that is the case. So the person was appointed for their specific skills separate to but sure, any person that would be the head of the Office of Government Procurement Minister would have those skills. I That's mean, right. But I, I, of, course, of course the head of the Office of Government Procurement would have procurement skills, no doubt about that. These appointments were made uh, by government in 2013, and the recommendation of the Minister uh, for Health at the time. Uh, and my understanding is that four people were appointed, um, different, you know the structure of the board, different know, people were yeah. appointed from different ways. Four were appointed in the public interest based on their professional expertise and one was the individual you're referencing. Okay, and the, so there was no reporting role for that person back into the Office of Government Procurement? Certainly not that, I, not that I'm aware of. Obviously, that's a matter outside the remit of my department. But no. Oh, no, I ju I'm, just, I'm just curious. So sure. this person was on the board when the, uh, and I'm, I'm really loving some of the, the phraseology, the emerging challenges. If I had emerging challenges like that with my own household budget, I'd probably end up in the poorhouse. But anyway, the emerging challenges were being discussed. And the person who is the head of the Office of Government Procurement, who is presumably oversees all of this procurement process and the convoluted nature of it and, and, and all of that, and sees these emerging challenges, to use their phrase, not mine, and then just goes back to work and says nothing about it. Doesn't, doesn't think. Do you, do you have a view as to whether or not that is appropriate? I mean, Minister, if you have people on your staff who have information, and ex very, very senior people, who have information that is important information about a catastrophic overspend or whatever kind of words you want to put on it, would you expect that they would tell you? that they would make it their business to, to let you know. Because, you see, you either have a culture in your department where this sort of conversation is encouraged and this openness and transparency is encouraged, or you don't. But in my view, you should have. But I'm interested in your view. Well, my, my view, of course, is that I would. But I would in line with the person discharging their functions of the board. So my understanding of the much-discussed circular in, in recent days is that there is a circular in existence that says if you are appointed, um, I don't have it in front of me, but you yeah, yeah, you're, no, if, I'm if, you're, if you're a civil servant yeah. and you're appointed to a non-commercial semi-state board and you have concerns about issues in relation to that board or what you're overseeing, mm. you have a duty to tell your minister. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing, right? No, no, I am, and I understand I've seen um, the circular. Circular, thank you, Deputy Kelly. But I think it also says, and again, I don't have it in front of me, my understanding is it also says that if you're, if you're not but satisfied... I'm not, I'm not no, talking you, about what's finish? written in the circular. Well, I'm well, actually circular. talking about what, you would, you, what the expectation and would I've be if you were sitting when I've, Mr. Donoghue was sitting. Well, just, just let, please let me finish because I want to get this right. 
so there's two pieces. Yes, of course, if there was someone on my staff or working for me who had concerns about something, you'd expect them to tell you, right? Mm. But I am making the point that we've got to look at what the circular actually says. My understanding is the circular says, if you're not satisfied that your board is dealing with it through the appropriate structures. I can't speak for individual members of the board, but clearly they were satisfied that the board was dealing with these issues. The board minutes seem to suggest to me that the board was dealing with these issues, and then the board did escalate these issues uh, into the Department of Health in August, and ultimately arrived at government in December. So I suppose there's a suggestion, not just on your part, but there's a suggestion that there may have been a board member sitting on a board saying, hmm, something's going on here, and no one's being no one's kind of doing anything about it. I don't think that's a fair reflection of what the board was doing. It looks to me like this was a board trying to grapple with a problem. Uh, and then when they, when they became aware of the seriousness of that, escalating it through the structures. But let's see what PwC say in terms of how that actually worked. But, it, uh, but that's my yeah, view as, we, as we sit here, though, we have some awareness. Uh, and, final point. Yeah. We have some awareness. Uh, so really what you're saying is a person in that position should go to their minister and let them know. Um, that's if, important. If they were... No, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I have to be careful. What, okay. what I'm saying is what I'm saying. Uh, what I'm actually saying is a person in that position should, of course, go to their minister if they're not satisfied that it's being dealt mm -hmm. with in the appropriate way of the board structure. And just one very last question. It's a very quick one. The board was reappointed. So I know you said the board was appointed by uh, um, Dr. Now, Senator Riley, whatever, um, at the time. Yes. Would you reappoint the did. board in July? I did. And I reappointed the board. And in the letters of reappointment, and you'll know this uh, well because mm -hmm. of your own work on the children's health uh, legislation, in the letter I advised the board that I was appointing them for continuity. But I also don't have the letter in front of me, but I also advised them in the letter. Uh, and indeed it's in the briefing notes I've given to the committee, that I was going to have new powers under the Children's Health Act, uh, if and when it was passed by the Oireachtas, which would give me the right, if I so choose, to replace the board. Okay, well reappointing them is a fairly ringing endorsement now. Um, and it, would you reappoint the same board again? If we had a time machine. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to await, as, I, as I've been very careful in relation to this, I'm going to await the outcome of the PwC report in terms of where the weaknesses lie. But Deputy Riley, Deputy if I hadn't reappointed them, I would have just left a vacuum. There was legislation about to be passed in the Oireachtas that was going to give me, as Minister of Health, new powers in relation to replacing that board. I now have them, those powers, and I'm actively considering what to do in that regard. And we'll decide when the PwC report comes back at the end of March. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you very much, Deputy O'Reilly. Now, Deputy Alan Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have quite a number of questions. Um, this is getting even more confusing, to be honest, um, because of the layers of information that are coming out there. Uh, very confused about the timelines. Um, the National Pediatric Development Board, what legislation is that set up under? Set up under SI. Set up under a statutory instrument, typically. Yes, but that, it comes under the Health Corporate Bodies Act, as I understand. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you drill down into it, this idea that somebody can be a representative from the Department of Public Expenditure on that board, under this legislation under which this is set up, be acting in a personal capacity and not be subject to Circular 10, or Circular 12, 2010, which was incorporated into uh, the 2016 Code of, uh, Code of uh, State Bodies. It's complete and utter garbage. It's rubbish. I think they are subject to it, Deputy Gallagher. Yeah, it's rubbish. But it's rubbish. The idea that the Taoiseach could say yesterday that this individual did not have a responsibility to bring to his relevant Secretary General and or Minister, and I believe he should have gone to his Minister, of any concerns in relation to controls, given the legislation under which it was set up in and given the circular that's in place. And I don't think anybody in the Oireachtas really fundamentally believes the line that has been spun about personal capacity. I think it's the weakest of all the weakest arguments that have been put up. And let me just put that there. Um, you were informed on the 9th of November. The 9th of November. Um, who were you with on the 9th of November when you were informed? You want me to, sorry, um, I... I happened to be having a meeting, actually, and this was coincidentally, but the Taoiseach happened to be in my department. So the Taoiseach uh, and you were informed exactly on the 9th of November. So my understanding is that both myself and the Taoiseach became aware on the 9th of November. I think I was aware earlier in the day, I'm not certain, but both day. of us became aware on the same day, to the very best of my recollection. Okay, so the Taoiseach was made aware, you were made aware the same day, and you were together that day, coincidentally. The Minister for Finance and Deeper was made aware as well on the 9th. Is what he said. Isn't that correct? If that's what, I can't speak for him. Yeah, but that's what he said. 
His officials would have been aware on that date anyway, whatever he, when no, he, he said, he said yesterday, he said yesterday, he said yesterday it was the 9th of November. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for reading from my phone, uh, Chair, but I'm just after getting an answer for a PQ regarding when the Department of Public Expenditure were uh, uh, told about this. And the first full assessment of cost overrun and the reasons for it was received by my department in the form of a report from the National Pediatric Hospital Development Board submitted by the Department of Health on the 19th of November. Yeah, I think a formal report was submitted on the 19th. My department reviewed the report and met with the Department of Health to discuss it on the 23rd of November and made a formal submission to me on the 26th of November. I think all of that is true, yeah. So why is he saying he was told on the 9th of November? So I, want that, I don't expect you to answer that because he has to answer it, right? But you, how did you tell him on the 9th of November? So no, on the 9th, on the 9th of November there was a, the Taoiseach was visiting my department and the, there was also officials from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform uh, there as well. This, this shouldn't be construed by the way, and I know you're not suggesting Deputy, uh, that it was a meeting about the Children's Hospital, it wasn't, but on that day that information happened to be available and those present at the meeting would have been aware of it. Um, it is also correct to say that the Exactly as that parliamentary question says. I know, but the well, I really just want to know, what, how did your department inform the Minister for the Public Expenditure on the 9th of November? I actually have to check that the Minister for Public Expenditure was, was informed on the 9th of November. Uh, his, officials, I did, I didn't inform on the his officials were informed on the 9th. Well, he wasn't. I don't believe he was present on, uh, in that So, discussion. we still don't know when he was officially informed, somewhere between the 9th and 19th. But I think you referenced what the Minister said yesterday. Yeah, the night is that he was, what he said was when he was informed. Mm -hmm. That's what was given. So he wasn't committee. informed by me directly. He was presumably informed by his officials. Okay, can I ask the following questions to yourself or Jim, whichever? I'm sorry, Mr. Sure. President, which, whichever. So, you found out in the August. I accept early September, given the time of the year, all that. There's no issue with that. Um, did you make attempts to meet with or inform? the Department of Public Expenditure between the end of August slash September and the 9th of November? And if so, when and what happened? I think Mr. President, better place to answer that, but the, the short answer is yes. Um, at an official level, um, there was um, official engagement uh, in the month of October. Mr. President, I think has actually already answered that at the PAC, so you might... Um, he asked actually, because I was at the PSC. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> I, I read the transcript, but maybe I read it wrong, Mr. President. So, as the Minister has said, uh, the deeper officials would have been aware that there was a process underway. Oh, um, no, no, no. We the, need a bit more. I will. I will. Okay. I will. Just let me give me a minute. Fine. Um, so, during the course of October, then, um, when, when the process was still incomplete, um, officials in the department would have contacted deeper to say, can we arrange a meeting to sit down and go through uh, the emerging situation that we have? Um, and there are emails uh, too deeper in relation to that. Um, those meetings weren't held until November, so the formal uh, briefing and exchange of documents took place in November. So let me get this quite clear. You guys formally knew in all, late August, early September, I'm not worried about the August, September, early September, right? right? Emerging problem. You made attempts by email, and I'm sure you'll be able to publish those emails and give us the correspondence. Uh, Chair, I presume we can ask for, for those. Um, thanks, Minister, for nodding. So you made attempts to meet with the Department of Public Expenditure to discuss this. Is that correct? Yes. I you formally that. requested meetings with Deeper. No, so, so in fairness, we had a discussion on this at the PAC. You asked me the f when they, where they formally advised, and I said November, and you said, well, what about informally? Yeah, and you said October. And in October, we were making contact, not saying what the uh, detail of the issue was, but saying we'd like a meeting on the issue. And why didn't the meeting take place between the end of August and the 9th of November? So definitely not the end of August. Where Sorry, we were September. Contact. So during October, when we were making contact, I think it was scheduling. I think there was obviously a very busy time in terms of uh, uh, the budget and estimate cycle. Uh, it just wasn't possible to put the, the meeting together in October, but we did meet them in November. Okay, so just to get this straight, in all clarity. So from, in October, there were attempts made by the Department of Health to say to Deeper, look, there's an issue building here, which there was, you were very, very much aware of it. Yes. We need to sit down and talk to you, but it never happened until the 9th of November. The ninth was the first uh, was the first face to face engagement on it, and, and is that is that not just down to the public watching here now? Given the fact that you knew there was a significant <coughs> overrun, right? Two hundred million potentially um, 
you know, that was the figures around that time. Um, you know, there was a significant overrun. In parallel with that, there was a budgetary process going on, which has been outlined earlier on. There was a budgetary process going on. You're going to release correspondence uh, to us that shows that you were making attempts to sit down with the Department of Public Expenditure to discuss this issue, whereby there was an official who, under Circular 12, 2010, was obliged to tell his own Minister and Secretary General, and yet you could not get a meeting until the 9th of November. I think the issue of the official is a different official. I agree. And, and I'm, I'm just bringing that in for my own yeah. reasons. But, but, but in, terms of the, um, in terms of the interaction uh, with Deeper, it was very much and no more than uh, we would like to have a meeting with you on this. And um, there was a time lag then between that. But the important thing to also recognise is that the 9th is a significant day because the uh, development board have just completed the GMP process. I know. So in October it's not complete. Yes. Yeah, I think on the 8th it might have completed. So by the 9th we had good information. By the following week we had written information, a written report from the development board. So really it's in that period that this issue crystallises. I, I understand that, but you know, in, a late, in a late August, early September, I mean, the Minister was very clear in his opening remarks about, and I accept what he said about the 61 million 2017 and those issues. I'm going to go through some other minutes now that would raise other concerns relating to other issues, but like, we now know this is a serious, serious escalation. In late August, you have told us before, Minister, you were shocked. You were absolutely annoyed, being in inverted commas, polite. This was a massive issue. In parallel, you had budget negotiations going on. And you look for meetings with the Department of Public Expenditure, who in parallel had somebody on the board. And you couldn't get a meeting. To the public watching outside, you know, this is just Father Ted territory. It just, I mean, for the idea that they would not sit down, that there wasn't an awareness across the two departments, that this is absolutely a huge issue and you couldn't have a meeting. Beggars belief. Beggars belief. And I accept what you said about the November 9th and the, uh, uh, the, the meetings. I understand that. I've gone through it. I've chronologized. I've went through it all. I know exactly. But still, given the fact that an awareness level had come all the way up to the department, to the minister, the idea that it took that length of time to have a meeting, just beggars belief. It beggars belief and throws a whole new line of issues into this. Can I, I, can I, I do think it would have been different if we had been at, as you've said there, if we had been at the level of knowledge of the 8th of the 9th of November, we would have been saying to Deeper, this is the size of the issue and it's complete. Well, let's, let's call it a spade a spade. We knew around here it was around 200 million. We've established that, that there was the, the, the scale of it was at some level at least that. Surely that deserved, lads, we have a big issue here. In parallel, we're doing budget negotiations. Maybe there was a concern one would conflict with the other. Maybe not. I don't want to suggest that, but maybe there was an issue there. But it, it's just to the public outside. If there's anyone watching this, that's just beggar's belief. I, I need to just ask a few questions. I understand what you said in relation to, um, to the 61 million. And the, the minutes of the steering group on the 20th of October 2017, John Pollock said there was a reasonable certainty that this, they, they'd have reasonable certainty about the size of the funding deficit by March 2018. So they knew there was going to be a funding deficit, 61 million probably plus or whatever. On the 23rd of April 2018, <coughs> it was said that the GMP approval was significantly at risk significantly at risk. And now remember, there's a whole host of HSE, uh, and um, Mr. Sullivan there was chairing this meeting. Uh, uh, so there was an awareness that GMP was significantly at risk. On the 31st of May, it was said that a memo would be going to government by October. Um, on the 25th of June, BAM were asked as regards a response to the implication of the delay. So throughout April, May, June, GMP was way off. It was going to be in trouble. Now, through all of this process, the Department of Public Expenditure and yourselves would have been aware that the GM process hadn't been concluded. You had people on the board, you were, you know, you had an awareness level, you brought in layers of oversight, you had the steering group over the board, you had another board over the steering group, 
You brought them in, obviously, because you're concerned. You wouldn't have brought them in otherwise. Um, what's, what's, what I can't figure out is the GMP process, like, there was concerns being expressed at that stage. How did those, and I've just spoken about them, I've read the steering minutes, from April, May, June, how did those, they not elevate up through the department to yourself, Minister? That's the first thing, and I know they came in August. And the second thing is, the Department of Public Expenditure was also aware that the GMP process. And this, the Department of Public Expenditure have people sitting inside there who monitor all capital budget lines. They have people specifically up there representing health, dealing with health. And were they not asking? Because the GMP was way off, were they not asking? Where was this at? Was there any communications from them to yourselves saying, this is way off? Can I give the Minister an opportunity yeah. to yeah. answer that, and then I'm going to have to move on to... Uh, so one, to very, very one small follow-up, that's it. Uh, yeah. Minister, thank you. Yeah, so, so I, can only, I can only answer some of those questions, Deputy, because I can only answer for myself and my department. But, I mean, certainly when I heard, as I said to Deputy Donnelly earlier on the, I think it was September 2017, about the, the 61 million, which I appreciate you accept is, is different, and thank you for that, I, I would have written on the 20th of uh, September on the information I was given. Government has been very clear on this project needs to come in within budget. Now, for all the good it did, but that was that was the position that I was holding, that there was mitigation. Where did you write that? On, on the note that I was given, which I'm happy to give to you, okay. um, to which, which is the note telling me about the 61 million euro pressure, right? So I wrote on the 20th of September 2017, government's been very clear on this project needs to come within, within budget. That was the position of the government. That was also the position, in fairness, of the Department of Health, my Secretary General and senior officials, who were feeding back the information through the appropriate structures. Guys, you've got to do stuff here. You've got to look at your contingency. You've got to look at descoping where appropriate. You've got to look at value engineering. You've got to look at risk management. So I just, I do need to make that point. It was fine under 61 million, not under 200 million. It was fine under 61 million, not the 200 million. So can I get to that bit? Your frustration. Um, is one shared by me and is one of the reasons that we have an external review. How did we have a situation whereby there were all of these governance structures and there wasn't what I'm politely calling um, the early warning system, which my Secretary General has referred to as well, uh, which I know the HSE have referred to, which I think even board members have reflected on. Why wasn't there flags going off earlier? And who decided that those flags need not go off earlier is an issue that the PwC report uh, absolutely needs to go. Now, there was an issue, Deputy Kelly, and you, you know it too, that the, G, the timeline for the GMP process uh, kept getting pushed out, that it was taking longer to complete that process, um, and that there was obviously, as part of that process, commercial negotiations ongoing, and therefore a great degree, perhaps, of uncertainty as to where the figures would actually end up. But without preempting the PwC report, I, I don't think you'd need it to suggest that uh, it's clearly, in terms of early warning, something was, something was badly lacking. I'm fine. Uh, just to clarify, um, yeah. uh, firstly, I'm going to come back in on that second part, the 200 million, because I, I'm, sure. I don't agree with what you said there. But, uh, Mr. Breslin, a number of occasions now, I've asked for the briefing note, and you said you'd give us the briefing note that was given to the Minister on the 27th of August. This is the third time I've asked for it. Like, can you ask one of your officials now to get it and send it around to this committee before we conclude today? Please. Because I'm sick of asking for it. So, so I have no difficulty liaising with the Secretariat on that. that okay. That's the procedure we use. Fine. The Secretariat. But I, it's my third time and third meeting asking for it. But it's not just me, Deputy. If, if deputies ask for a range of issues, then we capture them and we liaise with the Secretariat. But you haven't done it to date. I've asked for it numerous times. I'm, I'm very happy to do that today. Well, it should have happened. I'm I'm, I know I keep saying this. The last thing is, today, I think through the Chair, I've already asked that the correspondence, because otherwise I'll play in a PQ and be put off for weeks and weeks, like, I've had to fight for information, but through the chair and with the committee's uh, um, agreement, uh, the correspondence between <coughs> yourselves and Deeper requesting meetings regarding this issue um, from the time of in the bog slash September up to the 19th of November, I think it is now. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Kelly. Uh, now, Deputy Bernard Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to go back to some of the questions I raised earlier at this committee meeting. And incidentally, I'm aware of the fact that this issue has been dealt with before the Public Accounts Committee, which is inappropriate because the Public Accounts Committee does not have a competence in, in policy. In fact, it's specifically excluded from policy. So I want to establish that, Mr. Chairman, because it, it undermines your, 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 your role and function as the 
the chairperson uh, of this committee. And uh, so that, that speculation, insofar as the Public Accounts Committee is concerned, is outside their remit, they're acting ultra various, and, and uh, there are consequences if that continues. The point I want to raise is in relation to, to tenders. The process of evaluating a tender how does that, somebody might tell me how that, how that works. For instance, what is the capacity of the clients to assess the validity of the tender? And the, it's, 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 how can it be grounded? How can, can we test it? And what process was done in this particular case? Yeah, so um, the, the normal course, I won't speak because, as I've said, I wasn't involved in, in, in this uh, specific instance, but the normal course would be that there's a, um, a request for tenders issued, which says this is the specification that we want, this is what we want uh, to be delivered. There's an indication, in this case, an indication from companies that they have the requisite ability to do that. So they put forward their... Uh, capacity to undertake a job at this scale and they get shortlisted. In this situation five companies for the main contract are shortlisted and then in advance of any tenders being received the people who are going to award the contract come up with a marking scheme in line with the request for tenders that they issued. That will be a combination of uh, quality and cost. My understanding in this situation was the first thing that was done when the tenders were open was a sealed process around quality, so you had to meet the quality criteria before you were evaluated for price. So those companies that met the quality criteria were then evaluated on the price that they were tendering, and marks were awarded based on that. To whom did you have to prove your ability to meet to, uh, in those circumstances? For instance, I could sit in a tender. And if, if, if I'm obliged, if the, if the client is obliged to accept the lowest tender, I'd like you to, to give some time on that as well. Uh, how do you know, how do you assess uh, whether this lowest tender is, is feasible at all? Uh, and and uh, I, I, I move on from that, when you answer that as well, in relation to the detailed specification and the bill of quantities. Presumably, all that is made available to the tenderer at the time, and in order that the tenderer can present a valid tender. So, so I am speaking second hand on this, but, but my understanding is so the first thing that was done on receipt of um, the tenders was that a, a team was put together to assess, to evaluate the quality, and that carried out without the cost being present in what they were uh, evaluating. Uh, it, it evaluated the quality of the tender and the detail, technical detail of the tender. Um, and did it conclude that all the tenders were, were feasible and valid and, and soundly based? Yes, I believe so, it did, yes. How do you know? Just from what I'm, I'm uh, reading from here. And who, who actually uh, produced that conclusion? So, so the, the development board are responsible. They're the contracting authority and they're responsible for the award of the tender. So they're the client? They're the client. And, and normally, deputy, I would not have this information. Normally, that process is sealed like a drum and nobody can mm. interact with it. In these circumstances, we obviously have information on it, which I'm passing on to you, but I wasn't in the process. And, and just maybe to, to clarify one point I think you are interested in, uh, my understanding of the scoring, so quality was assessed and price was assessed, and my understanding of the scoring was that there was a percentage of 25% for quality and 75% for price. Therefore, the most economically advantageous was awarded. Well, Mr. Chairman, therein lies a, a serious question as to whether uh, that is good practice or not. In the previous existence, uh, I, I and many of my colleagues would have been uh, cautious about tenders, and particularly the testing of a tender. Now, I know that tenders uh, cannot, they cannot qualify the tender. It's illegal to qualify a tender. Uh, at least it's, in theory it is anyway. But in, in this particular situation, what I am concerned about is this, is that all kinds of figures have been thrashed around over the last few weeks as to where the project came from and where it went. My summation is this, is that, that at the initial stages, 
the project wasn't adequately costed <coughs> from the point of view of the client. Because if it was, we wouldn't have the degree of overrun that we have now. And for that reason, I'm asking the question, uh, what competence existed on the board uh, uh, to assess the validity and, 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 and the basis for the tender? For instance, why didn't somebody say, hold on for a second, this is the lowest tender, and, and uh, economic, you mentioned the economic reasons, obviously, in that direction. That could, be, that could be the wrong decision. That could be the wrong decision at that stage, undermining the whole process. So could you maybe elucidate somewhat on, on how we prevent that kind of thing from happening again? Or would the same thing happen again? Two things. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a clear... Um, um, approach to the competency that would be needed within the professional staff of the development board, which were recruited by the development board, and to the competency on the board. And if there was one body that was specifically set up for the task it was being given, it is this body. It wasn't an existing body that was asked to take on something different. Would you, you look like you were good at doing this, would you ever do something different? This was a body that was specifically set up for the purposes of executing the children's hospital and it recruited competency for that task. Um, the P, uh, uh, PWC um, uh, review will look very carefully at this process, at procurement, at how that was managed, whether the right process was utilised, how it was utilised, whether the, the approach taken was fully in line with best practice. So we will have experts independently by the end of March say how this was handled, and I think that will be important for us all to be able to see. And can I just add to that, Deputy Dirk, uh, two points I'd make. I think the first point to echo the Secretary General's um, is an important one. We have had, and indeed I've sat in front of you before, a Rochtis committee that have predetermined the outcome of expert reports only to be proven to be 100% incorrect. Um, so we've had committees talking about cover-ups and the likes, and then we've had expert reports like Dr Scali find there was none. So I think if we are going down the route, which we are, uh, of an expert inquiry, if we have been um, collaborative in trying to make sure that those terms of reference are robust and taken on board the weaknesses that members of this committee rightly highlighted in them and that we've addressed them. I think it's um, I think we should allow it to do its work and I know you I know you're a believer in that due process too. I would also just add and I think this, this should be a cause of great frustration and concern to all of us, because if you look at the board of the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board, and take out the names, because this is not about personalities, if you look at the competencies and skill sets of the people on the board, it does read like a who's who, in terms of who you'd want actually developing capital projects. So again, without getting into the names, you're talking about chartered engineers, former managing directors of very large uh, construction companies. You're talking about a solicitor with 40 years experience of dealing with public authorities, developments, archi developers, architects, engineers, surveyors, and builders. You're talking about people who have won a huge commendation, members for Ireland of the International Court of Arbitration, chartered engineer, former president of the Institute of, Arch uh, of Engineers, founding director of the Environmental Protection Agency, an architect by profession, people who've worked outside of the jurisdiction, uh, a fellow of the Royal Institute of Architects, uh, a deputy chairperson of board Planola, a procurement expert. So often as politicians, and I can say this because I didn't make the, I'm not saying this to, to throw bouquets at ourselves because I didn't make these decisions, but but often, as politicians, there's, there, there's accusations of kind of tapping random people on the shoulder and saying, congratulations, you're on this board because you're a branch chair or something stupid like that, right? This was a competency-based board, is a competency-based board, in, in terms of the skill sets um, of the people on it to deliver major projects. So it is in that, that, that I suppose adds to the frustration, Deputy Durkin, that you have a board with such a skill set. And yet, clearly, the price that government presumed to be the price of the National Children's Hospital, based on all of the expert advice and all of the professional advice available to that board, uh, 983 million transpired uh, to be a much higher cost. And I do also want to say, because I, I, I think it's important to say, Chairman, I hear people, you know, jumping up uh, this project will now cost two billion and more than that. Can we please just let the record show the sanctioned sum for this project is 1.4 billion? And we've asked PwC specifically to look at how we can mitigate some of those costs. Included within that 1.4 billion, along with money wasted, 40 million euro on the matter site, which never took off, but included within that um, is an effort um, to get philanthropy. And also included, 
I'm sorry, not included, but something that will have to be considered, uh, is the future role of the assets that we currently have, like, for example, Crumlin Hospital, uh, when they move to a new hospital, and what value is on that in terms of new services being delivered there, or indeed uh, funding that could be provided towards the cost of this new hospital. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Thank you. Chairman, uh, given that this was the biggest project uh, in the history of the Department uh, of Health, was there any particular um, attention paid to the magnitude of the contract uh, at, at this stage, at the, at, the, at the awarding of tenders, the testing of, 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 of the tenders, uh, the, the, the bill of quantities, were the bill of, of quantities around at that stage it should be, I presume it was, <clears throat> and uh, I know that the bill of quantities was, was, was found ultimately to be short of the target. Uh, why was that not spotted uh, uh, at uh, the stage that it should have been spotted? Because the, the cost increases, I have them in front of me here, I don't want to go through them again, but they, they, it would appear to me that there was a serious deficiency in, in, in the degree to which the tenderer could uh, assess the, 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 the price and come up with, with, with a competitive price and at the same time not come up with a shortfall. Uh, if, if, for instance, uh, that information wasn't precise. Given that there are three projects running together, the one in the Children's Hospital, the one in the Critical Care in, in, in Blanchestown, and the one in Talla, and to what extent were they all examined at the same time with a view to identifying uh, possible stags? Because when you have three different projects at three different sites, there is the potential for something to go wrong. I mean, the decision was consciously made by the government of the day, and indeed remains the government's position, that the best way of delivering this project was actually to bring in that expertise and professionalism that you rightly talk about. That it doesn't, with no disrespect to my department, it doesn't exist in-house in the Department uh, of Health, such as the scale and magnitude of this. So appoint a competency-based board, one that I've described as a who's who in terms of professional qualifications uh, and experience. Allow them also bring in professional expertise, and then the legal power did not reside in terms of the awarding um, with me or the Department of Health, but actually with the Development Board. There is some, there's something, because you're, you're talking about the bill of quantities there, and I'm, you've reminded me of something. The benefit of this procurement process, the GMP process as it's now known, the two-stage procurement process, the benefit of this was that it actually locked in the price per item at 2016 costs. Mm. Where we have been badly let down is the quantities were entirely incorrect, and you've heard that in the evidence given. Uh, already to this committee and indeed to other committees as well. So, talk about widgets. The cost of the widget that we're, is still at 2016, but they need a hell of a lot more widgets. And what I want to know, and one of the reasons the government wants to have an external review is, who messed that up? Who got that wrong? And when we know who got that wrong, we're going to take action, a deputy. And PwC isn't going to take the action. That's not what they do. They're going to identify that, and then we're going to act. We're going to act as a government, whether it's through powers that we have under contracts that we may have had with professional companies, whether it's through changes of governance structures, changes of boards, personnel. We will act then. But clearly, that, that's where the big, you know, there's lots of reasons for the various composition of the 1.4 billion. But that's really where a big, big, big proportion of it is. The good thing was prices were locked in at 2016. The really worrying thing was that the quantities were so off. Uh, and the quantities weren't decided by you or I, Deputy. They were decided by professionals, uh, paid a handsome fee uh, to get this right. And that's what we've got to get to the bottom of. Thank you very much, Minister. And thank you Do very we, much, uh, Deputy no, Durkin. Can I have one other question? I, 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 it seems to be very short. I'm just beginning to enjoy myself. The main question, the main question, I think, for the benefit of, 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 of the state, uh, the client, and, and, and uh, for the information of the committee, is to uh, give some indication as to what we have learned uh, in this particular process. For instance, how do we get professionals who are capable of identifying, the, the, uh, having read the detailed spec, uh, come up with a bill of quantities uh, that gives a clear indication as to what the costs are going to be, and then we can get the, the guaranteed maximum price in, in place. Because without uh, learning something from it, we can find ourselves back in the same position once again. And, I, and, 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 and finally, I want to just say this, Mr. Chairman, I referred to it before. Uh, <clears throat> whenever I hear the phrase, who, who knew what, who said what to whom and when,
<clears throat> That's the phrase from, from McCarthy investigations back in the United States a long, long time ago. And what that actually means is this, that by asking a series of confusing questions in rapid order, one can implicate the friends and relatives of all the people who are being questioned and in a way that proves a point that is extremely vague, to say the least of it, but it only becomes obvious. The most recent effort in this uh, regard was the public accounts uh, investigation, as it were, into the uh, God, the Commissioner, wherein several allegations were made about serious wrongdoing and knowledge by the Commissioner and by the Minister of the Day and so on and so forth. And this is a serious issue, Mr Chairman. Playing politics is one thing. But this is a serious matter that we don't want to have repeated again. It transpired, ultimately, that there was no basis for the allegations, no basis for the supposition, and all that was, all that was happening was a, 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 tourist, a, a, a tourist project on behalf of people who wanted to make a name for themselves at somebody else's expense. So if, 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 if the Public Accounts Committee goes down that road once again, there will be repercussions. I want, the, I want the answer to the question about the, 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 the learning curve. So can I respond? I, I think you've asked a fair point. Robust questioning is a really important part of any um, democracy, uh, but so too is due process. Um, and I don't believe it is the job of a minister, or certainly not the only job of a minister, to find partial information and chuck it out into the media or on the floor of the doll and say, that's a grand job done, I told you all about the problem. I actually believe the job of a minister is to make decisions based on full facts to make sure that there's due diligence done, to stress test things, and then make decisions when they're difficult. And you know what, I've often reflected in recent, not just days, but weeks and months, that perhaps the easiest way to get through being Minister for Health is to keep the head down and do nothing. But actually, if you decide to try and do complex things, if you decide to try and do complex things, Deputy Boyd Barrett, maybe one day you'll be in this role, and you can give it a go <laughs> too. But if you, decide to do, if you decide to do complex things, um, with that comes risk and challenge. Yes. But it's worth it, because otherwise we're not going to build a National Children's Hospital. Like, there's a reason the Children's Hospital was first mentioned in these, in these houses in the 1960s. My mother was born in the 1960s. Like, you know, I mean, how long, how, long, how long does this have to go on for? We are building this hospital. We're going to get to the question, but we're going to get to it in a logical way. And that brings me to the next point about what do we learn. So the learnings on this are going to be a lot bigger than just my department. There's no doubt about that. Thankfully, we're back in an era of of growth in terms of capital and doing big projects and that's really good and that's why I'm excited about the appointment I've made of Fred Barry uh, as the new chair of the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board because Mr Barry as CEO of the National Roads Authority showed an ability to come into that organisation and demand that projects got delivered on time and on budget so I think Fred Barry will bring a very forensic eye to this and he has my full support uh, in doing that but we also need to be careful that we don't presume yet again that all of these costs were avoidable that we presume that everybody just made loads of big mistakes and that actually if they hadn't made the load of big mistakes it would have been 983. We know for example, we know this without a PwC report, we know that there was a user engagement where they went out subject to the, after the government decision of April 2017, they went out and further engaged with staff and patients and staff and patients made other changes. That's appropriate. That's not a big, I'm not suggesting that's a big proportion, I think it's about 20 million, right? We know that there was a high court ruling in relation to fire safety standards. Yes, of course, there were fire safety uh, precautions in the existing hospital, but the High Court said you need to do more. We know that was several more million. Um, and we also, we need, so we need to differentiate, and it's not, my, it's not within my competency to do it, and that's why we brought in PwC. What, what costs were unavoidable, that were just sadly going to happen, and this hospital is going to cost more than we thought it was? And what could have been avoided had people done their job that didn't do their job? And that's, that's what we've got to do. But we, we shouldn't just jump to Category 2 and presume everything sits in that bucket. Thank or if we do, we may cancel the external you. review and you can just Thank issue your findings now. Thank you. Uh, can I now uh, bring in Deputy Margaret Murphy? Thank you, Chair. I'd like to welcome you all in here this morning and uh, to wish Ms O'Connor well in, in her role. And it's great to see a woman in such a high position, so wish you the best of luck. If you want to ask her a question, <laughs> she's, she's, she's here all morning. Make you feel the love. <laughs> or not the love, maybe. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, Minister, with respect, do you think the whole health sector and indeed you are unravelling? You, you kind of reminded me now of a knitted jumper with the sleeve and the, tra you know, the, the wool is coming away. Like you have the overspin, the nurses strike. The cervical smear, the GPs outside today. Like, do you 
Can you see that you are unravelling before our eyes? Thanks very much. Uh, no, I can't. Uh, I can't, and I've never knitted really, other than I think at primary school. But uh, I, I, I get, I get the analogy, which look is a, is is a, is, a, is a political charge, uh, albeit as always with you pre presented very politely. Um, no, I don't. I'm very proud of the record that I have so far in the Department of Health. Of course, like so many uh, before me, and I'm sure those after me, I've made mistakes and things that I'd rather do a different way. Uh, but on my watch, we've worked together to repeal the 8th. We've introduced the Public Health Alcohol Bill. We're building a national children's hospital that others have shirked from or tried to locate in sites that couldn't even get planning permission and wasted 40 million euro. We're increasing the number of nurses, 3,300 more nurses working in the health service over the last five years. And yes, we've challenges in health, but you can stick a different minister in here, maybe your own party leader, uh, maybe your former party leader, maybe my party leader, uh, and all of us uh, have one thing in common, that we all face challenges. The Department of Health it is very challenging. If you, you reference cervical check, uh, and I, I don't think the chair would appreciate if I opened up a large debate on that, and I look forward to the debate on that in the Dáil this evening. But you know, I take I take comfort in my work from the comments of people who have been impacted by the cervical check audit, uh, who know the work I've done and have articulated their view of how I've worked with them quite publicly. So they're the people I care about, quite frankly, uh, rather than the views of political opponents in terms of my record. Um, the last the last. Uh, this period of time has been extremely challenging. And you're right, there's lots of issues that have come together at the same time. And we're going to work our way through them. We're going to resolve the nurses' strike, because all disputes get resolved. It doesn't just lie to me to do that, as you know. There's a central uh, government pay policy issue there. And you resolve disputes by sitting down and engaging, and that needs to happen urgently. And I, I want to resolve the nurses' dispute. In relation to the GPs, and we may, we may get into a few specific questions on that later, but you saw the IMO statement. Uh, this week about, or sorry, um, circular to their members um, about the significant progress that we're making in moving beyond FEMPI and reversing the cuts that were imposed by, by your party and some by mine uh, in government during the economically difficult years. So I'm going to work as hard as I can to work my way through issues. We're not going to solve them all. Uh, we're going to keep at it. But uh, unravel jumper, I, I'm, I'm okay, thanks. <laughs> sure have no, I probably uh, will agree to differ. I think you are unravelling, to be honest with you. But anyway. That's okay. Yeah. We can discuss discuss it again. Um, Minister, when will we know what projects are being, as the Taoiseach uh, quoted, reprofiled? When when will we know? So my understanding is that the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform said yesterday at the committee, using my recollection, that he plans on um, bringing a memo to government. I think next week, uh, in relation to how we're going to deal with this capital pressure uh, in 2019. I also note his comments, and I don't have them in front of me, so I don't want to misquote. Him. Uh, but his view that there was a way of dealing with this, um, perhaps more optimistically than had originally been interpreted. But I await to see with the Minister for Pairs. Um, and will now, you be actually named week. Minister, do you expect? Or and will then, it be just an amount? So my understanding, Deputy murphy Manny, and some of this is Minister Donoghue's area of responsibility, but my understanding is it will likely give people their revised ceilings, and then they will have to be applied to departments. So there may, be a, there may be a bit of work between, let's say, this is what health is now getting, what is the impact in relation to that. But I, and I don't want to repeat myself or take up your time. There, there's a context to all of this. You know, my, my capital budget in the Department of Health and the HSE is nearly 700 million. We've defined 50 million during the course of 2019. You'd rather not have defined it. You'd rather be getting an extra 50 million than finding 50 million. But it's 50 million at 700. I think the entire capital budget for the state this year is about 7 billion, I think. The, incre the increase alone is 1.1 billion. The entire government has to find 100 million not being in any way flippant about that, yes. but it does need to be seen in that context. This is about you know, paying a bill a month or two late here, <laughs> staggering the starting times of projects, not the widespread cancellation of projects by any manner or means. Okay, yeah, I suppose what I don't want is um, figures and no project being no, named. I, neither do I. People need to have certainty as yeah. is my project happening. And I, I, once I get the Minister for Pairs um, final figures, presumably next week, we'll move quickly on that in the coming weeks. Okay. And just, uh, I suppose, go back to basics, why you're in here, like, you're here coincidentally, I suppose, because you That's were right. due here. So I got lucky. If we can just go back, yeah. <laughs> I'd say you were delighted with the timing. I was. Yeah. Um, Minister, the last time you were in here, I brought up a case of Anne, who has gone public, so I can mention her. Um, she was retested uh, for a cervical smear because her test was inconclusive, and you asked me to get on to you which I did, and, and you wrote back. Um, I suppose your, your letter was a bit generic, saying it's important that she gets rechecked and all that, which she did, she did in November, but she's still waiting for the results of that one. So, and Anne is just, you know, a, a symbol of many, many women across the country. So, 
um, and I know you're aware of many cases, but just to get it across to you, you know, the, particularly when her test was inconclusive, you know, that there is a worry there, and every day, yes. you know, sometimes you're better off, uh, well, always you're better off just knowing, so I just want to make you aware of that. Um, Minister, are there um, plans in place to extend the long-term illness list, or are you leaving it as it is? Okay. Um, yeah, I take this too? Few, yeah. <coughs> um, so I might ask Dr. Peter McKenna in a moment if he wishes to add anything to, to, to what I say from, from a clinical perspective, Dr. McKenna. Um, but in relation to cervical check, and I was answering questions on this yesterday in the Dáil, and, and indeed today we have a debate and questions and answers in the Dáil on it as well. And I, and I remember your, your letter and, and the case of Anne, and you did indeed raise it here. So there, there's, no, there's no two ways about it. We have a very significant backlog in relation to our cervical check programme. Uh, from my recollection, on average, that is a waiting time of about 22 weeks. I'm not in any way suggesting that's appropriate, desirable or acceptable. I do want Anne and, and all the other women impacted to know that everything possible has been done to, to, to drive that down, including the HSE working to find additional capacity. And this is extremely challenging. There's a global shortage of cytology, uh, but the HSE are working on a capacity plan, which I expect to get shortly. So you need to know, and, and I think you do know, this is not a resourcing issue. If there was a check we could write to solve this problem, we'd write it in the morning. Um, I, do, I do think I need to explain, I suppose, why, not, not explain, but just point out why there's a backlog, I suppose, for two reasons. Uh, when the cervical check uh, controversy broke, uh, many people, probably people in this room, uh, and the number one query to the helpline from women was saying, if I want to repeat smear test, can I have it? And do I have to pay for it? And people were rightly saying, well, it's not right or fair that a woman for reassurance can get it if she can afford it, but another woman, you tell her to wait three years. At that great time of uncertainty, there wasn't, it wasn't easy to provide clarity on our screening programme. We needed to wait for Dr Scally's report to do that. So I took the decision. Contrary to the cheap political charges that have been made against me, I took the decision in conjunction with my officials and the chief medical officer um, to offer the free repeat smear test and I negotiated the fee to be paid to GPs uh, with, the, with the IMO. So that has definitely meant that lots more women went for tests. Many of them got reassurance, but it has contributed to the backlog. The second reason is, and we saw this in the UK, which what they, what they kind of describe as the Jade Goody effect, that after Jade Goody's high profile illness, a lot of new women opted into the screening service. We also saw that, I don't have specific figures, but I'm being told could be up to a third of the backlog, but I can't stand over that yet, it's not validated, could be up to a third of the backlog being new women signing up for the screening program um, that have yet, that had, hadn't participated, but I'm waiting figures on that. So they're the main reasons, they are the reasons behind the backlog. People are working night and day. People who are very familiar to this committee, like Mr Damien McCallion and the HSE, are doing everything they possibly can on it. I'm very confident of that. In terms of the clinical risk, I'm told that cervical cancer is something that can develop over a period of 10 to 15 years. So I am told the clinical risk is low. But Dr McKenna, you're much more qualified to speak about clinical risk than I am. So. Well, I can just confirm that it is a disease that uh, develops usually over a 10 to 15 year period. And that is why engaging with the programme and having several smears rather than relying on a single smear is very important. Um, the programme dealt with an expansion of about over 100,000 smears. This is against a backdrop of the programme doing about a quarter of a million every year. So that's a very substantial increase in number. Um, the, the other thing to bear in mind is that it is very difficult now to get screeners internationally because as screeners see that the programs internationally will be moving to HPV, it is not considered to be a career that has necessarily got a long-term future. So the number of screeners internationally is, uh, is decreasing. Um, and this is not regarded as being a particularly friendly environment for companies uh, to work in currently. Um, I should say that the, one of the laboratories which has been um, coming under criticism, one of the American ones, has proven to be very helpful. Uh, and the HSE has funded the development of the Coombe Laboratory, which will in the future be able to provide a much larger capacity uh, of reading smears uh, in Ireland in a publicly funded laboratory, which as a long, medium to long term goal would be very helpful. Important that it gets out from here that women continue to be tested 
you know, and not to get hit up about waiting or, you know, well, that, that's the main thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it has been said that women have lost confidence in the programme, but generally speaking, when people lose confidence in a programme, let's say for vaccination, they stop coming. Uh, exactly the opposite has happened here. And whereas there is undoubtedly a lot of concern, I think it's overstating it to say that women have lost confidence. They are appearing, they understand the message, and uh, they understand that uh, this is the only way currently we have of detecting cervical cancer. So I, I don't subscribe to the, the feeling that people have totally lost confidence in this. Of course it could be I improved. I hope so. And Would well, you like me to answer your question on the LTI? Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. So just on the long-term illness card, um, it's not my intention to expand it in its current scope, but what I am looking at is the extension of entitlement for all health services beyond medical card, GP visit cards, LTI, to the universal entitlement under Slauncha Care. So there's a big body of work that needs to be done about universal entitlement to health services under Slauncha Care, and uh, the Slauncha Care team will be beginning that work this year. Thanks, Minister. And just one more, sorry, Chair. Um, Minister of Freestyle Libra, any plans to extend that to um, reimbursement for, for everybody? So my, my understanding, I may have to revert to the deputy if my HSE colleagues I don't have any more information. The Freestyle Libra is already ex is already available for certain categories. I don't have an update on that. Um, can we check that for you, yeah, Deputy, and back uh, come back to you directly on that? Do please. Okay. And Minister Spurnraza, any update on what's happening? There's a lot of families waiting. Absolutely. My, my understanding the is final that approval. currently with the HSC leadership, HSC for final approval. Leadership team. So it's coming back in. So Spinraza has been discussed uh, in detail, and there's some more questions been asked. It's due to be considered again at our next leadership team meeting. Okay. Okay. And just um, my colleague, Minister McGrath. Um, Minister, the waiting list, as, as you're very aware of, um, for assessment of needs and, and after that for the therapies, are particularly high in Cork and, and Kerry, actually. C can you answer me why this is? Yeah. Why, why specifically Cork is, is way higher than the national average? And what are you going to do about it, please? Uh, well, first of all, yes, I am aware, uh, Deputy, and I am very conscious of that, and that is one of the reasons why in this year's negotiations on the HSC service plan, we prioritise assessment of need in relation to the number of measures being taken. So we, we do accept that argument, and Cork and Kerry are particularly high, and uh, there seems to be a high number of young families and young children with disabilities coming through uh, into the services uh, and uh, that's something that we've put a strong focus on. So basically what I'm doing is I'm doing a number of things first of all to deal with the issue and there are two main uh, initiatives underway uh, Chair in relation to this issue. First of all we're trying to reorganise the disabilities services in geographical teams uh, under the Progressing Disability Services programme and this is basically we're trying to cl uh, clear a pathway for children irrespective of their disability where they can where they can uh, uh, get services. The second thing is that uh, the second initiative is the new standard operating procedure for assessment of need and the purpose is to, is to ensure that children and their families uh, access appropriate assessment uh, uh, intervention as early as possible. And the third thing which is very important is that uh, we're also doing a lot of uh, in schools early years speech and language therapy and occupational therapy demonstration projects in, a lot, in areas as well. And this is something that, we're, uh, that we've, that we've uh, rolled out already. And it's made up of uh, 75 preschools, 60 primary schools, and 15 post-primary schools uh, right across the different areas. So that's <laughs> to, uh, the, the, the fourth thing. And the final thing then is in relation to uh, this year's uh, service plan, what we've done basically is we've seen the, the situation and we've taken a very serious the points that you've raised yourself, Deputy, that uh, we need to improve the amount of uh, speech and language therapists in the system. And we have uh, already, as I speak, we're recruiting more speech and language therapy uh, therapists in the services. We got a budget for 100, and of course we will try and drive that higher as we go along. But yes, I do take the point that there are issues there, but the assessment of need is a very, very uh, important focus, and I will focus on that. And also, we need to understand that, that, uh, that these 
that the additional therapy posts will make a dent in as well. There are also industry relations issues as well behind the scenes, but these issues have been resolved, and I'm confident now that we can uh, 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 roll out uh, the, uh, the, the services for these younger families. But can I say it's a priority for me in 2019, because when I came, took over here first three years ago, we had the school leavers issue, we had the respite issue, and we had other issues as well in the disability services. But, of course, after listening to colleagues like yourself, Deputy Margaret, we have to do something about the assessment need, and that has started already, and I will drive that in 2019. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir. Thank you very Thank much. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Murphy. Now, uh, we're going to move to Senator Colin Burke. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming in here this morning. Can I just go back on the uh, hospital contract issue and to the department? And, you know, the, in planning out for, for, for this project, I presume the department would have looked at other projects internationally um, that where, work, where uh, new hospitals were built. For instance, uh, Manchester Children's Hospital, uh, 371 beds cost... 504 million sterling in 2004, so that's about 680 um, million euros. Um, a project in Ontario um, is costing 2.4 billion uh, Canadian dollars, which is about 1.68 billion euros. The interesting thing about the Ontario project is they've got about 1.3 billion in, in donations from the public for building that hospital. Um, but I'm just wondering, in relation to dealing with this project, um, it was going to be a, a huge project. There's 6,151 rooms in, in the hospital, or 6,150 rooms. Um, my understanding is at any one time there's going to be about 140 outpatient uh, clinics running. Uh, and the building itself is about the length of uh, Grafton Street. Um, and then, you know, projects which went radically wrong in the past, like, for instance, the Port Tunnel went from 250 million to 900 million. Surely the department must have been aware that in dealing with any issue on this, that there had to be precise detail worked out um, at a very early stage. And I'm just wondering, was that all of those risks identified uh, at the very early stage? The, the other issue that I want to go on to is about when exactly were the various stages of contracts signed? For instance, you know, you're quoting, you're talking about the tender came in at 637 million, and then we end up in April at 983 million. 983 million. Can we get an outline of the additional items that went in uh, from the 637? I presume there were mechanical items, electrical items. Have we the exact figures on those? so that we can make up the, from 637 to 983, and then when exactly were the contracts for those various additional items signed? You know, was it all signed only in December 2018, or were they signed at an earlier stage? And then, you know, the finite detail. The finite detail was about where everything was to go in each room. Uh, you know, why did it take so long to work out the finite detail? Um, we got planning commission in April 2016. Um, they would have already, when the tenders were in, uh, invited in, there was a bill of quantities done and sent out to each of the people who were tendering. Uh, and I presume it was known at that stage that there were certain items not included in that bill of quantities. Um, so, you know, when did the process start about work you out the finite detail. And finally, in relation to the second highest tender, and this issue was raised here, even if we took the second highest tender, the other additional items like mechanical and electrical, would they have still worked out at the same price, or would there have been a difference? So I'm just wondering if those issues uh, could be dealt with, um, because I think there's a need for clarification in the public domain in relation to the 637 to the 983, and then how it pro progress after that. Thank you very much, Senator Burke. Uh, Minister? <clears throat> yeah, I'll ask uh, the Secretary General to come in on a few of the issues, but just to, to comment on a few things. I mean, I was listening to the former Taoiseach, uh, Bertie Ahern, talk about this at the weekend on, on radio in terms of the huge amount of work that he did in his time and, and his ministers did in relation to the, the big debate and discussion about the need for a children's hospital, what other countries have done, what sites. Um, 
So I'm just struck when you're, to when you're, when you're, when you're talking about that. There's so many ministers for health and governments and Taoiseach you have to go back through in relation to this project. This is something that was probably scrutinised and considered and debated and probably more than any other capital project and bizarrely uh, still yet to be delivered. I was also I was also struck when you referenced some projects that ran over and, weren't, and were delivered. I was also struck when I heard uh, some members of the commentariat comment um, in recent days about other projects um, like Thornton Hall, 50 million of taxpayers' money, the Masher site, 40 million, e-voting machines, p powers and try to compare them to this. Obviously, that's such a ridiculous analogy because the difference between all of them was none of them happened. This children's hospital is going to open, and actually, the Connolly part of it is going to open this summer. The X-ray machine was delivered this week, and it's going to start serving uh, kids uh, this year as well. Just on the comparative costs uh, with other countries and the international comparisons, I think Senator Burke is right to raise this. So ACOM um, did do an external report in relation to this, and they estimated that the cost of this project is roughly 6,500 uh, per square metre. Now, they also looked at international comparisons, and they said to build the equivalent hospital, so not a house or a hotel or all the different analogies, an equivalent paediatric hospital in London would cost €9,000 uh, per square metre as well. They also talked about the kind of spectrum of the costs, I don't have them in front of me, but being somewhere between kind of 6000 and 8000 So this is a project where, and you didn't do this, Senator Burke, but if you measure it just by beds, you can get a great headline figure about the world's most expensive hospital. But if you actually realise that paediatric healthcare is about a hell of a lot more than just putting a child in a bed, um, you realise that this project is not the world's most expensive hospital or anything really like it, because we're going from, let's say, 14 theatres today serving children in Ireland. And we all know the impact of only having 14 theatres in terms of waiting times to 22 theatres. We're going to outdoor space so our kids ca ca can, can exercise and get air. And I made this point, but I want to make it again. When I hear people on radio, and I mean, these things go unchallenged. I heard somebody on radio say, why would we need all this outdoor space in the new hospital? Isn't there lots, aren't there lots of parks in Dublin that these kids could go to? I mean, that's sort of ignorant comment. Someone should get in their car and visit Crumlin and Temple Street and look these little kids in their eyes who spend many, most of their lives, in some cases, in these children's hospitals, spend months and months and months on end and can't go to the local park uh, because of the actual illness that they have. So while there's very serious issues that we need to answer in relation to this project and we need to get to the bottom of, um, this also kind of, you know, let's all gather around a, a, tele, a radio studio and kind of wax lyrically about Thornton Hall and open space. It, it's shown, it's shown a, a lack of basic understanding um, in relation to this. I might ask the Secretary General, can he comment on some of the, the figures and comparisons and, um, that, that Senator Burke sought? Just on the question around other hospitals, um, so Deputy, both the Development Board and, and Chil the Children's Hospital Group um, did extensive research in relation to other hospitals, particularly other paediatric hospitals. Um, there's also the membership of the design team that the Development Board has recruited includes international expertise that would have uh, delivered hospital facilities internationally. And they uh, both visited those sites, but also reviewed in detail the design that they adopted, the adjacencies, so which departments fit best together, and the facilities that have been uh, put in. That raises a question about the finite detail. Why was the finite detail yeah, so underestimated? That. So, so that informed that that process of research informed the design brief, um, which is what the hospital will be built against. Um, you asked then about contract signing um, in the. Uh, briefing note given to last week's meeting, the uh, references to the main contract signing dates, so the fact that the uh, contract with the main contractor and the two specialist contractors was signed on the 3rd of August 2017. Um, and as we've uh, uh, said earlier, the instruction of the Phase B works took place on the 8th of January 2019. Um, you asked about the detail. And your question was why it took so long. Um, it, it takes so long because it is a very technical process to get a, to a final design. Um, the option that existed was not to go to the market and, and wait for all of that work to be done, which would have taken perhaps two years. Then you would go to the market, which would then be pricing things at a higher level than when you could have gone with your outline design. So that, that is what that technical exercise of getting down to the very nitty-gritty um, detail of every room and every piece of plant uh, takes. And the choice was to do an outline design, go to the market and get pricing against that and then re-measure it based on the detailed design or hold off for two years and go in one go. Um, 
that will obviously be examined now, but that, that was a strategic choice that was made by the Development Board, that it was better to get into the market and get the prices locked down at 2016 levels. You asked a question on um, the second bidder, and it, it is important to say that if the second bidder for the main contract had been selected, so not the lowest bidder, you would still have had a process for selecting the mechanical and the electrical. So though you would also have had to look at those competitions as well. The lowest bidders were, ex uh, were accepted, I think, in relation to all three. So the main contract was BAM, uh, the Mechanelec was awarded separately, and then they're brought together as part of the whole construction programme. But the figures for the 637 to the 983, the, the additional figures, can we yes. have a break? So, so there was a table shared with the Public Accounts Committee last Thursday. Very happy to share that with you. But the 637 getting to 983, for example, includes the uh, outpatient and urgent care centres. It includes equipping. It includes planning and design team fees. Uh, it includes contingency and it includes elements of VAT. Uh, so we can work that up from the 637 to the 983 for you. And then the final question I had from you was, um, if you awarded it to the second bidder, uh, what would have happened? The second bidder would have gone through the same process of final design and remeasuring of the bill of quantities. They would have been entitled to look for an uplift for the increase in quantities. So it's not that in awarding it to the second bidder, which was about 130 million above the lowest bidder, you, you were likely to get the product for that, because once you started to adjust your final design and add in extra quantities, they would have been entitled to increase the price that they had tendered on a lower level of quantity. Okay. Can I come back on, and following on from what you said, now, thanks very much for the reply on that. The, the, uh, just in relation to the cost overrun in this project, how it's going to affect other projects. For instance, one of the um, Project 2040 sets out about a, an elective hospital for Cork, and the you know the population in Cork City and County has increased by 130,000 over the last 30 years. Uh, there's been no new beds uh, opened in any of the hospitals over that 30 years. My understanding was that there was a committee um, to be established to help identify a site. I'm just wondering, Minister, that committee still has not met, and I'm concerned that this project now is on the back foot. Um, and can I have a, a, a commitment that that committee would be set up within the next four weeks, and that it would meet at an early date? To, because we, we haven't even started identifying where the site should be. Um, and I think it's extremely important. It's an elective-only hospital. The other issue in relation to that is about uh, has there even been any discussions with the two voluntary hospitals who are providing a crucial uh, service to the city and county of Cork and indeed to the wider Mun Munster region as well. So I'm very concerned that while there's a huge focus on the Dublin area now in relation to hospitals, that they focus on the new maternity hospital in Dublin, the children's hospital, um, you have the work going on in Dunleary, um, and, you know, we have not even had a meeting of the committee to help even identify a site, let alone go through the planning process. So I'm just wondering, can we get a commitment on that issue at this stage? Um, thank you very much. So I just, when you talk about the overrun, I do need to refer to it as a projected overrun because we have just asked PwC to come back to how we can rein in the costs. And I, and I do want people at this committee to know, and I most importantly want taxpayers in this country to know, trying to rein in the costs. Um, is now what needs to happen. That's why I've asked Mr Fred Barry to take up a role of the expertise that he has. Uh, it's also why I've asked PwC and amended the terms of reference to look at how we can mitigate costs. It's also why I've said at this committee, I think for the first time publicly, that you know issues like Crumlin Hospital and what future role that can play in terms of resources towards this project um, are issues that really need to be, to be considered and examined. And I suppose the benefit uh, of the GMP process, the two-stage process, is that the overrun becomes apparent before it happens whereas generally in procurement we hear about it after and we all bemoan the fact. We actually know about this now. There is no overrun today. There's a projected overrun. What are we going to do? That's, I, I do think it's an important point uh, that we try to grapple with uh, together. I understand and, and know very well Senator Burke's interest um, well, in health in general, but his interest in particularly in the elective-only hospital <coughs> and the fact that the Cork region 
uh, from a bed point of view and the likes um, hasn't uh, uh, do doesn't have an adequate number of beds per head of population. I would just make the point, and I'm sure he won't mind me making it, that when we talk about the National Children's Hospital, it's not a project for Dublin. It's not a project for Dublin. There would be many, many sick children from Cork today in Crumlin and Temple Street. So it is a project for that country and that has to be located uh, somewhere and happens to be located um, in Dublin. In relation to the elective only hospitals, big body of work being done in my department in relation to deciding what these are going to do. Uh, deciding the policy framework. I visited Scotland not that long ago to look at their elective only hospitals and their model um, and I'm hoping that we'll complete that policy piece of work in 2019. What I will give a commitment to Senator Burke is to meet with you and Cork Rocks as members within four weeks uh, to discuss the next steps in terms of some of the preparatory work uh, that could be taken in Cork and I'm happy to give that commitment through, through, through this committee uh, that I will arrange in the next month uh, for that to happen. On the issue of capital in general and I, I, I dealt with it I think when you were out of the room but I'm happy to say it again um, there does just need to be a context to this. I understand that people, people are worried and want to know what is the impact of this, you know, what, what won't happen as a result of this. So the government's been very clear, everything that we've committed to will happen. That's the first point. Projects will not be cancelled. 80% of the health capital budget is spent on projects that, that are not the National Children's Hospital. So 25% of our population are kids, 20% of our capital budget is being spent on a hospital for kids. 80% is being spent on non uh, projects that have nothing to do with the National Children's Hospital. The budget for the Department of Health from a capital point of view has increased by 165% for the next 10 years. What does that mean in real terms? It means the budget for the next 10 years is almost 11 billion for capital compared to 4 billion for the last 10 years. I'd much rather not be in this situation, so don't get me wrong in that regard, but at least we are trying to deal with this situation in a times of rising capital budgets uh, rather than a time of static uh, or shrinking ones. Minister Donoghue will bring proposals in terms of capital reprofiling for 2019 to Cabinet, as he outlined yesterday, I believe, uh, very shortly, and we'll then make any adjustments we're required to make then. Uh, but I certainly don't see the adjustments in terms of health capital projects in 2019 being in any way significant. Uh, I think it is manageable um, in 2019. But Minister, can we get on with the job we need to do in Cork, and that's even to start off with identifying the site, and therefore about setting up the structure so that everyone is involved in it, from the hospital to the university to the two local authorities, Cork City and Cork County, um, so that we can get on with identifying where this hospital should go and move on from there, rather than the, what happened in Dublin, where it went on for 10, 15 years before the site was identified, then it turned out that Lombard Pnaller uh, held that it was the, 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 the size of the project could not go ahead on the matter site. I mean, I do not want that to happen in Cork, where then there's a further delay of seven years um, from, from what occurred. And that's why I want this committee set up so that it can identify the most appropriate place for this elective hospital and that you know, we can get on with the other work then thereafter. But we don't even have a site identified and we don't even have a committee meeting. I, I hear you and we'll have that engagement within four weeks. Now, we're now going to move on to Deputy Kate O'Connell. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, Minister, just briefly, um, initially I'd just like to speak to you about the operation of termination of pregnancy. Um, we'll take a break from the Children's Hospital um, for the minute. So, um, there's just a few issues I have. Um, we, as you know, recently we had um, breaches of pa patients' privacy, um, knowledge of terminations happening in hospitals. Um, so in terms of um, the alleged breaches of, pa of patient privacy, what action have you taken? And the reason I'm concerned about that, this, um, other than for obvious reasons, is this was flagged during both committees, on the Eighth Amendment Committee and the subsequent committee that we dealt with legislation, that um, I suppose some people see that um, this is a separate issue and therefore confidentiality doesn't seem to apply to it. And this is extremely concerning. And it's extremely concerning because the whole point was that we were able to care for women in a compassionate way in their own country. And if people are concerned when they go for a termination of pregnancy or, or, or look to have one, that their details might be in the public domain, that will 
inevitably lead to backstreet abortions or people still travelling, so it defeats the purpose of what we spent two years doing. So if you could just maybe uh, refer to that. And also, we spent a lot of time last year talking about data protection and systems in place and how even TDs had to sort our houses out in terms of data protection. Here we have, at a very basic level, um, a very serious breach to my mind. Um, in, in terms of actions that be, can be taken against rogue agencies that have contacted this particular lady, um, and there's also, I'm being told, that GPs are being contacted randomly by people purporting to have ultrasound machines that they can um, you know, use their machine to date. So there seems to be a bit of skullduggery going on here in the background, but all of it adding up to um, a, a, a difficult and dangerous situation for women. So if you just wouldn't mind con or, uh, commenting on that. Also briefly, um, Rotunda has pulled back from, as far as I know, 12 to 11 weeks. Um, in terms of providing the parameters. And like that, we did speak to this during committee about somebody being on the cusp of the 12 weeks and how we'd manage that. So here we are with, with a self-imposed 11-week um, end period by the Rotunda. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the legislation which we, which we brought forth, are they in breach of it or is it just is it acceptable? Thank you. Okay. Thank Deputy O'Connell for raising these important matters, and I'll take them sequentially. Um, I'm, I, like you, am extremely disturbed that there is an attempt by some uh, still, despite a referendum, despite the legislative pass, to try to think that it's in some way acceptable to treat termination of pregnancy services different to other legally authorised services within our Irish health service, and we're not going to stand for it. I really want to thank the Director General of the HSE for the swift action that she's taken um, after I engaged with the HSE, and I suppose there are two, two, two separate but, but, but interlinked matters that at the, at the same fundamental level have that disgusting attitude to women's health care. Uh, the first is the idea that there would be um, fake My Options websites. We set up, we set up a 24-7 helpline and a really informative website that gives a woman in a non-directional way information on all of her options, including abortion. The Director General outlined in her opening statement the, the success of that website and telephone line in terms of women now being able to have a conversation with a qu medically qualified uh, or a health qualified professional rather than having a conversation with Google uh, or an airline. So that, that's worked pretty well. Um, the idea that people would endeavour to fake being that website um, is pretty despicable. So firstly, I'd echo the advice of the HSE in terms of any information from the HSE displays uh, their logo. Um, and myoptions.ie is the best way to access the site rather than Google searches and hoping to come across it. So myoptions.ie, and we can't uh, promote that web address enough in terms of women knowing that is where you go for reputable and access, uh, uh, information. Uh, the HSE, at my request, though, uh, has now looked into that matter and has initiated legal proceedings uh, in the form of cease and desist um, and those legal proceedings uh, relating to uh, the owner of the, the fake website, if we may call it that, uh, were initiated on Saturday the 2nd of February, and the Director General may wish to add something to that, but I thank her and the HSE for showing leadership and swift action in relation to this. The second issue um, is the issue of potential data breaches, and we've seen, uh, we've seen two examples. We saw one uh, where it emerged on social media, an allegation that at a certain time a termination was taking place in a certain hospital. And we saw another, um, and we can talk about it because it's, it's in the public domain in relation to a, a woman who accessed termination through the National Maternity Hospital um, and, then and then found herself being contacted by, um, in the most despicable way, uh, by people opposed to the provision of this service pretending uh, to be others. Hospital group CEOs are currently investigating that to establish in the first instance that the data breach happened. Um, but I want to assure you, as I know the HSE will, um, that we won't tolerate such data breaches. Whether you're going in to get your hip replaced, uh, to access termination, to have a cataract, to talk to your doctor, you're entitled to your privacy in relation to your medical information. Um, and that's not a privacy that you know, is partial or complete, uh, dependent on, on, on a person's view as to, as to that service. In relation to the issue regarding um, the rotunda, so the law is the law, um, and the law is clear. Um, 12 weeks is the 
is the outer limit, the cut-off point legally, for accessing termination without specific indication in our country. And beyond that, as you know better than most, W. Connolly grounds um, obviously in relation to, 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 to your health, uh, your life and fatal fetal abnormalities. But 12 weeks is the cut-off, not 11 weeks. So the Chief Medical Officer has helpfully written uh, to the Rotunda Hospital clarifying that. So the law is the law. The operation of the law is a matter for clinicians and not for me, and that's right. But we have, uh, through the Chief Medical Officer, written uh, to the Rotunda um, to provide uh, just with clarity in relation in relation to that as well. And the final issue just I'd like to mention, because you mention it regularly at this committee, and it is about making sure that we don't just address the parts of the all-party committee report that relate to abortion, but that we also address the ancillary recommendations. And you've been You've been really uh, pushing for the whole issue of uh, access to free contraception for women, um, which is a recommendation uh, of the All Party Committee. And I just want to let you know I will be setting up a working group in my department, uh, including all the various divisions of my department, the Chief Medical Officer, Primary Care and Eligibility, and also some external experts on women's health. We'll have that set up in the next few weeks uh, to look at how do we move towards expanding eligibility to free contraception for women. It's easily enough to do, do for men. We just increased the number of, of condoms, and we're doing that already this year. To increase eligibility to free access for women, it's likely to require legislative change and obviously different types of contraception. So we'll have that working group chair established with external expertise in women's health in the next few weeks. In terms of the data breach, um, I'm just aware as, as um, I'm a medical professional that it's always way easier um, to deal with somebody who is regulated, such as a doctor or a pharmacist or a nurse. Whereas if it's the... The, the man who does the bins, who, who logged into the computer, that is a far more difficult thing to deal with. So um, I'd just like to point that out. In terms of the ancillary recommendations, just to correct you, it was free contraception for everyone, not just the women. And um, I would be very much pro um, um, vasectomies being um, provided for to the future, um, if men want them, obviously not mandatory. Um, but um, um, just, okay. just, <laughs> just to, just to. Anyone have to disagree with you? <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, no, it's just something that I just want to make sure that we're, we're considering men here. This is not about barrier contraception; it's about contraception in, 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 um, in general. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, can I have I a bit more time? You have two minutes. Oh, thank you. Very generous. Um, so, um, in terms of, we'll be here for the day probably. But it was just something following on, as you know, uh, Mr. President and Minister. I sit on both um, the Health and the Public Accounts Committee. And there's just a few things, and we'll get through them today, but there was something that came up on Thursday, um, and um, it's about the... I, I want this hospital. I want it to continue. I don't want it to be paused, stopped or anything. I am fully aware of the political pressures and medical politics that has um, led to the delay of this first moot in 1962 that we'd have this hospital. And um, I feel sometimes I, I, I'm banging my head off a wall in here, but I'm very concerned now to the future with this project. And I spoke late last Thursday evening here on PAC, same room on PAC, about the liquidity of BAM. And what I'm concerned about is that if there are subcontractors that are um, being given jobs by BAM, such as M&E keeps being mentioned as one subcontractor, what happens, have BAM enough headroom if one of the subcontractors goes bust? So if the M&E guy goes bust, he's not liquid, he, and, and the, the job has been given at whatever price, what happens then? I wasn't happy with the answer I got last Thursday evening here, in that for me this is about not having a hospital halfway out of the ground. So and another thing is... Um, we spoke about spec, I think, on the 16th of January here is when we started speaking about spec with regard to this hospital. And we heard about the famous five kilometres of cables and we didn't know how many lengths of five kilometres. So I sat down last night and I thought, what would not have changed from point A to B? The windows wouldn't have changed. We saw a model of the hospital with the glass on the outside. Can anybody get me the, the, the price that was quoted on the spec for the hospital for the glass the first day and the last the second day. Because we saw a model, I questioned Professor Hardiman as to was it full of cotton wool inside the model we saw, because clearly nobody worked out with their 6,000 rooms. But we do know the size of the building and the amount of glazing on the outside. And I would like to compare that figure um, just to see who's making the money here. There's also a figure, Mr. President, and you might come back to me after lunch, on the sheet you referred to there, the pack was given last week. If I remember correctly, there was a 66 million saving 
um, in the 2017 costs. And I'm sorry, people from this committee may not have this document in front of them. And I was looking through this, but this 66 million saving, did, unless I'm reading it wrong, was not transferred to the 2018 costs. I'm missing 66 million on that balance sheet. And if somebody perhaps um, could could look at that over the next break and just get back to me on it, because I'm not I, I'm not happy that there's minus 66 on one side and it doesn't reflect on the other side. Um, and then I, I've asked for it already. I'd like to know in Come terms on. of um, people involved in this project, who was working on a fixed contract and who was working on a percentage. So who, really my point is, who's, who, who was going to financially gain in terms of more money to be spent. So was there an architect working off a 1%? Was quantity surveyors working off 3%? Who's, obviously, if there was more work to be done, they deserve more money. But I want to know who, um, who, who, that, are get, who that are getting taxpayers' money um, have an elastic fee system. And finally, perhaps Mr Woods would like to um, speak at some point to his position, unless I have the wrong Mr Woods, um, on the Mr. Woods, you're, you're um, on the HSE. You, you're, um, what's your job again? I have it down here somewhere. <clears throat> National Director of Acute Operations. You were on that 12-person board beside Mr. Quinn from Deeper. I'm wondering at any point, did you consider that if you were spending all your money on a children's hospital, that you in your role as National Director of Acute Operations wouldn't be able to do your job. And referring to Alan Kelly's, or Deputy Kelly's, circular 10, 12, or 12, 10, 12, 10, it's, um, it's fairly clear to me from that circular what your role was. Thank you. So can we have some brief answers to those questions? Thank, Thank you. So on the 66 million, and I think it's on the record, the full 66 million in value engineering wasn't achieved. 20 million was achieved. Just the way the figures were presented on Thursday, that was included in the total figure for 2018 costs. But there was 20 million of the 66, a shortfall of 46 million in value engineering was, was what occurred uh, in the finalization of the value engineering. You said you were going to save 66, but you actually only saved 20. The Development Board identified 66 million of value engineering savings to be achieved, and they saved 20 million. So the potential. And this was on, but this was on the, the first design, the preliminary design, rather than the second design. No, this, this was, this was the in, the, in moving to instruct phase B, there was a process of engagement with the contractors to say, You've specified this, but actually if we use this, it'll save money for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. Can't we use this? So by rejigging, um, the, the value engineering was targeted to save 66 million. In fact, it only saved 20 million. Thank you. Um, sorry, your other questions. Uh, I, on Windows, I think uh, we will need to come back to you. And actually, mm -hmm. this is where PwC will earn their money. Um, it might seem simple. I'm, I'm actually no, no, no disrespect. I'm here to earn my money this morning as well. And I'm getting paid well to be and here. You are, but, and I'm entitled to ask it, questions. And you are, absolutely. And I'd like to see those two figures. And you're entitled to It took to me a long time to find the one thing that wouldn't change. So. Well, it, so it's I'm entitled to that figure. Deputy, it's not now, as simple. Not March. The number of windows mightn't change. But the actual fitting of the windows, that might change. Oh, I so understand. we I'm will well, have to establish I'm, I'm that. I'm well used to QS balance sheets and figures. I don't need it explained. But I do know that the hospital is the same size as it was and the same so amount of windows in it today I'm not as there was back your, in the day. I'm not agreeing with your assumption that the windows is the one thing that didn't change in the process because I'd have to validate that. Well, it's the one thing that would have a static component, as in the number or the, the surface area would be the same. Otherwise. Yeah, as a yeah. quantifiable. But and I'd like to see that this afternoon. I won't be able to give it to you this afternoon, Deputy. I, I would have to have the detailed costing of the elemental design of the windows and the finishes of the windows and so on. I am not... All I, need is the, 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 all I need is the tender for the windows day one and the tender now. I need the letter from the company who's doing the windows. It's as simple as that. It, it appears simple, Deputy. It appears simple. But I don't want to promise you something this morning that actually turns out to be more complicated. And my, my guess is it is a more complicated question than you're asking. 
My guess Thank is you, that you're hoping it is, but anyway. No, if it, was, if it is simple, I will give, get back to you with the very simple answer. Why don't you give me the complex one and I'll work it out myself. Thank you, Deputy O'Connell. Um, there was a question to you, Mr Woods. Uh, Deputy, you asked me a question, I think, about Circular 1210. Well, I was actually referring yeah. to your position on the board, the famous 12-persons mm. board that mm. you and Mr <coughs> Quinn from Deeper have sat on mm. and for some reason didn't seem to mention that the, the costs were going sky high. Yeah, so uh, in terms of my own um, position there, Chair, or, um, Deputy, the uh, information relating to trends in potential cost projection and really any other matters relating to the project were already, uh, were incrementally known with the H within the HSE as I was aware of them. So there isn't, there isn't any contention other than that. So, so, so you're the, saying that the cost overruns were incrementally known in the HSC, so you'd nothing to report it, you'd no more news to deliver, is that what you're saying? No, no, the, there were, and uh, there's already been reference to some documentation that uh, is reporting on concern relating to cost escalation for the proposed price of the project, mm -hmm. and that information was known to me as a board member, clearly, of the building board. Uh, but also was known within the HSE. So, so when, as, and when you were on the board, forget your job in the HSE, mm. when did you first know that the costs, in your, in your capacity as a board member? I think the, uh, the board, I think I joined the board at a stage in 2015, uh, Deputy, so I think in terms of the discussion we've been having here, the reference to the figure of 61 million would have been known, which was back in 2017, and that's been dialogued um, about here and previously, and then the subsequent cost uh, escalation in terms of projected cost of the project. The, the board, I'm just thinking from a board perspective, I think the meeting in September had a report to it on that matter. What's it, which September? September 18. Thank you very much, Mr Woods. I could just finally, sorry Chair, I just, no. uh, Mr President, on the 16th, as far as I know, January here, this committee asked about this new governance structure that emerged in May 17. And the gist of what I said to you was, you never put in a new governance structure unless something's going wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm still worried about that May 17 date as to why that new go what, and I think I used the word from memory, what sparked the creation of that board? I think that's where we'll find our answers to this. So, so the reason for it at the time was the movement of the project forward into delivery stage and the various strands that were going to have to be successfully managed in arriving at a point where staff, patients, technology and building were all aligned and operational and the project was complete. So to give you an example, during the course of 2017, the department brought the, and the minister brought the Children's Health Ireland legislation through this committee and that was implemented, I think it was passed in November. By the 1st of January, we had to have Children's Health Ireland established with a bank account and with the staff transferring from the three constituent hospitals onto the payroll of Children's Health Ireland. That's just one example of how various strands, tasks being executed by one element within the overall programme have to get coordinated. And we were, we're going to have to do that all of the way to go live. And that was the issue that we didn't want to find ourselves in 2013 with a building complete but with the technology, the electronic health record not complete or with the staff not having transferred. So there was a coordination mechanism to put in place to make sure all of the milestones by each of the entities involved was to be executed. That doesn't take from the responsibility of the individual entities for the execution of the responsibilities they have statutorily been given but it is a coordination task that needs to sit above that. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm now going to move on to our, our non-members. We have four non-members who are here, so I'm going to ask you to be disciplined and limit yourself to five minutes, so if you can concentrate on your questions so that the Minister or the Secretary-General can give their answers. So the first non-member is Deputy Boyd Barrett. Okay, first of all, Minister, the sort of comforting narrative that you put out at the outset about the, the general situation in the health service, uh, to my mind, just... <laughs> Uh, would clash fairly strongly with the perceptions that people have about what's happening in the health service in general at the moment. Uh, and wouldn't people be right to be pretty sceptical? Uh, 
we have the GPs protesting outside because of a crisis in uh, general practice. We have a national nurses' strike uh, over pay and recruitment and retention. We have a national ambulance strike, uh, which you don't seem interested in resolving. Uh, we have uh, a desperate uh, trolley crisis. We have hundreds of thousands of people on hospital waiting lists. We have uh, CAMs, 50% uh, understaffed, a major crisis in uh, community mental health. We have the cervical check scandal. We have a 600 million overrun in the uh, health budget. And then the cherry on top uh, from a Fine Gael government that prides itself on prudence and uh, fiscal rectitude, uh, we have a cost escalation for this project going from about 400 million uh, when uh, Fine Gael come into power to 1.4 billion. 1.7 billion in total, but 1.4 billion for the hospital itself. Now, just at that sort of elementary level, I'll get to some of the detailed questions in a second. That's a shambles. That collectively, for the years of Fine Gael government, from James Riley through Leo Varadkirk to yourself, that is a shambles. That's not improvement. We, we're actually reaching uh, probably the worst point of a crisis in the health service at just about every level. Isn't that really reasonable comment given what's going on? And isn't that a reasonable perception that a lot of the public would have at the moment? No, and they actually, the public don't agree with you actually because if you actually ask people who use the health service, so rather than you, Deputy Boyd Barrett, who think that, you know, everything my party touches is a crisis because you have a very funny political ideology that I don't agree with that you're entitled to. Um, if you actually ask patients who spent a night in a hospital uh, last year or the year before, how they found their treatment by the health service, how they found from the moment they went into the ED, how they went to the ward, how they were discharged back home, how they got in the community, did they have a good or very good experience? 84% of people said good or very good. Their people actually use the health service. So people are not as negative uh, as when as they get you in, we all are about the health service, right? So that's, that's the first point to make. Second point, which never really gets discussed here, bizarrely, but um, you know, you, you people measure the health service through a very limited prism, and I do accept there's access challenges in relation to getting into the health service. I think that's valid and fair criticism. But if you look at our survival rates for cancer, uh, if you look at our survival rates for stroke, uh, for heart attacks, if you look at our life expectancy being above the EU average, if you look at the fact that a baby girl born in a hospital across the road today has a very good chance of living to be 100, um, how is it that anything my department or the government funds that goes well in the health service has nothing to do with government or the department, and anything that goes bad has everything to do with it. You know, these are conscious decisions that we as a government, and indeed previous governments, um, leader of Fianna Fáil, smoking ban, like there's things that have been done in our health service that have significantly improved the outcomes uh, of our people. I, 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 I found it somewhat um, hard to square the circle where one of the things you criticised me for was the overrun of the health service last year, an overrun that's happened nearly every year, and then listed out a number of other things that had I done would have actually tripled the overrun. So you want me to sort the nurses strike 300 million euro a year, you want me to rectify the GP no. budget, and then you know, hang on, and then you're being critical of the fact that we can't live within budget, so square that one. I will um, now in a sec. Square that, square that yeah. one. In relation to some of the industrial relations issues, which we haven't, I mean, we haven't had a chance to discuss today, and perhaps we will at some point, because there, are, there is still an industrial relations dispute with 40,000 nurses and midwives that is very serious and having a serious impact on patient safety that we do need to resolve. There are ways of resolving these things, but they have to be resolved within the confines of the Public Service Stability Agreement, because that's the agreement we have with all unions, through ICTI. And if people want to try and resolve their disputes through the parameters uh, of the Congress of Trade Unions and the Public Service Stability Agreement, we are ready and wanting to engage intensively. Okay, well, uh, look... Uh, yeah, I mean, having waited here two and a half hours, I'm only getting five minutes, but uh, so I'll ask a couple of direct... Uh, questions, right? Do, it, do you think it is appropriate that PwC, who you have essentially battled off this incredible escalation under Fine Gael's uh, management uh, on the National Hospital uh, Project, the Pediatric Hospital Project, from 400 million to 1.4 billion, that you are now batting off the answer to all of these questions and essentially responsibility for it to PwC when PwC have been the auditors of BAM, the contractor at the centre of this, for nine years, have received uh, 30 million uh, in fees from BAM, the contractor, 
uh, are also uh, work for the HSE. Uh, can we honestly uh, put faith in PwC uh, to do this and not fear a very serious conflict uh, of interest? Uh, I mean, particularly given, you know, because for ordinary people out there, what they will feel is, we've been had, okay? We've been had. Uh, a, a, a company comes in uh, with a bid, which now turns out to be a gross underestimation of the actual cost uh, of the hospital. Um, and the people who are going to look into how that happened are the people who, who audited that company, BAM, uh, Dutch International, or whatever they're called, uh, for nine years. Uh, and that also that nobody, and that ministers, weren't made aware, or were they made aware at the time, that there was a gap of 130 million between the BAM bid and the next bid up, uh, and somebody didn't say, that's a bit odd. I mean, if it was 10 million, if it was 15 million gap, you'd say, okay, maybe uh, I could see that. But 130 million gap between the lowest bidder uh, and the next bidder, and nobody thought, that is a bit odd. Particularly when BAM had a record, a previous record, and it's been well flagged in the press, I've got time to go into it, of a number of cases where they had significantly overrun, both in this country and internationally, and nobody said, we should look into this. And did anybody just do the basic thing and talking about windows, right? What, how, what, what cost had they in for windows? What cost had they in for wires? What cost had they in for bricks? What cost had they in for the, you know, all the different components of it? And how did they compare to the costs of the next bid and the next bid above that? And it, was there a significant gap between the two? And isn't that a bit odd? Thank you, Deputy Boyd. Right, I mean, and... and are, are you, I know you're not supposed to be over every single detail, but it's not the ministers responsible, uh, Minister Radker probably at the time, to be aware at least of, of that level of uh, difference and dichotomy between the things and say, we need to check that, Minister. we need to check that, we Minister. want forensic uh, analysis of that. Well, thanks very much, Deputy Boyd Barrett. So firstly, no one's batting anything away. I think by my estimation, I'm into about six and a half hours uh, of questioning in relation to the National Children's Hospital. Like three and a half hours last week, we're into about three hours this week. We're, we're here as long as you want, so there's no one batting anything away. I have to go to leaders' it. questions now, poor, oh, unfortunately. Sorry, but. sorry to keep you, but uh, you've just asked me a series of questions, made a series of assertions. Yeah, yeah. yeah you might read back the answer. And I'll stay for the answer. No, I'll stay for the answer. Read back the answers on the oh, I'll stay for the answer. Well, thank you very much. So six and a half hours in, no one's batting anything away. We're here all day and we'll answer every question as long as people want in relation to this thing. But there is a view, a view that was not confined to my party or the government of which I'm a member, that it was a view shared across the Oireachtas, that actually getting some external expertise in, such as the scale of the overall, would make sense. So that was a view. And members of this committee and other committees suggested that they'd actually like to input into the terms of reference. They had a few suggestions to make. And we acted upon them as well. Um, I, I have no doubt about the competency, the ability, or the impartiality of PwC to do a professional job. I have no doubt about that. We'll publish the report. Even though they worked for BAM for nine years. We'll publish the report. They, and just for the record, because records are important, the HSE obviously um, decided to appoint, the HSE appointed the company and commissioned the report. They would have followed their due processes in terms of conflicts of interest and procurement and the likes in relation to that. On the issue of procurement, you're asking a series of questions, and I'm not suggesting they're not valid questions. But they'd be very serious questions if they were questions that I knew the answers to in relation to procurement. Because of course that process was gone through in relation to the awarding of a contract and the tender. But if these were being gone through by me or indeed any other politician or any other minister, we'd be back to the very dark old days of ministers awarding uh, contracts or indeed endeavouring to award contracts. So we have a review in place that will look at all of those issues and will report. And we're not asking people to wait forever and a day to report next month. And we'll act on them. And that's when the accountability and responsibility comes back to me to make the decisions in relation to their recommendations and what needs to be done next. Can I, Chair, Chair, could I just add one line question to Mr Woods on something he said? This one is minute. literally a one line. You, you said that the board knew about the escalation up from the 61 million and got a figure, if I hear, heard you correctly, got a figure at a meeting in September. So are you saying that the figure... The 450 million escalation was known in September at a meeting, but it doesn't get to the minister until November. That's shocking if that's true, because that's what I heard, thought pretty no, sure no, I heard it, you say. Uh, I didn't say that. Uh, the, the board was being briefed at, a, at its ongoing meetings relating to the issue of pricing and GMP, and that was part of the normal board process. The information that um, 
became available. I think the question I was asked was when was there a report available to the board. My recollection, and I'd have to go back and look to be honest, but my recollection is there was a report around concern in September. Clearly that developed and as prior discussion here has indicated up to the uh, 9th of November date. So we but should see that report, Chair. We should see that report. Thank you, Deputy Boyd Barrett. Now uh, we're going to move to Deputy David Cullinan. Thanks for and again, uh, five, five minutes ask a question. Concise, if you, can. you might give me uh, a nod when I have ten minutes left. Okay, hold on. <laughs> um, Welcome, Minister and Mr. President. So I've, I've, I'll be very sharp in the questions I put because we have we're confined to five minutes. So just very quickly, first, uh, uh, Minister, you will know that at the PEC last week there was some discussion about uh, capital projects that may or may not be under consideration. Uh, there was some confusion, it has to be said, in relation to the second CAD lab for Waterford. I know you did uh, communicate through email to Oroctus members and gave clarification, but given this, this is your first chance to publicly clarify that, my question is that there won't be any delay of any description in relation to the approval for this project. Uh, first of all, is that the case? And second of all, has any design team been appointed yet? to uh, commence the work because my understanding is it will take up to 15 months and the clock only starts ticking when the design team is appointed. So has that been done and is the project absolutely guaranteed and, and a commitment from you it won't be affected by the overspends in terms of the children's hospital? That's just very quickly on that. One. Very, very happy to give that commitment as I gave to you in writing, but very happy to give it here on the record um, of this committee. I've been dealing in a bipartisan manner with all our office members, as you know, from Waterford, as you've been operating in that way as well. Um, this project will proceed. It's very important. Um, we've had a lot of discussions. It doesn't just affect Waterford. Obviously, it affects the southeast. Uh, it will proceed, and it won't be delayed uh, as a result in relation to that. So I can't be clearer than that. I don't know the answer to the design team question. Perhaps Mr Woods would. But if not, we can revert to you on it. Well, if Mr Woods can answer it now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we're talking about the Cath Lab in Waterford. Sorry, I was distracted there for a second. Yeah, the, um, the planning process is underway, as you're aware. I think there's a briefing to TDs actually on Monday, if I'm not mistaken, yes. in the locality. And we are proceeding to uh, appoint a design team. That's in the process of Proceeding happening. to, but it hasn't yeah. happened yet. I understand we're, we're in the point of doing it. It hasn't you're, happened you're yet. At, we're almost at a point of appointing yeah. one. Okay, yeah. nearly. So, we're getting there. We okay. Um, if I can uh, move then to the overspend and just a number of uh, questions just for clarification because uh, Mr Breslin you did say that there was figures presented to the Public Accounts Committee last week which were somewhat helpful but there's still some confusion around it so maybe either the Minister or you can help me. The original uh, quote or tender from BAM we were told was for 637 million. That was the original tender. Was that was that, plus the other two. That's my point. So it's the £637 million original tender. Was that for BAM plus the other two contractors, which was a mechanical contractor and electrical contractor? Yes. Is that the case? Yes, and in the briefing notes applied to this committee and to the PAC um, in advance of the appearances last week, it's broken down as between um, BAM, £432 million, uh, Mechanical, which is Jones Group, 107 million, and electrical, which is Mercury I have that. Engineering. And what I asked then at the PAC was that of that 637 million for BAM, 400, sorry, for the overall uh, tender, which is for the three contractors, BAM was for 432 million, but the estimated cost to BAM now is 556. Correct. So it's an overspend of 120 million. Yeah, 20, 29%. Okay. And that means then that there was haggling, it seems then, for some time, it would seem for minutes of the uh, steering group meeting of the bo paediatric board and the department, there was haggling over the guaranteed maximum price, which took an awful long time because the minutes of the April meeting suggest that there are difficulties here, there are issues with the guaranteed maximum price, and yet it took up to November before that to be signed off on, which in my view suited the developer, suited BAM. The longer it went on, the more it was going to cost, and it went from eventually 432 million to 556. So why did it take from April up to November for that issue to be resolved? Because all of the detailed work was being going through and priced, and what was required, the development board originally had a, in the contract the 2nd of September as the closeout date for the uh, guaranteed maximum price process, and they agreed with the three 
contractors, Bam, Mercury and Jones, that that would be extended by three months to December in order to get the process complete. Okay, but you see, the, the I minister... I was just saying that, that there's also a role there for an independent adjudicator to rule on yeah. disputes between the parties. Okay. And we'll have a report from PwC, which I'm assuming we'll look into this in more detail. But the minutes of that steering group in, on the 23rd of April 2018 say a number of things. And bear in mind, Mr. Breslin, when I asked you at the PAC when you first became aware of any serious overrun, it was in November, um, you said, and then the minister was informed at the same time. No, no. Um, I definitely didn't say November. Uh, I, in relation to the 61 million, I'm on the record as to when I became aware of that, yeah. which was in the autumn of 2017. Yeah. In relation to the uh, subsequent GMP uh, process and the uh, additional costs coming out of that, I'm on the record as saying when I came back off my leave in the first week of September, I read the briefings on that. Was that the guaranteed maximum price only? Because from what I can read from the minutes, going back for the steering group, going back to November of 2017, right up to April, there was issues in relation to the accommodation unit, the philanthropic funding, there was concerns around that, car parking. So you had these issues on the one hand, and you had the guaranteed maximum price. And just, just, bear, just for one second, so in, I can in, clarify in the, what if I can just finish, sure. Mr. President, yeah. in the April minutes of that board meeting, or sorry, of that steering group meeting, it says, and I quote, that the GMP approval by the end of June is significantly at risk. And then it goes on to say that uh, uh, the Exchequer capital budget is already significantly under pressure. This was in relation to, I think it was Ronald MacDonald, uh, with, with the, the expectation is they would pay for the accommodation unit. So why wasn't any of that at that point reported up to the department? Because this was in April. So I think, and this is a request, I'll make it through the PEC, but might be helpful for the uh, Health Committee as well. We have all these minutes of the steering group. And they seemed to paint a picture that there was uh, some discussion uh, on the overspend on a whole range of issues as far back as November, but certainly crystallised in April. Um, so how was that information from that steering, steering group communicated to the actual board? So I think it would be helpful if we got the board meet minutes. And that maybe will give us a clearer picture. That, that, that's no problem. We've supplied them to Deputy Kelly already. Well, can you supply them to the rest of us? We can, we can. absolutely. Okay. Can and, you and can them to the committee and yes. then we can circulate them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I just demark, because I do want to demark, the, uh, there's a risk here that it all bundles into one thing. Uh, yeah. There's a clear demarcation, and it's set out in the briefing notes supplied to the committee around the fire certification, the programme alignment, the design team and the urgent care centre costs adding up to £61 million. And then the reference that uh, the deputy has made to the GMP process mm -hmm. and the, the fact that that wasn't completing as quickly as, as uh, originally scheduled. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank President. You. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Colnan. You were almost within your time limit. As always. Thank you. We are now going to move uh, to um, <coughs> Deputy Jonathan O'Brien. And again, five minutes if you can. Thank you, Chairman. I have two points I want to uh, touch on. Can I, can, I, can I just go back to the timing of this, right? Because we're getting so many dates now, and it's so many different issues, and I think people are getting confused. I know I certainly am anyway. So I want to go back to making sure that we are all on the same page in relation to this. Mr Woods, you said that you first became aware of the overrun in September 2018. Is that correct? I think the, the point I was making was that the paper came to the, a paper came to the board at that time, which is a matter of public record okay. and can be so, provided. So I'm not the, interested in when a paper came to the board. I'm interested in when you first became aware of the overruns. So as a board member, I was aware at the meeting in September that there was an issue relating to the conclusion of the GMP. It was at that stage that a, a request was, uh, as I recall it, made of the companies engaged to seek an extended period of time to resolve that or to consider it further. Okay, because that totally contradicts what we were told at the Public Accounts Committee last, th last Thursday. We were told that the board first became aware of the overrun in June 2018. Are you saying that's not correct? No, I'm not. No, uh, that's why I was saying earlier there was an ongoing discussion about the GMP and issues relating to cost. That's an inherent part because of the role of the building the board. Because at the Public Accounts Committee meeting, mm. The answers were very specific. We were told that in June the overrun was 40 million. Hmm. In August the overrun was 200 million. And in November the overrun had reached 450 million. Yeah. So, like, 
let's cut the confusion around when reports came or when hmm. all of this. When, as a board member, did you first become aware that there was an overrun in relation to the project? So, in, in, in answering that, Deputy, I initially went back to the 61 million because they were earlier, and the Secretary General has just referred to those, and they, the would have been, so. they would have been part okay. of the board papers that would have come yes. to us as board members. And that, and, and, the, that, and, that, and that was resolved in terms of, well, we got some savings in relation to it. I'm counting that particular overrun of the 60 million as a separate yeah. issue. So I just stay with the 2018, yeah, if I yeah. stay with the 2018 yeah. issues, which is, I think, where you are, um, I can clearly recall a report in September, and clearly that's in the records of the board and can be made available. There would have been earlier discussion and advices, maybe even a report. I can't, I'd have to look back at the records myself on that to be sure. I'm not saying there was not that. Okay. Um, and, but I think substantively the concerns you're referring to relating to uh, the 450 million piece that you've just yeah. um, concluded on, uh, September was a time certainly as a board member that that would have been known and the extended period of time then was to do further work on that. That was the... I mean, Mr. Breslin, you were at the Public Accounts Committee meeting. I mean, is it your recollection of that meeting that uh, the board became aware of it in June 2018? It's certainly June, July, and, and committees, there was committees and board, and when did they become aware? Um, that, that's my recollection. Just to say on this, Deputy, this is at the core. We have put it into the terms of reference of, of PwC, who knew what, when. Um, I mean, like we don't need to spend 450000 no, to find no, out when people became aware of something, surely. I mean, we have the people in the room here. We right? do. We do. I'm just yes. making the point that, given all of the time that's been put in at committees, what we need to do is to have a very serious schedule of questions, which is, forms part of what PwC are doing, where they can go off and verify it against <coughs> records in real time and report accurately on it. Of course you're entitled to ask the questions you're asking and getting the answers, and I can but, ask, I but can, there are other questions that are also and that's worth But I can ask the Chair of the Development Board because he's now resigned, and he was the person who said at the Public Accounts Committee meet, and I, I think it was that, that individual I think the project it. director too would have agreed and with And the project that. director, and we'll get him back before the Public Accounts Committee as well. It was June 2018, we first became, the actual wording was that we were on budget up to that point. Now, leaving aside the 2017 figure, right? We were on budget up to then. There was no indication that there was an issue. We're now hearing, well, April, we knew that there was potentially issues arising, totally contradicting what we were told at the Public Accounts Committee. We were on budget to June 2018. Now we're being told it's September the board became aware through a report. There may or may not have been a report before then, Mr Woods can't recall. I mean, lads, you need to get real hair like. This is absolutely ridiculous. And we're paying somebody 450000 to find out this information, and you can't remember what happened six months ago. Thank you, Deputy O'Brien. Can I, can I... One last question. One last question. Even just note that I didn't get any answers to those questions, but anyway. In, re, in relation to the tenders, the original tenders, are you aware of the EU procurement guidelines around abnormally low tenders? It forms part of the overall procurement law. Okay. So you had said earlier um, at this meeting, I was watching around the monitor, that if you had not gone with the lowest bidder, you could potentially end it up in the forecourt. Potentially. Okay. So under EU procurement law, abnormally low tenders, there's actually guidelines on how they are dealt with by the contracting authority. Mm -hmm. And the guidelines state that you can actually question an abnormally low tender. Was there any questioning of the tender price when it came in? Given the fact that, and I have the figures here somewhere, given the fact that it was 131 million below the next nearest, it was actually 14% below the adjusted average procurement price of the bids that had came in. Was there any questioning of so, Sam, in relation to the... So the just to confirm people. again, neither the Minister nor I nor any Department official were part of the procurement process, but my expectation would be that that would form part of the uh, process of uh, examining the tender 
to see where the differences in costs were and, and where they achievable those differences in so costs. So it was and, the and development board that were in charge of the, the development board. Okay, and Mr Woods, was there any questioning of the bid that came in? Given how low it was, given the EU procurement guidelines which are in place, did anyone say, in particular Mr Quinn, who is the uh, government head of procurement, did he not say, hang on, there's EU guidelines here which state, you know, we can actually question this? Mm -hmm. well, um, so from my point of view as a board member and not to um, uh, frustrate, I wasn't involved in a detailed procurement process. Uh, there would be a process within any tender where the that's right. There was a subcommittee that dealt with procurement, wasn't there? Which Mr there Quinn was actually chairing. There was, but I think as previously referred to, there would also have been a group of relevant and competent people within the management process. I would say he's pretty that. relevant and pretty competent. It's a pity we can't get him before any of the committees. Yeah, so the, but, but just to your point, uh, Deputy, the point around uh, the consideration of the tenders, one of the bases of selection of a tenderer, as you rightly identify, is that there are reasonable standing and have capacity. What, what was the weighting given to the lowest price in terms of it? I think the Secretary General has already stated there was a 25%, 75% weighting. So it was 75% in terms of lowest price? For quality and price. And it was 25% for quality. You know what the average is normally? It's 40%. Anything above 40% you, you question. And we're talking about a weighting of 75%. Hmm. I mean, in terms I mean, of my, serious questions here. In terms of my own experience, Deputy, that varies, that ratio does vary, but the answer factually is 25-75. Would it be normal, Mr Breslin, as the accounting officer in the Department of Health, in relation to uh, tendering for any health projects, where the weighting would be 75% based on just the cost that's coming in? Yeah, I, th I think that's not abnormal, and I think it also there are distinct projects where it's not measurable what you're getting, mm -hmm. where it mightn't be as the weighting mightn't be as high. But in a situation where somebody is saying we will supply this number to you at this price, then then that is something that it's more you can more accurately price and put a weighting uh, well, on. I, I would argue, and I finish on this, John. I thank you for the leniency. It's usually around 40 percent, and if anything is above that, then you start to question it. But I mean. EU procurement guidelines are very clear. You have the ability to question law tenders. And if you had questioned the law tenders, you may not have ended up in the four courts because you would have had actually the power to actually question. I mean, I'll give you the guidelines, and I know you're not an expert in relation to this, but we had individuals appointed yes. by the Minister of Health who were experts in this area to sit on the development board for this very reason, and in my opinion, they didn't do their job. They completely washed their hands of it. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy, I wasn't a decision maker on that. There is an element of expertise needed to form a judgment in relation to that. The judgment is whether, in seeking to define somebody as abnormally low, you have a, a, a substantive basis on which to do that, and are you open to challenge in doing that? I think, I and think PWC, 14 per cent a blow, and the PW, average no, tenders coming no, in. In many occasions, projects are awarded to people who are 14 per cent Given the below, record of the company we're dealing with now for coming in with low tenders I and think, ending up costing this state tens of millions. Look at the projects. Look at the history. I'm not going to put it on the record here, but look at the history. Cork Event Centre, Tralee Bypass, various road projects. Thank you, Brian. I so, mean, and ultimately, the people who are responsible are you as the accountant officer and you, Minister, as the head of the department. And Thank Deputy, you, the, the book stops with you. The, 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 the action taken if, is to identify whether that was a weakness using the PWC with the expertise they have and to report that publicly the in March. The auditors for BAM for the last number of years who were doing the report Brian. will tell us that information. Deputy Jack Chambers and then Deputy John Braslin. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, first, I just wanted to be have direct questions. Mr Sullivan, um, what's your reporting relationship as Chair of the Steering Group to the Secretary-General, and when were you first notified of any trigger in the escalation? So I want to know when you were first notified of a trigger of the escalation. My reporting relationship, I, as you say, uh, Deputy Chair of the Steering Group, and that Steering Group reports to, you to a board that Mr Breslin chairs. Yep. Uh, my Steering Group typically meets every month or so, 
um, the board typically meets every other month. Um, as the Secretary General was saying earlier on the, uh, this, this morning, it's important to distinguish between the 61, which was well known um, uh, between September, October 2017 and June 2018, and the escalation in GMP. So the escalation first occurred, or your recollection, exactly when? The escalation beyond the 60 occurred when? <coughs> well, it's important, and I know um, the minutes uh, are, are available publicly, will be shared uh, with committee members. There were references um, in those of, in those steering group minutes hmm. to issues with the GMP. Going uh, back when? Well, the, if I go back over the, the steering group minutes yeah. in April 2018. Okay. There were references. No, I'm just, I'll just tell you what the reference was. So yeah. in April 2018, John Pollock um, from the Development Board advised that approval of GMP by the end of June was at risk. Not, not in terms of the quantum at the time, but okay. the complications of closing the process out. He also said at that meeting it was too early in response to a question from the then chair of the steering group. It was too early to estimate the scale of the financial risk. So um, we, had to, we had reference to the scale of the risk and that the GMP was at risk in the spring of 2018. No, to be, to be absolutely clear what I said, there was a reference a refer in the April 2018 meeting to the expected date of the GMP process being... But that is, was that risk and, and the... A risk in terms of the timeline for closing... And the out. scale was at risk. And what, and, okay. and, what, and what was said there was too early to estimate the scale of the... Financial. So it's too early, but we know there was a risk and there was a potential... There was a, a scale of risk. So and I want again, to know... Just, just, I, I want, yeah, I, I want to know, did you communicate that in any way to the Secretary-General? Um, I would need to go back to the record. I wasn't actually on the steering group at the time, so I'll need to go back and check the records. But as I say, um, there are regular board meetings as well. Departmental colleagues sit on the steering group and okay. sit on the board. So it and would have been known by okay. the department at the time. So okay, it was known by the department. So I'll ask the Secretary General, um, were you, what was your awareness of, of the, the scale and the, the fact it was at risk? So I want to know, ascertain exactly what, what you were told in that spring summer period in advance of obviously the late the latter part of autumn summer 20 or winter 2018 yeah i'm asking re regarding what what was just after being said what what was this were you aware of that risk at that time you were so so as i've said uh, i have a, a, a formal briefing when i come back in september 2018 uh, ar around the issue at that stage Rolling forward, then I have a board meeting, the Children, uh, Children's Hospital Programme Project Board meeting in mid-September, where I get a verbal update from the project director, which uh, uh, allows us to interrogate what the issues are. And then if I go back from there to the previous board meeting, which I think would have been June, we would certainly have been informed of the delay in the GMP process and the fact that it might have to be extended, and the fact that they were having a difficult experience with the contractors around the GMP process and quite a, a, an aggressive stance, particularly on the value engineering where they were trying to make savings, that the kind of collaboration that you would so want that was in to see. June. That in was June. in June. But we and didn't have we didn't have figures put on it at okay, that stage. It was that's much fine. too and, soon. And and did you give any briefing from June to the Minister? Um, I think the briefing is in August when I'm not in the office and the Minister gets the briefing at the very end of August. So you didn't brief, you didn't update the Minister for a number of weeks after receiving that briefing regarding the scale and the risk of the project? Well, you're saying the scale and I'm saying I didn't have the scale. You were aware that there was, there, we were, we've had references to the scale from, the, from Mr Sullivan, so we know there, you're, there are references to the scale, so you're aware of some level of risk around the scale of the No, cost. I'm aware that the process is an, a, a more difficult process than we would have envisaged, and the development board are saying this is, t this is a but tough process, it's taking longer, and we're facing more But you, you uh, didn't resistance. feel it was, you didn't update the minister about that from until at the end of August, or the minister wasn't updated, so you, I mean, that's correct. That's my understanding, yeah, that's okay. my understanding. 
Oh, well, I, well, I think we need a we, question, we need a record. Yeah, and just finally, I, I just I just want to go into the um, the board minutes. If you go back, I put it a FOI a couple of years ago. If you go back to the board minutes, there's references um, around discussions of the inflation took place. It's agreed that the implications of this cannot be underestimated, and confirmation that this will be covered will be required. So there's a clear trend in the board minutes of the Children's Hospital group itself about the trend and the consistent reference to cost uh, and, around the, and the concerns within board minutes around that cost. So for anyone to say that they, you know, even around the tendering stage or post the tendering stage that there were concerns with cost doesn't real, really fall through because the, there's a clear trend throughout this that the Department of Health and the, and the HSE were being uh, notified about the scale of the potential inflation risks and about the scale of the uh, risks around the capital costs. If so, you go back through the minutes. So we do have the benefit of the earlier uh, meetings that have been held on this subject, and, and the Development Board is on the record as saying, as they initiate the GMP process, the, original, the, the earliest work packages, so you don't just do try and cost everything, you try and cost the elements of it. So the first work packages that are coming back are on trend, they're on their expectations and on budget. And it's as they move through the GMP process into the summer of 2018, particularly, and I've, I've tried to stress this point on a number of occasions in relation to MEC and ELEC, because that's actually where the, a lot of the big increases take place. As those work packages arrive back, the quantity surveying design team that's supporting the development uh, board are saying these are now coming in ahead of budget. I just so it's late in the I, process, I, I, and I, at the core of what I'm aware. Uh, PwC have to ask is why was it late and why wasn't there early work? I just warrant? have two final questions, and worst one relates to procedural one reference in the, in the notes. There's the EY report on the business case uh, for the tendering process. Could that be published uh, from the hospital board? The Ernst & Young conductor report presented the business case. I think we need to assess what that was and, and, what, and what work was conducted by Ernst & Young that's in the reference. Well, other, also, than, other than commercial sensitivity. I also have just a final question. You, does it, does you've it, asked a question, let me answer it. No, um, I'm going to ask two questions, then you can okay. answer them both. Uh, the, the second question is, there's an odd reference in the November 2016 uh, board minutes. Is the board was advised that invoices for the public information advertorials have been queried by the HSE but will be paid in resubmission. The advertorials have been placed following the ministerial briefing request to be more proactive in communication. So I think the Minister needs to clarify why you are seeking increased communications uh, in your own engagements with the board. And then Mr Woods, you said in those board and then Mr Woods said in those board no, meetings deputy, that he sorry, would assist deputy, in resolving the matter. Deputy, uh, I think we need to you, know we've given why you a lot of leeway. the only ministerial reference that I deputy, can see we've given you a lot of leeway. in the twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen board minutes deputy. was communications. Uh, that's actually in the minutes and I think uh, you know, we need to get clarity on what that was Thank all you, about. Why, was, why were communications and involved, and what did Mr. Woods say he'd square Thank off you, Deputy around Chambers. resolving uh, matter after Minister, it was questioned Minister, by the would you HSE? Make a contribution to that, and we can move on. Certainly, I'll certainly have to check with that today, Deputy Chambers. I became a Minister for Health in uh, May 2016 and would have started November 2016. Yeah, no, I know, except I was a Minister of Health uh, and would have um, would have started engaging with the children's. Uh, hospital group. I'll, I'll have to check and revert to you directly. I have no recollection of that, but I'll check uh, and revert to you directly. I do, I do recall that there was um, that there was a discussion about the and indeed debates in the Oireachtas and the likes about the merits of the project and the importance of the project and about getting information out about the clinical benefits. But I, I, I don't understand the specific reference in the minute, so I'll revert to you <coughs> accurately on the matter. Thank you, Mr. Uh, we'll now move to Deputy Brazil. Thank you. Um, and uh, Chair, I no, I was going to respond. Sorry. I had a question. I, Deputy, you're not a member of the committee. We gave you plenty of leeway. There was others got leeway as well, Thank Chair. You. And Deputy. I asked Mr. Woods is going to for Deputy clarity. Brassel. Oh, that's... Uh, that's... Uh, the update, um, Minister. So I obviously have, uh, would like to spend a lot of time speaking around the nurse issue and I know on Thursday morning we have, we'll have an opportunity in the Dáil so I'll save my contribution till then. Uh, as you're aware the GPs um, are outside today and again a um, huge issue there around primary care delivery and uh, the issue of the new contract. You might give me a brief uh, update on that and also a brief update on the Schlan to Care implementation uh, group. Um, and then to uh, focus in on the issue that seems to be 
uh, dominating today's proceedings, which is the, the National Children's Hospital. <coughs> I was watching on my monitor in my office, uh, Mr Breslin, when you spoke about uh, a, a, a serious underestimation of quantities, um, that you had got prices for individual items. So I have two questions around that. Is one, why was there a serious underestimation of quantities? Who made that error? And was there also omissions, complete omissions of quantities? Um, because, and if there was, then, I, I mean, if this was a private uh, client engaging a, a design team and they came in with a seriously uh, underestimated quantity, bill of quantities, or that client would take very serious action against the team that underestimated, right up to, I would imagine, suing them. So my, my, my questions are, why, were, why was there such an underestimation? Uh, was there complete omissions? And what action can we take um, against those who, who made those errors? Shall I go first? Yes, um, yes, so I take, I take as, as noted uh, Deputy Brazel's comments in relation to the nursing dispute. We'll have the opportunity to debate that in the morning, but I, but I hope between now and then there will be a continued effort to get this back into some form of formal engagement because that's the only place it's going to be resolved. Flora the doll is perfectly appropriate to discuss it, but it ain't going to be resolved there. Um, this needs to be back in our industrial relations mechanism, so that's where we need to get to. On the issue of the GPs, I'd be happy to provide Deputy Brazel, indeed I'd be happy to provide the committee as well with a note, but just to, just to say to you, I think the the most up-to-date and accurate position is that issued by the IMO to its members this week, um, which I can also send you a copy of. Um, there has been huge progress made between the IMO uh, and my own department and the HSE to try to move to a point where we, we move beyond FEMPI. Um, we, we obviously have things we need in return from GPs as well for significant additional investment. We have a lot of money we want to spend in general practice. We have been talking about this for a very, very long time. I think the fact that the IMO is reporting progress this week to its own members um, is significant in and of itself, and I know they and I want to bottom it out this month. Um, but I'll send you and perhaps the committee chair uh, a note in relation to exactly where we're at uh, on that and try and do that today, uh, if that's okay. On the Sanja Care implementation, um, so we're at the point where I'm almost about to publish the action plan um, for 2019. Uh, so as to give you a, a slight preview in terms of what's likely to be the priority areas this year, uh, geo alignment is one. Uh, one of the key recommendations of Sancho Care was that you can't continue to have the siloed structures. Um, so you can't have your hospital groups and your CHOs, separate budget, separate management structures. You understand this. How do you get there? What does the map of Ireland look like effectively? Um, that's going to be a big part this year, um, the geo-alignment piece. Uh, our elective-only hospitals, um, the planning and advancement, planning from, from both a policy perspective, what do they do, what range of services do they provide, and then ultimately planning from a where do they go uh, point of view. Uh, and I suppose the third key element I'd highlight is the issue of um, the integration fund. We obviously do have a ring fence integration fund this year. There's a couple of really good pilot projects, as the Sligo Primary Eye Review as an example. Um, there are indeed others, the MSK Physios. Could we use that integration fund to roll out what we know are successful projects locally to a, to a broader region, or indeed to the country um, this year? But we'll have, that in, we'll have the action plan published uh, in the next few weeks. So Jen will answer the specific question you asked, but just I did make the point earlier. On the quantities and not preempting the PwC report, <coughs> I think what is, what is apparent in advance of it is that we had gotten the prices locked in at 2016 um, per unit. What was clearly completely off the Richter scale was the quantities that was actually going to be provided. And whilst there's a number of elements to how we got from 983 to 1.4, a very sizable element of that is the fact that when we went, when the National Pediatric Hospital Development Board went beyond outline design stage to the detailed design, somebody seriously got the quantities wrong. Um, and that's one of the things we're paying a huge price for today. Um, I expect PwC to be able to get to the bottom of that. There were professional companies used. There were people with expertise used. The state, through its agencies, would have had contracts with these people in terms of the provision of services, and we'll have to consider what action uh, can be taken in light of the PwC report. So, uh, Deputy, uh, in the engagements we've had and in the brief note we gave last week, we highlighted those two issues which you've, you've drawn attention to there, the increase in quantities. The uh, price put on the increase in quantities is $115 million. Um, there's 27 million of that is the statutory, the fireworks, uh, and so on. So you could perhaps take that off. But you can see the scale of the increase in quantities that's taken place there. And in the omissions um, 
uh, from it, it's 20 million. So those two things combined are, are really, really sizable in explaining what's happening. And they probably underestimate it because, as you know, they knock on then into the programme and, how, and the preliminaries and how long it's going to take to execute the project. So there are further increases resulting from the overall increase in scale that knocks on into that. So I absolutely agree with you. There's a very serious question to be asked as to how the order of magnitude of increase could have taken place, albeit from a preliminary design to a final design, but how could, have that been, how could it have been out by so much? And um, when we ask the question of the Paediatric Development Board in the context of, of finalising it, they were of a view that um, the design team and others um, weren't uh, at fault in relation to that, but the government in December made a decision to um, uh, uh, request an independent review of this whole process to see where could any of those omissions or increases have been avo avoided and whose responsibility it might have been to do so and did they carry out those responsibilities and that's the PwC report. Yeah, well, I, I'd be very interested if the design team weren't responsible for the omissions then the board who were directing them must have come up with something completely different than what they originally specified. I, I, our, sorry for interrupt. That's not obvious to me because there's a separate figure of 20 million for user engagement where the scope changes because users identify issues. So it looks like the change control procedure around uh, quantities and omissions doesn't involve um, an authority based on the user engagement to instruct to increase the quantities. It looks like, now this is me being preemptive of PwC, it looks like it's going on at a lower level than that, and that's what I'm very interested to try and establish. When, um, just one more question. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I specifically raised the issue um, around the 90 million for the nine months uh, uh, increased cost for the construction program, uh, including prelims. I, I would be very anxious to find out the exact amount of that 90 million that is prelims. I would also be very interested in what were the original prelims, what was the percentage of the overall contract price. It's normally somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. It might be as high as 20 percent for a very complicated structure. But I would like to know, if you don't have the figure right now, what was the percentage of the original tender price for prelims and what is the now markup for the nine months? And if you know, the contractor will say, well, you know, things have changed and it's now more complicated, and he looked for a markup on the prelims for the extra nine months, does that markup reflect percentage-wise the same as the other markups on the contract price? We don't I, have it here, but we will. But I, I think that it's a very, um, and you know, I, and I, I'm just interested that this morning or yesterday, Minister, you, you announced uh, Fred Barry, CEO of former CEO of the NRA, as the new chair. Well, at least Mr. Barry is uh, uh, conversant and uh, has knowledge of overspends on on contracts because he was the CEO of the NRA when two projects in Kerry overran by 55 million being the Trillian Castle Island bypass. And if you look at your records, you will find who the contractor was on that particular occasion. And, and there is a striking similarity with the contractor in the National Children's Hospital. Can I now move finally in this round to Deputy Lisa Chambers? Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question as a non-member of the committee. Um, Minister, we might take a break from the Children's Hospital and, and speak about cervical check. Um, Minister, do you, do you accept that the decision to offer out-of-cycle smears, which commenced on the 1st of May last year, that that was your decision and your responsibility? Yes, I do. Who advised you to offer out-of-cycle smears? Okay, so the number one query, the number one query coming into the helpline was coming in from women was asking, could I have a repeat? First, I just I will answer the question in full. If you don't mind, just no time problem. is of the essence. No problem. The chair might give us a bit on this because it's quite important. Uh, the free repeat smear test was number, one of the number one queries coming in. So too were GPs ringing the helpline saying, when women are sitting in front of me, can I give them a repeat free smear test? I discussed the issue with my officials, including um, 
senior officials well known to this committee and the chief medical officer, all of whom agreed that it was an appropriate thing to do as part of the reassurance statement. They then would have, and the chief medical officer has said this to me, they then would have drafted the memo that I would have brought to government I, on the 1st of May, uh, Deputy Chambers, uh, where I would have sought government approval uh, for this as well. Uh, and of course, whilst it absolutely was my decision, um, I'm not sure there was a person in this room not also looking for me to make that decision. Does the Chief Medical Officer advise you to offer free out-of-cycle smears prior to you taking that decision? Was that the advice given to you? The Chief Medical Officer agreed with my proposal that we would, yes. So it was your so it was my, it was my idea. idea. So I, I fed, just to be very clear on this, because it's, it's quite clear, I fed back into my department. Women are contacting me about this, people are emailing me, members of the Oireachtas are raising it, all political parties are raising it, GPs are raising it, the health plan are raising it. Yeah. Would it be an appropriate thing to do? And, the answer, and the answer I was given by my officials, including the Chief Medical Officer, was yes, it was. Prior to you taking that decision and bringing the memo to Cabinet on the 1st of May, did anybody, any expert, any clinical expert, any of your officials advise you against that decision or warn about the dangers of taking that decision? Not to my recollection, Deputy Not Chambers. one voice? Not to my recollection. So the people I would have spoken to in advance of that decision uh, was the Assistant Secretary General, Assistant Secretary in my department with responsibility for the acute uh, hospital sector. Uh, and the Chief Medical Officer in my department. Um, I don't recall anybody, certainly they were supportive of the decision and the proposal, drafted the memo, the press statement. We did put in, and it is important, we did put in both to the decision, to the memo, and to what was communicated to GPs, um, that this was to be done where a GP felt it was appropriate as part of the reassurance. Um, so, I don't, so certainly no one within my department advised me against it, and I don't recall anybody uh, after that, you, 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 you did reference previously in the Dáil that there were letters sent to me much later in that that appeared, I think, on the journal by FOI and the likes, where people did express a contrary viewpoint, um, but, not, but not in advance to the very best of my recollection. There was not one single dissenting voice, given that it would have been pretty obvious, I would suggest, that there would be an increase in demand on the service. You were aware of the lack of cytologists at the time. It's still an ongoing challenge. So you're saying out of all of the experts advising you, all of your officials, not one person suggested that this might have an adverse effect on the screening programme and put uh, unnecessary and uh, pressure on the system that would not be coped with. So not, I, not, not one. So I engage with, when we're just talking about armies of people here, I engage with two people uh, primarily on this, the chief, medic, the chief medical officer of my department and the assistant secretary that I've referenced. Mm -hmm. uh, they both thought and worked with me that as part of the reassurance measures that it was an appropriate thing to do. Your party colleagues thought it was too, and I think they were correct. Uh, Minister, just in terms of the post your decision on the 1st of May, did you um, at any stage review that decision? Was this an ongoing review or did you just leave it in situ? No, How I often did, did you review the decision? No, I did review the decision um, and I want to give you the correct date and if I don't have it, Deputy, I'll revert to you, but I think from my memory it was in October, I think, uh, <coughs> after the publication of the Scali report. I am going to confirm the timeline for you, Deputy, because I don't have it in front of me and I don't want to mislead you, but from my recollection it was in October, uh, it was post the publication of the SCALI report. The SCALI report had now said very definitively um, that our screening programme was safe, that we mm -hmm. could continue to use the labs that we were using, and therefore I felt that was a very big part of reassurance. I would have uh, conveyed my decision to the HSE that I now wanted to end the out of cycle uh, smears at the appropriate opportunity, and that was agreed operationally that that would be December because many women would have booked in uh, for smear tests because so it's three months that you need to elapse. Is it the case, Minister, that you, you took that decision and it took effect from the 1st of May? So from May, June, July, and August, you did not review the impact of that decision, how it was operating. There was no discussions until October. So for four months, a decision that you implemented, you didn't review. No, because remember, we were waiting for, I, I, think, I think there's a benefit of hindsight thing going on here, because remember, Deputy, we were waiting for Dr Scally's report to provide reassurance to the women of Ireland as to whether the programme was safe, whether they needed to get new smears. There was a lot of unease in relation to this, and it was recommended to me by many members of the Oireachtas, by women and by GPs, um, that we do this. I think it was the appropriate thing to do, and I think many thousands of women got reassurance. It did, as I said to you yesterday on the Dáil, and I'm sure we'll be saying later at the cervical check debate on the Dáil, it did certainly contribute, in part, not exclusively, uh, to the backlog situation we're dealing with today. But it was always, as, as GPs pointed out to the helpline, women who could afford the free re the re repeat smear test were always going to go and get it. There was an equity issue where women who couldn't afford it would have been left out. Minister, when did you become aware that the backlog was starting to build on foot of your decision to offer free out-of-cycle smears? I, I can't remember the specific date, but I was aware that the backlog, I was, I was on this on a very 
constant basis. I was having meetings about issues to do with cervical check, if not weekly, fortnightly. Or so as, as soon as the backlog became apparent, I would have known about it. I was, I was well appraised. I can get you a specific date. And Minister, it didn't occur to you to maybe reassess your decision of the, the free out cycle smears in light of a backlog building? So when Dr Scally's report provided reassurance, that's when I made my decision on the, li on the light of official, on foot rather, of official advice um, that we should now reconsider the issue. Just one final thing in terms of, were you at any point then after May asked to stop offering the free out-of-cycle smears before December 31st? So I, need to, I left out one piece of information just in my previous answer, which is important. This issue was also the subject of ongoing monitoring and discussion at the steering group, which included doctors, officials and patient reps uh, who were supportive of the monitoring of this, including and the patient reps, by the way, who are my concern, uh, were supportive of this measure. Uh, my, I received advice that in light of the Scali report, I think it was in October, I'm going to confirm that date to you later, that I should now move to end this cycle. Uh, a free repeat smear test, was on, which was only ever meant to be a temporary measure. Uh, we conveyed that to the HSE as to when would operationally be appropriate to do that. And in their discussions with doctors' organisations, including the IMO, uh, a date of December was decided. Minister, were you not asked on the uh, 21st of October to cease the out of cycle smears immediately, given the pressure on the system? The 21st of October is presumably the date in October I'm referencing where I received a submission from my officials that suggested in light of the Scali report we should now move uh, to end the cycle. My, my officials then would have conversed. I accepted their recommendation in full. Uh, they can attest to that. My officials then would have conversed with the HSE as to operationally when best to do that and the date of December was decided because women, women book in their smear test times in advance because they have to wait three months to elapse. Specifically, uh, sir, just one sorry. final question, Doctor, is just the 4,600 women are, that are affected, yes. how many of those have yet to be contacted? Can the HSE provide an up-to-date on that in relation to the issuing of the letters? Uh, yes, so the majority of letters have issued. Um, there was an outstanding number, I think, of around 200 more complex ones, so there was actually over 11,000 letters issued because even the women who didn't require a retest, there was also over 800 letters issued to GPs, uh, so they will be completely finished this week. So I think we're at this stage we're down to about 160 that are going over the next few days. And there are women there are 4,600 waiting the repeats yeah. there. Thank you very much. And just on, on that issue, Minister, a short question. Why was it chosen to offer a repeat smear rather than a re-examination of the most recent cervical slide? A, a, a good point, um, Deputy and Doctor. It was, it, was, it was recommended that the repeat smear would be provided free where the doctor, where the GP believed it was important as part of the reassurance. So this was where the woman and her doctor in conversation believed that a repeat smear would help provide the reassurance. Of course, I'm sure there are many doctors who had conversations with women and said, actually, we could provide you with the free repeat smear. We've agreed a fee here uh, with the department, but you're actually not, you don't actually require it. The question was, if, if somebody was concerned sure. and came to their GP, would it not have been more appropriate for that slide, the most recent slide, to be examined rather than to go through the whole process of a repeat smear? That's a good point, but it's a clinical, it's a clinical decision, uh, doctor, sorry, it's a clinical decision, Chairman, um, in relation to that, because this, this was an issue where a GP and the woman felt it was appropriate, that therefore the GP could offer her a fee. Uh, it was a political smear. decision not to go down that route. The route you went down was offering a repeat smear. People could have gone down the route of offering a review of the slide. People say it was a political decision. I mean, it was a decision made by me as the minister. Absolutely, all the decisions therefore made are political decisions. It was one sought by most members of this committee. Um, it was one sought by women. It was one sought by GPs ringing the helpline asking for guidance to be issued in relation to it. A fee was agreed with the GP's representative body to pay GPs to do this. Um, and it was one that I put in place as part of the reassurance with the agreement of my chief medical officer uh, and senior officials in my department. Um, and, and, and I believe they were correct. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Deputy Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. We've all been here a long time. I'm sure I'll forget, forget your name as well sometime. Uh, Minister, I want to acknowledge the fact that you have been answering questions for several hours, um, and, but I want to bring it back to uh, the hospital. This is the fourth session we've had on the hospital. We've met the development board, we've met the hospital group, we've met the HSE, we've met the Department of Health. This is the second time we're meeting yourself. And a common theme that we're hearing at committee is that whilst it's all very regrettable, um, really nobody's done anything wrong, is what, is what we keep hearing. So the two-stage process, which clearly was the wrong process, has been repeatedly defended. Um, the withholding of information from the Dáil, Minister, uh, I put it to you, and you've defended it, as is your right, but I would, I would argue uh, 
that if, if, if a minister is asked if we're on budget and a minister knows you're several hundred million euro over budget, that it is misleading the doll to say you're still on budget. But you, 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 you have given your reasons for that. Um, it has been defended that the information was withheld from Cabinet, from the Minister for Finance, from Fianna Fáil, from the Taoiseach during uh, uh, budget negotiations. Um, it has been defended that not a single commercial contract has been cancelled, in spite of the fact that you said yourself, Minister, a few minutes ago, that the quantities were completely off the Richter scale. Now, as Deputy Brazel said earlier on and alluded to, if if private contractors get their quantities wrong to the tune of being completely off the Richter scale, those companies tend to be fired. People tend to lose their jobs, but not here. And again, when I put it to the officials in previous sessions, why has no co commercial contract been cancelled? That was defended as well. Everything has been defended. The most uh, egregious defence, I believe, is the defence on costs. And this is what I want to put to you, because I, I want clarity on this. I've sat through hours of debate on this, and I still don't know what the government's position is on costs, on actually whether or not you believe that a reasonable cost is being paid or not. My position, which I've put forward several times, is that per bed, this will be the most expensive hospital ever built by a mile. That the, the two most, that 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 is not true, you, Deputy. Chair, that's mind, not true. That the two, stop, that the two stop most, giving false information that the two most the expensive hospitals, Sorry, Deputy, which are the Karolinska and true. Stockholm, come in at 1.6 and 1.8 million, and we know that this is going to come in at 3.7 million. So let's take uh, an example closer to home. The, the new matter, case. the new matter extension. You always know, Chair, that you're onto something when you're being heckled by the uh, Fine Gael uh, no, members of the, uh, speaking uh, of the committee. So speaking if facts. you wouldn't mind, if you wouldn't mind, <coughs> um, let's, take a, let's take an example closer to home, if international examples uh, aren't good enough. The new matter extension was finished in, I think, 2014. It has an emergency department. It has outpatients, Not a it has 12 uh, operating theatres, it is a national spinal injury, it's it is a high dependency hospital. unit, it is radiology, it has intensive care, it has research, and has a, it has 134 single occupancy ensuite beds. Now it came in at about 284 million. So if we were to scale that up, if we were very conservatively to, scale, to say, let's scale it by a factor of three, even though it doesn't have any of the economies of scale, um, you'd get to a figure of about 850 million, still less than half of the children's hospital. So even if, even if we accept that the children's hospital needs uh, additional things that the matter doesn't need, we're, it still came in at less than half the cost and doesn't have any of the, uh, the, the, the economies of scale. Now, when I've put this to you and when I've put it to the officials, the defence consistently is, well, really that's not the way to look at it. If you look at the cost per square metre, we have this report from quantity surveyors who in 2016 said it was 2,500 a square metre, but goodness, it turns out that two years later they think it's 6,000 a square metre. And actually, if you look at the children's hospital in, in cost per square metre terms, and you, you, you used this defence earlier yourself, Minister, essentially what you've said is, and your officials have all said, if you look at the children's hospital in cost per square metre, actually it's coming in at a reasonable price. So, can I ask just a straight question? Given my position on how I'm looking at the numbers and your position on how you've laid them out, and given that you get to very different conclusions, do you believe that the costs that are being incurred, and we all accept that a, a, a fantastic children's hospital is required, sure. right? We all accept that. But do you accept that the costs at 1.4, 1.7 billion are not acceptable and they do not represent a reasonable price for the hopefully great hospital we're going to get, Thank or you, not. Deputy. Thank, Thank you, Deputy. Thank you. Minister. No, no I, I can't agree with you on that, Deputy, but what I, what I do agree on is that we are going to look at ways of mitigating the cost further without compromising the clinical benefits, which you don't want to do and I don't want to do of the hospital, and I've put in the additional line regarding that in the terms of reference uh, at, your, at your constructive suggestion. A couple of points you made that I have to respond to. You said that people on this side of the table, and I presume you're including me in this, suggest that no one has done anything wrong. 
just to be clear, that's not my position, and it's not the position of the government. Uh, the position of the government and the position of myself is that the PwC report will identify, including roles, who did what, who knew what, and will knit all of this together in a way that I'll suggest they perhaps have a, an expertise of doing it that, that we may, as individuals and collectives, not. Um, you've talked about... You've talked about you know, not telling the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. I thought I was very clear in my opening statement that the GMP process and the, and the work that that would have to go through and that that would have to arrive at an outcome and then that, that outcome would have to go to government was well known by government departments uh, beyond my own. You've said that no contracts were, were cancelled. Um, I believe that to be factually true. Obviously, you know I don't have the legal powers in relation to cancelling contracts. It's a matter for the National Paediatric Hospital Development Board uh, in terms of the awarding contracts. But what I do want to say, and I, I, I thought I'd said it, but maybe I hadn't said it explicitly. If the PwC report comes back, or indeed any report, and suggests that a company who has a contract did something wrong, uh, or not even did something wrong, was incompetent or inept, or felt, we, will, we will act with the full vigours of the law in terms of pursuing that matter and the contracts that we have. So I do want to, and I know it's important to you, I want to assure you in relation to that. On the issue of costs, and you and I go back and forth on this, I know, um, and I, I think we have a different viewpoint in relation to it, because it's not just per bed, because it's not just about beds. So it's the 14 theatres going to 22. It's the fact that I think we've only about two, maybe two and a half MRIs for kids in the country. We we'll now have five. It's not comparable with the matter because it's going to be a digital hospital, can't start building paper hospitals now in the 21st century. It's also going to be across three sites, and the Connolly part of it will open this summer and start serving kids, and the, um, the X-ray equipment got delivered this week. So I do believe the ACOM review is a good way of looking at it, because it looked at, well, if you were to try and build the equivalent paediatric hospital in London today, what would it cost? And I think from my memory they said 9,000 per square metre. Ours is 6,500 per square metre. So, yes, this is going to be an expensive hospital. Okay. So just on that, the core, and thank you for addressing all of the points, Minister. So, just on that, just what you've just said is that your report, and it is your defence for the, for the cost, and then it has been the official's defence for the cost yes. too, that the children's hospital will come in at a little over 6,000, and doing it in London would be 9,000. Is it therefore your view that actually 1.7 billion represents good value for money? So, I, at the moment, it's my view that 1.7 billion, 1.4 billion, if you don't mind saying so, from the capital costs, is the, is the cost that will be required to deliver the state-of-the-art hospital. Absolutely. What my frustration is about is how did we get to this point where the government expected it to be 983? No, no, I, 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 I understand that. Point, I just, th this is important. It, 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 is, it is a different point. So, no, if the it, government it, it had is, thought, could, sorry, could, could we just go back and, sure. and apologize, Mr. Just, just this is the core point because I still don't. I, it's not clear in my mind still. Do you believe that at the 1.4 billion, do you believe that represents a reasonable price for the children's hospital? I do. I wish it could be cheaper, but I do. You do? Because if I didn't, if I didn't, the government wouldn't have pressed go to proceed with the construction costs. I mean, we can't have a situation where I'm a member of a government and we go and we make a collective decision to go at a hospital that we didn't think uh, was a good decision to make. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, the other two decisions... So you think it represents value for money? I think it represents what's required to deliver this hospital. No, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a statement of, that, 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 that's a statement of yeah. fact, but yeah. your view is that it does represent good value for money at 1.4 billion. So I had three options, pause, retender, or proceed. Yeah. Proceed was the only option that I could go with. The cost of that is 1.4 billion. Yeah. If we can mitigate some of those costs, yeah. of course I'd like to do it. No, I appreciate but, that, but, but that's, not, that's not what I'm asking good. you. What I'm asking you is, can you, you've just said that you believe it is a reasonable cost. Yeah, but deci decision making, like when you've, decision making, and value and cost is all relative to the other decisions you've made. So I had three options to choose from, and I believe this decision did represent the best value for the taxpayer compared to the other decisions I could have made. So I would, no, and that no, is a no, fair to be point. Clear, no, it, might, it is a it fair, is point. A fair no, point. That is a fair like point, but it's not the question I'm asking, to, to, with, with respect, right? Sure. But the, the, I'm trying to get under what the government's position is, because yeah. the government's defence in, in response to the 450 million or more overrun is actually, according to our quantity surveyors, even at 1.4 billion, it's still pretty good value for money because it's less than it would cost in, in London. I just want to understand, is that your view? No, the less than it would cost in London is the response to your assertion that it's going to be the world's most expensive hospital. So that, that's, the, that's, that's the rebuttal to your point that it's going to be the world's most expensive hospital. That's the ACOM view, that that's not the correct view. Right? That, that, that's the rebuttal. The, 
overrun which you refer is a projected overrun. And I'm not being pedantic about this, but, I, but the reason I'm making that point is there's some benefit to being projected rather than actual at the moment, because it does give us a chance to try and mitigate further against the costs, and that's what we're all going to try and do, and what's what we're going to try and do through the PwC uh, process as well. But when I had three options, this option represented the best value for taxpayers because it delivers the hospital. The other options wouldn't have delivered the hospitals, or certainly wouldn't have delivered the hospital any cheaper, and would have delayed the hospital further. I, I understand that when you're evaluating the three options. And that's but that's, just that's make, all I had to do. I had to make a choice of those three options. I, true. But you are also, you and the department and the HSE, you've all, quite the development, you've all, you all keep quoting this QS report, which concludes... This is ACOM. Yeah. yeah ACOM. We, we haven't seen it. We've asked for it, but we haven't got it yet. Which concludes that sure. actually on a cost per square metre level, um, you're actually... You're, you're in line with what it costs to build a hospital. A kid's hospital. Children's hospital. Yeah, children's hospital. And you, your view is that, that you are pretty much in line. Yeah, well, so the assertion, the assertion is being made that the, hosp the children's hospital that we're building is completely out of sync with any comparable children's hospital around the world. I've heard that a lot. Yeah. And the ACOM yeah. report, which uh, if you've requested it, I hope you can have it, um, the ACOM report doesn't agree with that. It doesn't agree with that. It says, actually, this is expensive, but not out of line. Yeah. That's what it says. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Thank you. And before I bring in Deputy O'Reilly, um, Minister, there was reference this morning uh, by you in relation to GP talks and in relation to FEMPE. Uh, the government seems to have set its mind against rewinding FEMPE for contract holders, including general practitioners, and that has brought general practice into uh, a very sorry state. The GPs are under severe pressure in relation to funding, and FEMPE took 38% of funding away from the provision of services through general practice. GPs feel that your uh, stance and that stance of the HSE is dishonest and negligent in relation to the provision of GP services because GPs are under severe pressure. You cannot cr recruit GPs and those GPs who are still there cannot supply a service to their patients because of the reduction in, the, in, in FEMPE. So, Minister, what are you going to do in relation to the reversal of FEMPE for general practitioners? Because it's un unacceptable for you to say that you're going to move beyond FEMPE. Because moving beyond FEMPE is to ignore FEMPE and expect uh, services to be delivered without unwinding it. So how are you going to approach that? Sure. So I think, I think the assertion in relation to dishonest and negative I don't think is one has shared by all GPs or all GP organisations. Because I think from reading the IMO circular to its members this week, uh, which has been in negotiations and is in negotiations with my department and with government. I think they've talked about the progress being made through those negotiations. So I just want to make that point. Um, whilst obviously some GPs have a different view, I don't think the view of the IMO, and I don't speak for them, uh, is that any engagement with me or my department is dishonest or negative. So I do need to say that. Well, I, I, I use the words dishonest and negligent in the sense oh, sorry, that it, 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 it is treating GPs dishonest, uh, dishonestly. Okay. And because GPs cannot supply a service to their patients, sure. there is a, a negligence there because patients are now moving out of general practice. They're moving into casualty departments because they cannot get a service from their general practitioner. They're moving into out-of-hours services which are being flooded and overworked and then ending up in accident and emergency departments unnecessarily. So to, to say that you are not going to unwind FEMPI, I believe, is, dis, is, is treating GPs dishonestly. Okay. So I haven't said that. So my view, and it's um, my department, slightly, slightly cautious about what I'm saying because we haven't finalised this with the IMO yet, as you know. Uh, but they've certainly said an awful lot of their circular about their view of the negotiations. Um, and I think those words are there for every GP uh, to see. But for the record of this committee, I, w I, w I do want to see. Um, we can be pedantic in our wording, right? And as in, I can be careful in my wording. But I do want to see fees. Um, moving to a place that they were before FEMPI. I want to see us reversing FEMPI. I will need some modernisation measures in relation to, for that to happen. And that is not unusual or treating GPs in any way differently. There isn't a public servant who doesn't work uh, here uh, or indeed in our hospitals or in our health service who didn't see some modernisation or productivity measures in return for the unwinding of their FEMPI. Separate to that and distinct from that, there's also additional money for new services, which you are very passionate about and know about in great detail in terms of chronic disease management and eligibility and access. I really think we can, with a big push, I really think we can 
wrap this up very quickly at this stage. So very quickly would be ironic because it's gone on a long time. But I really think we wrap this up in a very short period of time. Um, the IMO circular to their members sets out their position. Um, there's not much in it that I, that, that, that I would disagree with. There has been good progress. We do need to address the issue of FMP. We do have funding for new services. We do need, we, the employer, or the contractor, whatever word people wish to use, we, the management side, do need things in return for productivity and, and, and modernization. And I think we can get there. And I think we can get there to a point that GPs will see a very significant increase uh, in the fees being paid to them uh, in 2019. You're unwinding FMP, Minister, for all public servants, but you're not unwinding FMP for GPs. And the process that you're engaged in at the moment is not unwinding FMP. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that. I'm not sure about that character. I'm not sure about that characterisation, and I'm not sure that characterisation is shared by the GPs who are negotiating uh, on behalf of the IMO. The public servants, or anyone working in the public service, who had their FMP unwound, to use your phrase, and many of them are doing new and different things um, as a result of that as well. So, what I am saying to GPs, who I'm sure are watching this very carefully and closely, particularly the day that is in it, is we will in 2019 be investing an awful lot more in general practice that will address the issue of FEMPI. It will also address the issue of new services because our patients need new services and our GPs want to provide them. It will do so in a way that is managed and controlled and doesn't flood general practice. And I think mistakes have been made in the past um, in that regard as well. But we are making very significant progress in relation to this. Uh, I welcome the fact that the IMO updated their members um, this week. Minister, thank you. Thank you. Deputy O'Reilly. Thanks, Chair. Oh, no, thank you. Um, and, and thanks to everyone, because I know we have been answering, uh, we, we, well, am I going to say answering questions or getting responses, but look, we, we've all been here anyway for quite some amount of time, so thanks to you all. I'd like to patients. alert our members who are still here, we have to be out of here by quarter to two. Okay, well I'll talk fast and hopefully I'll get the responses even faster. Um, just with regard to the, the, the unwinding of FEMPI, um, it's... I don't think it's true to say that everybody has uh, necessarily some form of productivity or change work practice to be associated with uh, the unwind unwinding of, uh, of MP in that regard. And my understanding is that the, the processes by which that was monitored have been uh, substantially dismantled. Uh, there was some attempt made several years back, um, but I, I will... We can maybe talk about that another time, um, but I just I wouldn't say with the same confidence that, that you have that everyone is, is doing something different. That would be out of the norm in terms of the upskilling and the, the general change roles, and it's not linked to any percentage, because clearly if it was, then you'd be able to point to a great group or category of workers that had um, not achieved necessarily whatever targets were set down, and there'd be a timeline and all that, and there just isn't that. So I think it's a, a little bit unfair to I think it's a fair GPs. point. I think, it's, I think you're making a... So I don't think we're both saying contradictory things, but I think you're making a fair point. Okay. Uh, now, so the uh, I want to ask three separate questions. One relates to the tender um, and the fact that it is, as, as alluded to by my by my colleague, um, it was an abnormally low tender price. Okay. So. In, in legal terms. You, you could use that as, as a, a term, but if you were using it in legal terms, it will take more than a, a oh, and, and And I do want to get on to the legal aspect of it now, uh, Mr. President, if I can. So I'm going to use the term abnormally, uh, abnormally low tender price. Uh, and I understand that you were um, concerned about the potential for legal action. So I'm assuming that you, you would have seen, you would have sought some advice uh, in relation to the potential for legal action, had well, you not gone Secretary with the lowest? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt no, no, you. No. But when you say you, obviously the Secretary General, I mean, the law is clear in terms of where the legal responsibility lay. didn't lie with my Secretary General. No, I, I understand that. Okay. So when the lowest possible tender price was chosen, Mr. Breslin, you said that you believed, had that not been the case, that you would have found yourself on the steps of the High Court. Just, or, can I just, because you are putting the words into my mouth, I need to, no, I need can, to say what I said. Me, okay, can you just, I, I'm I not didn't say I would have if I made the decision found myself in the High Court because I didn't make the decision and it wouldn't have been me in the High Court. 
It would have been the Development Board. So you were concerned that the Development Board would have found themselves... So I'm the looking language. back now, in hindsight, okay. because I wasn't in the decision-making process at the time, no. and you're asking me questions about why would somebody accept a tender that's under £30 million below another one, and I'm saying, well, one reason why they might would be that if you didn't accept that, you would be exactly. challenged legally and okay. that you would and be tied up for two for, years. Exactly, and thank you for clarifying that. So, is it your opinion then that the board would have sought legal advice on how likely that was should they have would you consider that to be best practice or were they were they fine to just go look we better not take the chance just in case so again not having been in the process but my expectation would be actually before they'd arrive at that point they would carefully invigilate all of the tenders to see where the gaps are and to see whether those gaps are sustainable, or has somebody just left a hole in their tender, which is ultimately going to come back and bite? Okay. So when you went, when the board went to the tender process, the criteria used was 75% on price, 25% on quality. Uh, and see, that doesn't really square with this. Uh, you know, the children of Ireland deserve the best hospital in the world narrative um, that, that's, that's sort of emerging because really you'd probably be placing a small bit more emphasis on quality uh, if the case was that that was going to be at the absolute top of the agenda. So I, I can't square the statements made about wanting this to be, the, I'm not getting into whether or not it's the most expensive because I just think once you're in the catastrophic overrun territory, it sort of doesn't matter. But anyway, um, but it doesn't really square with the notion that it, everything was going to be done to the highest possible standard and for the best, because actually far more emphasis was placed on getting this done cheap rather than, and, and we see now where that was, because obviously the lowest common, the lowest bidder was going to get it if 75% was going on price and 25% was going on quality. Um, so, um, Minister, maybe you can comment on that because you're the one that keeps saying that you want it to be the best in the world. But like, 75% was price, so it, it wasn't. It wasn't, and we see now that the emphasis on price is actually going to cost very, very dearly. I mean, you used the phrase "somebody seriously got the quantities wrong." That, that's a wee bit of an understatement now when we're when we're dealing with uh, cost overruns of this nature. So, perhaps, Minister, you might comment on that. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. I just you as I see it that when you actually look at the quantities um, between the detailed design and the outline design someone did get it seriously wrong and I can put in more hyperbole it's more the 75 more, more exaggerated 25 language please. if you wish but it's uh, but um, but that that is my view in relation to it in regard to the wording of the contract I, I am not commenting in relation to procurement roles that I didn't play a part in, shouldn't have played a part in, and if I did play a part in, would have extraordinarily serious questions uh, to answer. My view and my position when I talk about it being the best hospital for children is based on what it'll do for kids compared to what they have today, uh, the services that it'll provide and the specifications that it'll deliver. And I'm very satisfied um, in relation to that, that it's an investment worth making. Okay, so uh, with regard to the steering group, Minutes, uh, and by the way, I don't accept that, but that's, that, that's your position. That's okay. So there were 12 meetings that we have the minutes for. The Assistant Secretary General, uh, Ms Conroy, attended 10 of them. Mr Wood, you attended six. Can I just ask, because it, it's clear from the, the, what, what was being discussed that people were starting to get concerned. So, Mr Breslin, presumably you would meet regularly with Miss Conroy. I mean, he do, he's working in the same place. Yes. Probably, even if it's only just the occasional water cooler moment, you're going to be seeing this, this woman on, on an ongoing basis. Did she, she didn't say anything to you, because it's, it's obvious from the, the tone of the, the minutes that concerns were being raised. Um, she, didn't, she wouldn't have said anything to you in relation to, as you say, she was at 10 out of those 12 meetings. Mr Woods, you were at six. So I have two questions. One for yourself is just, at no stage was it mentioned even casually if it wasn't followed up. And Mr Woods, did you understand that somebody who was a member of this steering group was making the concerns that were being raised by the members of the steering group known to government? Or were you happy to continue with senior members, or, or with, sorry, with the Secretary General and or the the minister being unaware or would you have believed given that presumably I mean you went to six of the meetings but presumably you, you, you read the minutes from the ones you, you couldn't get to but would you have had a belief that that 
the concerns that were being raised were being communicated to people more senior than the ones sitting at the table? Maybe I could answer first because I, I can quite honestly say that m my understanding would be that um, the Assistant Secretary's understanding of where the process was would be consistent with my understanding of that. We do communicate regularly. Uh, I didn't. The surprise moment I got was coming back to see in September how the issue had crystallised. Not that it was taking longer or not that there weren't challenges in the process, but when the type of figures were talked about uh, when I came back off leave, that was news to me. But it wouldn't have been news to me that the process would have to be extended because it was taking longer and the GMP was at risk and it wouldn't have been news to me that there were challenges around value engineering savings and other, and other inflation factors. But it was just the overall quantum of the yes. amount yes. and you didn't ask, obviously. So you, 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 had, no, no. you had some awareness that there was an issue but you no, didn't ask. No, it's not that we didn't ask. It's not that we didn't ask. The position of the development board was that it was too early to say that the uh, position was not yet um, uh, quantifiable. So it's not that we didn't ask. And actually, throughout the process, uh, particularly in September and October, our emphasis was to get the process to the end so we could have certainty. And we were making sure the Development Board put all the resources they could into finalising the process. But the finalisation of the process would have happened um, over a year from when the first issue was raised. And no, I have, no, I have no, a question to Mr no. Woods, Chair, and you did exercise a fair amount of leeway with other people. And I have one more question, Mr Woods, <coughs> thank you. The, yes, as you say, I was at six of those 12 meetings and, and indeed I would have seen the other minutes because they are item one on the following meeting, if you know what I mean. So, um, the, I, I think I would uh, restate uh, what the Secretary General has just said to say that uh, the concerns that were being reflected in those minutes related in the time period we're talking about, which is um, kind of spring, summer 2018, I think, mm -hmm. was about a delay in time scale and uh, the crystallisation of the financial uh, challenge to the GMP becoming visible then as we moved into the autumn. It's not for me to comment on, uh, but I think Secretary General has addressed the uh, information flows within government. Um, the, the HSE has its processes and this was one of them and so that information was being shared to the extent you see it in the minutes at those meetings. Thank okay. you. Sorry, and I have one very final question and it's, uh, it relates to the, the minutes of the meeting, sorry, no, I'll just get the one page of it, of the 31st of May 2018. So on page 3.5 as MOC noted concerns around the nursing intake to third level education as the current flow will not generate the required 300 new paediatric nurses in 2022. So, um, I, and we've had discussions on this, but it is my observation that even uh, if this hospital is built, um, there's not going to be the staff to staff it uh, based on the... You know, so, yeah. Ch similar challenges, God, geez, I'm really fond of that word, exist in relation to junior doctors, allied health professionals, um, and a, an ongoing interface with the Department of Education was noted. But is, has that circle been squared now? Are the staff ready? Is there um, sufficient numbers in the system? Are you confident that they're not going to emigrate like everyone else is? Yeah, what kind of Certainly the issue was flagged up um, then, Deputy. There's issues with any major capital bill like this that requires. Um, a significant expansion in staffing that you need to clearly be assured not only that the, the building um, is happening, which, which has been obviously the, the subject of major discussion, but also that when it is built, that actually the staff are there, most importantly, to, to, to run the services. Um, we know how many um, staff members there will be when the hospital opens in 2023 by staff group. Um, we know how many more that is than we currently have. We know where the turnover is of the different staff groups, and we know where the pinch points are and all of that. And there's a process, staff group by staff group, under um, the arrangements that I chair, to look at each of those areas and to seek to mitigate the risks that are there in terms of ensuring that there is but, a pool. But Mr. Sullivan, for the if they're, group if they're not in college from. now, they're not going to be ready. Pardon? Maybe, maybe if I could add, um, just with a view to being helpful, is that the. the Staffing for the satellite news in Connolly is proceeding now. 
and there has been some good success in that in terms of recruitment both um, of consultant staff and others. Uh, so you're right, I, I think we also need to remember this is not just a hospital, this is a model of care for paediatric services nationally. So there's also a resource gone into Cork, Galway and Limerick and, go, and we'll have to go into those facilities to develop this. And it also goes beyond hospitals into mental health and disability. So there are, there are actions underway at the moment across a range of areas to grow staff. You're right in saying, Deputy, there's clearly a challenge. Uh, Theatre nursing, for example, is one challenge that's quite real. And, uh, the Children's Hospital Group have looked at training their own staff, uh, you know, engaging with their own staff in that area and are doing some work on that. So um, there will be a challenge, but there is also some signs at the moment of progress in recruitment for the satellite unit, which is the yeah, first But test. I mean, in last May you weren't confident that you were going to get the, the numbers, and mm. you're, you're not confident now. And it does ask the question, you know, the, the, it, it seems, as someone looking on, that the uh, that, that sufficient attention was not being paid to the detail. And there, there's no additional detail on how many, uh, how many new nurses are going to be in the system, how many are going to be recruited, allied health professionals the same. So it does, uh, it does not help your own cause to say, I mean, I understand you're here to say that, uh, you know, that, that people were taking responsibility and doing all of that, but really um, to have it built and then not to have sufficient staff to be able to open it would just mean it's, it's, it's not a new model of anything, it would actually make it just Thank like you, the Deputy. entire rest of the Thank health you. service. Just, just on a point, um, with the Minister and the, the Department and the, the various boards in the hospital, this committee hasn't received one document since these uh, hearings have started. You may be sending documents to individual members, but not one document has been received by this committee. So could you ensure that all those documents are sent to the committee Absolutely. so we can circulate them to all members of the committee? Absolutely. Yeah, well, my officials will liaise with the clerk of the yeah, committee. As I said earlier, Chair, the, the normal procedure is that the Secretariat say these are the items required following our, today's proceedings and then we're very happy to come back time, on a well, timely basis. Well, now, with those. In, in, in fairness, um, Mr Breslin, you, 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 you say to the committee, of course I'll provide you with documents. Are, are we then to go through the transcript to identify each I, I'm just reflecting on our normal experience with committees, including other committees, the PSC, that we do get that and we then have no disagreement as between what was promised and what's been delivered. I'm happy to do, I have taken notes here this morning, and I'm happy to do, to make the preparations to do that, but it is useful for us to liaise with the Secretariat on that. I find that extraordinary, that you would sit here on a, at a committee and say I would provide the committee with a document and then not provide the committee with the document unless the committee... No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when we, provide, when we provide it to the Secretariat that they would also be able to say yes, 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 you've, you've provided everything that's required. But you haven't provided anything. Because I, I also come in and people say you said you'd provide something that's not there. So I'd like to know that before the next meeting everything that we've committed to the Secretary accept has been provided. That's all as I'm, I'm suggesting. I think at this stage we probably accept anything because we haven't received any documents. Thank I, you. I have provided documentation. <laughs> Maybe you would provide the documents to the committee, uh, Deputy <laughs> Kelly, whatever <laughs> ones you have. <laughs> Deputy uh, Kelly. Some of us do ask pertinent PQs also, Chair, so that's how you get information as well. Um, even though sometimes, as I've pointed out to uh, the Minister and the Secretary General, you do have to follow up sometimes, um, which I've had to do to get documentation. Um, but on that point, I agree with you, Chair. It does seem bizarre because I've asked for the memo that went uh, in August to the Minister on at least three occasions now. And I don't think we need to actually get a note from the clerk to you to tell you to ask you to get it. So can you, and I expected that we would have got it while the committee was sitting here because I asked for it four hours ago. Um, we also look for, just to be clear, we also look for the uh, minute or the all correspondence in October to deeper and backwards regarding requests for meetings. We also want all the board meetings from the, uh, the minutes of all the board meetings from the actual uh, board that Mr. Breslin chairs and the board, the original hospital board. I think the other board minutes should be distributed around everyone as well as regards to the steering group. If you think anything else is useful, fire it on as well. Isn't that the best way? If in doubt, don't leave it out. Um, a few questions. I'm intrigued by the pinch point, Minister, and I'm going to get down to Mr. Woods and Mr. Sullivan. But first, I accept your bona fides, and I have all the time in relation to 61 million. And so you found out there was at least 200 million in August. What I want to know is what happened between 
the summer of 2017 and August 2018, as regards communications from the board to the steering group to the other board, to you. And it hasn't been really discussed today. So I've been waiting for another two and a half or three hours to get to this point. So Mr Woods, you sat on the board of the hospital, you sat in the steering group, right? So when, in your view, was the escalation, the changeover, think about it, because we're accepting the six bona fides of the 61 million, but when was there a sign of an escalation over the 61 million that you, know, you thought that this was a real issue? Beyond the 61 million. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, and you're, uh, so as a board member of the building board, which was the question I was answering to the deputy O'Connell. No, wait, wait, wait a second. I'm asking you now. As ah, yeah, no, sir. You're, sorry, on, sorry, you're on both yeah. of them. So yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. Here. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm only identifying the location to be yes. helpful, not to isolate sure. the answers, if you know what I mean. Um, my recollection is, and I would need to look back at the record, I clearly see a report in September uh, at the board meeting of the Paediatric Hospital Board. You're asking, um, uh, and um, I would have to look and see was there information at an August meeting. Was I there or was I on leave? I'm not sure. So I'd have to look at that. Uh, 2018, sorry. We just say the years because. 2018. Yeah. Uh, you were asking more generally about, I think, between a date in 17, summer of 17, and summer of 18, I think, in effect, Deputy. So, as you can see, the steering group meetings were continuing over that time period. I have them all here, yeah. As indeed were the board meetings of the yeah, I have all the dates for them too. National Pediatric Hospital Development Board. So their proceedings are there and known, and, and you can see from that that they're um, uh, they're deliberating on the, the proper matters of I, concern. About three or four minutes ago, now I asked you when did you sense in either of your roles that there was a change from the 61 to a higher figure? So I think we've already um, had the point made that in early summer 2018, the chief executive of the building board was flagging that there was a time delay risk and couldn't be precise at that point on any financial risk associated with GMP. So what I'm saying, um, from the best of my recollection, Deputy, I'm happy to go back in detailed records to look at this, is that it was um, September of 2018 when that became known to me in the board. Uh, I'm, I'm not distinguishing the two roles. I'm also saying to you then in my role within the HSE, uh, the time scale would have been something around that. So uh, that's the, the answer. Uh, if I, uh, I would have to look at a detailed record, and I, to be honest, I hadn't the opportunity to do that before attending here. Even though you're coming up here today? Unfortunately, I've been working late on other matters, maybe. Uh, um, I would like to uh, do that. Chair, I, I Maybe, Mr. Sullivan, maybe you could tell us. I'm going to ask you the exact same question. When were you, and you were, I mean, I see when you took over as chair of the steering group, you took over after the April meeting, you took over from May. So when did you become aware of the changeover from 61 million, which we've accepted, to anything higher than that? probably isn't particularly helpful to be looking at when I became chair, because I think it's actually useful to go back to the meeting before that, when John Conlon was chairing. Fine, so, April. Yeah, John yeah, Conlon I have was chair. I have the minutes here, yeah. So if we look at the April meeting, because we discussed... April 17. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, excuse me, David, April 18. Is this where, he, where, this, where John Pollock flagged pricing discrepancies so between... What, yeah, what was said on the 23rd of April meeting was... Um, John Pollock noted that the GMP approval by the end of June is at significant risk. John Conaghan, as chair, asked about the scale of the financial risk involved, and, and John Pollock advised that it was too early to estimate at that point, but agreed to provide clarity about the timeline and financial risk by June is as per the minutes. So that's in April 18. So that's why, as I say, not particularly helpful to start in May when I took over the role. Fine. So there, was, there was some bubbling around of an issue at the time. Then we go to the next steering group meeting, which was in May 18, which, as you say, Deputy, was the first one that I was chairing. And at that meeting, John Pollock advised that by the end of June, the development board will have a strong sense of where we stand in overall terms, re the capital construction cost, was the view he expressed at the time in good faith, I'm sure. Um, and then the only other date that is relevant at the time in terms of where you're going, I assume, in terms of joining up the dots and all of this, 
Um, subsequent to that May meeting then on the 20th of June 2018, there was a the board meeting that Mr. Breslin chairs. And again, consistent with what has been said uh, today and at previous sessions, um, John Pollock reported to the board then that uh, he reported on capital costs, challenges and pressures and delays. Sorry, in that's... Sorry. So John Pollock reported on capital costs, challenges and pressures, delays in completing the GMP negotiations, um, and he set out that meeting and it was recorded as such that the closed, close out date for the GMP process was pushed back from the end of June to the end of October. So that was the position as at the, the board that Mr. President chairs okay, on the fair 20th enough. of June. So Mr. Woods, you sat in the same meeting that he's referred to. I presume what you're saying, Mr. Sullivan, is that basically April it was kind of being flagged. You don't feel it was April that was being flagged at it, all? No, no, no. To be clear, Deputy, it, it, it wasn't being flagged. There was noise in the system in April. It was the first What's the time difference between were, noise in the system and it being flagged? Big, for, well, for all the reasons you said, noise in the system could mean there's another 50 million problem coming over the hill. No one had... I was not... That I'm not asking you... To, I'm, hold on a second now. I was very clear. I didn't ask you to know whether it was 200 million or... I just asked you, both of you, the same question. We knew 61 million is parked. We now know in August it was 200 million. We now know in November it was 450 million. What we're trying to figure out is between the 61 million, which was known mid summer 2017, and August 2018, where there was 200 million. Now, it's very clear. I think what you said is probably quite accurate, to be fair. The April meeting is what I've flagged from the minutes, where this was. You know, noise in the system. Something beyond the 61. Yeah, was an awareness. No thing. sense. But as Mr. Woods scared. didn't feel that. You were at the same meeting. Uh, I just flagged that it was uh, late spring, early summer. That those concerns were being raised and quoted. The chief executive of the building board is doing that. Okay, but are you happy it's to be consistent with Mr. Sullivan that, as far as you're concerned, the escalation because noise in the system, potential escalation issues, whatever phraseology you want to use were there around April 2018. Both of you are more or less saying the same thing, sorry. I think we need to be careful to say, um, to talk in terms of financial facts, there was nothing known at that point. Uh, listen, I'm taking that for granted. I'm not hanging yeah. out on, fa on actual yeah. a figure, okay. but there was a problem. The CEO of the hospital group was reflecting <coughs> a potential issue and also a time delay. They were what was being flagged, okay. I think, from those so members. Mr. Sullivan, you know, we know the structure now. The, Mr. Costello report into you and you report into Mr. President. So, and Mr. Costello provides reports into sorry, me and fine. I provide reports. Well, what, what, what I want to know is what information, what opinion did you give the department in April, May and June? Well, as I mentioned, we, I took over the chairing of the process in May. The next board meeting that Mr. Breslin chairs was in June and I've given you feedback as to what was said at that meeting in June. Okay, we need obviously to get those minutes. And so from June, from that minute, from those minutes up until August, were you continuously updating the department as regards what you were hearing? Because well, there, there was, was a number of other meetings. Yeah, there were, there were no other steering group meetings mm -hmm. then until August. So there was no steering group meeting in July. It met 11 times during 2018, but didn't meet in July. Um, I would need to check the records, Deputy, but I'm not aware of my understanding of the position changing during that time. The next time um, that I was aware, or the first time that I was aware um, of a change to the position, and as Mr. Wood says, a beginnings of firming up around a number was when I uh, met with Mr. Costello and Mr. Pollock in, in August, around the time that uh, the minister was briefed. Just before he was, it was, that was a day or two Literally before he was, that, yeah, yeah right, I saw that week. correlation. I, and I'm concluding, but this is, you'll be, you'll like one of my questions, Chair, it involves you, you're all right. Um, Mr. Breslin, does that all run perfectly for you? Are you happy that the information that has been stated there in relation to the knowledge, which was there April, May, June, being provided up to you, but there was no accentuation, but you definitely knew there was an issue? Yes. No. You knew there was an issue, but you didn't know how much? Exactly. So, um, what I have is the board uh, meeting, the, the programme board, which I chair in January and March. We're only dealing with the 61 million and uh, what was being called a backstop around that. That was to try and manage that issue without any impact on, on funding. Um, so the first one then is June, where the issues are raised. The uh, imp most important thing there is 
the um, length of time for the GMP process is signalled as having to be extended by three months. And the conversation around that is there's pressures, the contractors, the behaviour that we're seeing, the interaction that we're seeing, it's causing problems, it's taking longer, but we, we don't have figures okay. at that stage. Fair enough, and then accept it. Let accept me just complete then to, to the end. To, I'm sorry, if, yeah. Chair, if I could uh, take yeah. some of his time, because there is a bit of putting it on the record. Okay. Um, so then in August, as I've described, information comes into the department. September, I get that information. On the 19th of September, we have the next board meeting. And at that point, the uh, board is further along the process. They are talking about figures, but they're saying the figures are preliminary. They're, they're still not in a position to be in any way definitive as to what the outcome will be. So, my last, and this is, I'll, I'll put the three questions and then I'll, that'll be it. Thank you. Firstly, firstly um, during this time, April, May, June, obviously issues are bouncing around. Um, there's concerns, um, whatever is the phrase that Mr. Sullivan used there a minute ago, which made me laugh, I can't remember the phrase. But, <laughs> noise in the system. That's, that's going to stay with me for now, anyway, definitely. Noise in the system. Uh, obviously, now we know that at any level in the departmental there was no communication at all with deeper about the noise in the system that's just that's a yes or no answer or, or if you say yeah if that's the first question um second question is and that's specifically for yourself mr president so the, from april on the noise in the system which we now know from the minister the noise in the system until august there was no communication at all with deeper that's the first question. Second question is, Mr. Harris, in November, you were in the Midwest. Uh, we're talking about projects that are affected. I just want clarity here because I'm very confused. Myself and Dr. Harty very much welcomed. You said that the 60-bed modular unit in Limerick was going to be funded. Yes. Wild public, great fan for I asked the parliamentary question about this last week, or two weeks ago, and you gave me the answer. And I'm not going to take up the committee's time, but effectively the bottom line was there was no commitment and it was competing with all other projects and no decision had been made until a capital plan. Now, sorry now, but I don't like using this word, but either what you said in November isn't accurate or else the PQ that came back to me last week is false. Because the two of them can't. So you announced it in November. The funding was there. Mm. We had all your colleagues out saying this is great. And by the way, and yours. it's 100%. It's, it's, it's my local regional hospital. Yep. And I've always campaigned for it. You did. But you told me last week that that hadn't been secured. But yet your colleagues came out a day later after I released this information and said, no, they guarantee from you it was. But how could you answer a parliamentary question and say it hasn't been? And considering that you've told us numerous times the capital plan won't be announced until next week. Now that's a, and the last question is on survival Thank check. You, Deputy Quest Kelly. Diagnostics. Quest di this is a specific question. Quest Diagnostics. No, oh, Deputy, really, uh, we, we have three members here who this, want to contribute, so, and they've only got a number of minutes. A quest so. di quest I, I leave, do you know what, yeah. I leave, I'll put that last commentary Thank in at 5 o'clock inside the tank. Minister, a brief answer, please. So, on both so. questions. Uh, with the deeper question I think you asked Mr. President to yeah. answer on the, on the Midwest question, just to be very clear, was I presume the answer to that parliamentary question is the same answer to all, we're getting lots of parliamentary questions about is my project, is my project. I've been very clear, I want to be very clear here, Deputy Kelly, and you campaigned for it as did Deputy Hardy, yeah. I acknowledge that. The 60-bed modular bill for Limerick will go ahead as part of the capital plan. The capital plan... So it will be funded? Yes. I'll so, be very clear on that. So be honest with you now, Minister. No, We've had a number of examples of this. The parliamentary question answer you gave to me, sure. the parliamentary question you gave before, which you apologised to Fianna Fáil about not sticking on the line on, please do not respond to parliamentary questions like that. It's not appropriate to parliamentarians to be sending out something which factually isn't accurate. You're telling us here you're guaranteed you're given the funding. In the PQ, you said it was open to other considerations and other capital projects. Please take that on board. Yeah, point taken. It's a political, it's a political just, to, just for the record of this committee, that is a political priority of mine because I believe the Midwest region okay. has been let down. Thanks, I'm and, delighted and, to hear and it, and it will be delivered to Deputy Kelly. The PQ, which I don't have, is pointing out that the capital plan has yet to be agreed and all prices you know, I'm, 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 I'm letting you know that that will be it. Okay, Mr. Worth. And so my understanding and the question about deeper being advised of uh, the, the noise in the system up to August, my understanding is they weren't advised. What do you mean your understanding? You either, they either were or they weren't? So I certainly didn't advise them of the, at that stage and, and uh, when I've asked people, 
it's in the latter period, uh, which I've, I've said to you on the record previously, informally in October, formally in November. So I don't expect that there was any advising of deeper over the summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just on that point, Minister, sure. I, I don't doubt that the 60 modular unit in Limerick will be delivered. The question is, when will it be delivered? Because my understanding is it was to be delivered before the end of 2019, and the rapid construction would take 300 days. So we really don't have many days left to deliver that unit before the end of 2019. That's the question, I think, that D Deputy Kelly was getting at. When will it be delivered? We, we have no doubt it will be delivered. Sure. When will it be delivered? Well, perhaps I can, perhaps when we have the capital plan, I can meet with reps, including yourself and Deputy Kelly, and from the Midwest, and we can discuss that. Matter. Thank you. Now, I, I see three deputies here. Can you decide among yourselves who is going to speak, or is one going to represent the three of you? To represent the three chairmen. Someone sat here all morning and, and every, very patiently and every, week. And and every, every week, week the same and find ourselves at the end of the day being cut short and that's not your fault. I'm not blaming you it for it but I get, well I'm not going to blame him just to here now I'll deal with it outside and have a, and we'll have a, a tete a tete outside. The fact of the matter is this that we have the same rights as everybody else uh, and, and, and uh, cutting short what we have to say is not going to happen. A non committee member is having free run and not obeying the chair. It's unacceptable. Absolutely. Chair. It's unacceptable. Deputy O'Connell, do you want to take the lead? Do you think that I'm looking the angriest, is it? <laughs> Things the safer bet, is it, De <laughs> Doctor? Um, John Connachton, who was in the role, Mr Sullivan, before you took up the role, is that the same John Connachton we've met here before? Yes. What was his role again? I can't remember what his job was. He was the Deputy Director General of the HSC and the Acting So, the de but Deputy Director, do you see, I, I'm not suggesting anyone's telling lies here. But Deputy Kelly has just left has a, has a famous line for people watching at home. We're getting them teed up for the six o'clock news. So for people watching at home, it's not acceptable, it's not believable to normal people sitting at home that John Connaughton, who was in the role you've just described, was in Mr Sullivan's position. That their money, the taxpayers' money, will be described as noise here this morning. And I do understand uh, Mr Woods, your commentary about crystallisation of the financial position, which basically could be summarised into the price of it. You know, that's just HSE speak for the price of the product. And, and, and so it's not credible for people out there that we had the top man in Deeper for shopping. Essentially, his job is procurement. That's shopping, essentially. We have the fellow charged with shopping for the country, who's on the board, and he thinks noise is, is, you know, he doesn't see that this noise is going to affect his position on the roll, or sorry, his position on the board isn't going to have a knock-on effect to his shopping for Ireland job. I don't buy that here today. And even if there's no um, formal um, communication, Mr. Breslin, you said, I think it was last week, I can't remember now, there's so many meetings, that you expected the normal governance structures. And you said here, again, just now, that you didn't advise deeper. But I think everyone with a head on their shoulders knows that somewhere along the way, the man who was in charge of the shopping, Mr. Quinn, must have said, this is getting out of control. Um, if this is going to pull from other things, I'm not going to have enough money to do my day job if I'm in my board position I see this going on. And when you look at the, the, the document, and it probably would be useful to this committee that we got at PAC last week, which was all of the reviews that were done in, in 18 and 17, so this document here that we got, um, we, we were provided with PAC last week, there's 200,000 spent on reports in 17 and 18, starting in February 17. And in February 17, there was a stakeholder review. In April 17, there was a contract management review. So in my mind, at some point before February 17, the you-know-what was heading towards the fan. And this exercise in 200,000 of reviews was in a backside covering exercise as such. I am very suspicious of, of the 200,000 spent in reviews up to then. And to follow on from Deputy Kelly, there is a gap there in the reviews from July 17 to May 18, nothing happened. I think we're going around the houses here um, in the sense that 
Yes, obviously there's official emails, there's official memos, but I think you're taking all of us for a fool here, Mr. President, when you think, when you expect us to believe that Mr. Woods, who's sitting here in front of me, who works for the HSE, whose job is to deliver the service, didn't consider that the service, his, your day job, couldn't be achieved if all the money was spent in the hospital. I don't think it's believable that the man that was in charge of the shopping didn't mention it. It's just not credible. And whether there's a paper trail or not, or whether people secretly said it, or it was in this noise situation, it's just not credible today. And I actually, I don't blame you, Minister. I think you're being treated unfairly here, because you cannot be inspired as to what's going on. If people deliberately plot behind your back not to tell you, well, how are you to know? It's not your job to go measuring the cable. And like, this is, I think, our fifth, fifth or sixth um, meeting on this. And we really are none the wiser. And I think it's just, we're, we're getting nowhere because no one's prepared to answer direct questions unless they know that they have themselves covered. And I think it's very, very concerning, because at the end of the day, Mr. Woods, the HSC is, is supposed to deliver the service. And further to that, when Mr. Scally was in here, when he started doing his review, he met an information wall. How are we to say that PwC aren't going to meet that same wall? I can't remember the exact phrasing um, Dr. Gabriel Scally said in, in the Health Committee. But what's to say that, you know, PwC are going to get the information. Because there's an awful lot of people in here very good at, you know, referring to minutes. But the logic is, Mr. Woods, that you're in a top position in the HSE, Mr. Quinn is in a top position in Deeper, and I don't believe that he didn't tell somebody before the Minister was told officially in June. Deputy O'Connell. Mr. Woods. Um, well, Deputy, in terms of your references to um, my role, I mean, I hear, in effect, you're making a statement, I think, more than asking a question, but in terms of your references to my role, uh, the, the records are clear in terms of what was known when, and I'm very happy to share that in terms of straight answers to questions. No, the I'm records are very to clear as to, your, as, as to the official documentation mm. of what was known when. Mm. But the reality of it is, do you, do you think people at home actually think that nobody mentioned, Lord, that hospital we were going to build is going to cost whatever amount more? Like, do you think people believe that? I think the record is showing that that information, when it was known, was shared. And why would you, why would you think that a series of reviews started in 2017? Do you think that just happened out of the blue? I'm not familiar with that list, but I, I would think it's probably on a, a separate range of matters. I'm, but I can't answer it, Deputy, because I'm not familiar with the list. I'd be happy to look and, and try and form a view if it's helpful, but I don't know about it. Mr. President? Well, I'll just make a point, Deputy, that I... In, a, in my years observing um, the questioning of how things have happened, um, often a, a position is adopted that uh, no records are available and minutes weren't taken mm -hmm. and it's not documented. I think you, PwC will find documentation of the issues being discussed at, at, at meetings and a clear record of that. And I think that is good public administration. It's not something to apologise for. You're asking then a question, is there stuff going on outside of that? And I wasn't involved in stuff outside of that. We had a formal process for considering issues, for documenting the issues, and for making decisions as to the actions to be taken. And they are available. And there wasn't some, some other subterfuge going on somewhere else. That's how the issues were, be tough issues, difficult issues, that's how they've been dealt with. Starting with the 61 million, going into the summer of 2018 when the GMP process has been flagged as problems in it and arriving at a point where the GMP process is completed in November and government makes a decision in December. But it's not really credible to say that November, although the figure had crystallised in November, the GMP, what my, what my question to you is, Mr. President, do you think it's credible for the public when they hear that there is the HSC with the Department of Health Again, I would completely argue there's need for the 2E, but that's another day's work. Um, we have this typical change of governance structure. We've all of this, but in the end, you know, the minutes are the minutes. But we, as I said to you last Thursday, we all know that discussions happen. So I cannot, I do not believe that this overrun could be happening and that nobody would have mentioned, okay, we don't know the amount, but it's going to be big. 
I, I, I just, I, I find that really, really, really hard to believe. Thank you, Deputy O'Connell. <clears throat> Senator Burke. Just very briefly, Minister, on um, the uh, GP contract negotiations, and I know you highlighted the fact that progress has been made with the IMO, um, but the NAGP are not in those negotiations. And my concern about that, and there's a huge number of GPs who are not in the IMO but who are in the NAGP, is there not then a concern that no matter what agreement you come to with the IMO, that NAGP members may not accept the terms and conditions of those negotiations or the, the finalisation of those negotiations? And I'm just wondering, at what stage will the department engage with the NAGP? Um, I know they'll be protesting later on today, but I think it's uh, and there are a large number of GPs um, feeling frustrated at the moment. Uh, and that they're not part of this ongoing negotiation process? Uh, sure, it's a fair point. The, um, my department engages with the IMO on contractual matters. The IMO is a member of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Uh, we have a framework agreement in relation to them. Issues in relation to FEMPI and the likes would have been introduced um, uh, as part of discussions. I'm not saying they were in any way agreed, but as part of discussions with uh, the broader union movement. There is a role for the NAGP uh, to play in terms of being consulted and involved, but the negotiations uh, are with the IMO. I'm not going to get into the medical politics of it because I think it makes the politics we're involved in seem, uh, seem very tame at times. I know there's uh, different organisations and different uh, perhaps um, perspectives and rivalries, but the IMO is the organisation uh, that my department engages with. I'm happy to explore consultative roles for other organisations. But the IMO has delivered um, on a number of occasions, for example, when we were negotiating the free repeat smear, it, it negotiated for its members in relation to the contract for termination uh, of pregnancy. It negotiated that as well, the under sixes. So uh, that, that is the current negotiating arrangement. Um, and the IMO obviously has issued an update to its members. Um, what, what organisation GPs decide to join or not join or whatever is not, not but, a matter for me. But Minister, aren't we in a at a disadvantage in that if there, is a, uh, if there are agreements are reached with the IMO on certain issues, um, at what stage are the department going to engage with the NAGP in order to bring them on board on those issues as well? Well, you've got to remember that GPs, um, GPs obviously uh, can't actively, actually collectively uh, negotiate, and that's quite clear, um, because they obviously operate um, on an individual contract basis. So any, any GP can sign up to any contract being offered by the state. Um, so you don't have to be a member of one organisation um, or the other. But I'm, I'm happy to... Happy to reflect on the issues you've said, but it's a statement of fact that we're in very intense negotiations with the IMO. Um, these are negotiations that will benefit, I believe, all GPs, and uh, it's obviously up to GPs to decide whether they wish to sign up to contracts being offered by the state. Thank you, Senator. And <coughs> Deputy Durkin. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Um, I'm not going to put words in anybody's mouth, and I'm not going to exaggerate the claims, and I'm not going to start the uh, estimate for the, 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 the hospital at a lower base than has already been discussed in order to further inflate the degree of, 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 uh, um, uh, of annoyance that we might have at the, at, the, at the new price. But to say this, I believe, and I, I believed weeks ago, and I still believe, that unless a, a, the specification is properly identified and assessed, and the bill of quantities in the initial stages, it, it leaves the whole situation open to exaggeration and to mistakes and to uh, allegations and levelling of blame to different people. I don't want to do that. I, I don't think there's any uh, the, uh, um, 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 collateral in that at all. And I simply want to say this. My belief is now, and the one thing that needs to be learned, is that the, the original estimated cost on based on preliminaries that word preliminary should be moved away from big contracts like this. this is, that is lethal. It is not possible to achieve any degree of accuracy if you're working on preliminaries or estimates or guesstimates. And that's really all that they are. And in a big contract like this, all over three sites, the propensity for something to go wrong in terms of, of something slipping, what we heard referred to as noise in the system, I can understand what that might be. My, Supposition is that it, the, 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 the degree of concern at that stage wasn't of a magnitude that would cause the matter to be brought to the attention of those in, in, in higher up the ladder. That would be my estimation. 
and, 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 and that goes back to the kernel again as to what was in the initial tender documents, what was tendered for, and what, where, what, where does the bill of cost and where does the specifications and do the two meet? They obviously didn't meet. They obviously didn't. The, the, the bill of cost was short or else, or else the detailed spec, specification was short. Now, how, how anybody can assess a situation and given those circumstances, I don't know. Um, w. O'Brien mentioned last week that you know, it would be a great help to us, I think in the Public Accounts Committee, uh, that if we knew what was involved in the very beginning, somebody must know somewhere what kind of a hospital we were going to have, whether it's going to be a high-tech hospital, whether it's going to be just walls and floors and ceilings, the same as traditional hospitals or whatever the case may be. And I think that's fundamental to the argument and the debate, the debate we're having. I think the debate we're having now can be detrimental to the quality of health service that we uh, all want to provide in the future. I think that's been a characteristic, uh, Mr Chairman, of the debate on the health services for quite a long time in relation to the GP services, in relation to the services in the hospital, as a result of which I think we're dumbing down uh, the, 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 the uh, quality of the services to suit the particular occasion. I think it's a very, very dangerous thing to do, and if we keep going on like that, we won't have a, 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 a kind of a class of health service that we expect and that we pay for, that we, that's provided for uh, by the taxpayer. So let's some, simply say this. I would expect that the, the PricewaterhouseCoopers will get to the bottom of it. I expect that the costs will be revised in, in accordance with the actual cost, the actual specification, and, 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 and the actual bit of cost that didn't emerge until late in the day. Thank you very much, Deputy Durkin. I'm afraid that concludes our committee meeting today because we have to vacate this room for the next committee uh, on climate change. So on behalf of the committee, Minister, <coughs> I'd like to thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. <coughs> and your officials, Mr. Breslin and Anne O'Connor from the HSE, and Dr. McKenna, Liam Woods, and Dean Sullivan from the HSE. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned until next Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock. Is that agreed? Agreed. <laughs>